Book One of The Odyssey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Nelson. The Odyssey by Homer. Translated by Samuel Butler. Book One The Gods in Council. Minerva's Visit to Ithaca. The Challenge from Telemachus to the Suitors. Tell me, O oh Muse, of that ingenious hero who travelled far and wide after he had sacked the famous town of Troy. Many cities did he visit, and many were the nations with whose manners and customs he was acquainted. Moreover, he suffered much by the sea while trying to save his own life and bring his men safely home. But do what he might, he could not save his men, for they perished through their own sheer folly in eating the cattle of the sun-god Hyperion. So the god prevented them from ever reaching home. Tell me, too, about all these things, O daughter of Jove, from whatsoever source you may know them. So now all who escaped death in battle or by shipwreck had got safely home except Ulysses, and he, though he was longing to return to his wife and country, was detained by the goddess Calypso, who had got him into a large cave and wanted to marry him. But as years went by there came a time when the gods settled that he should go back to Ithaca. Even then, however, when he was among his own people, his troubles were not yet over. Nevertheless all the gods had now begun to pity him except Neptune, who still persecuted him without ceasing and would not let him get home. Now Neptune had gone off to the Ethiopians, who were at the world's end, and lie in two halves, one looking west and the other east. He had gone there to accept a hecatomb of sheep and oxen, and was enjoying himself at his festival. But the other gods met in the house of Olympian Jove, and the sire of gods and men spoke first. At that moment he was thinking of Aegisthus, who had been killed by Agamemnon's son Orestes, so he said to the other gods, See now how men lay blame upon us gods for what is after all nothing but their own folly. Look at Aegisthus. He must needs make love to Agamemnon's wife unrighteously and then kill Agamemnon, though he knew it would be the death of him. For I sent Mercury to warn him not to do either of these things, inasmuch as Orestes would be sure to take his revenge when he grew up and wanted to return home. Mercury told him this in all good will, but he would not listen. And now he has paid for everything in full. Then Minerva said, Father, son of Saturn, king of kings, it served it just this right, and so it would any one else who does as he did. But Aegisthus is neither here nor there. It is for Ulysses that my heart bleeds, when I think of his sufferings in that lonely sea-girt island, far away, poor man, from all his friends. It is an island covered with forest, in the very middle of the sea, and a goddess lives there, daughter of the magician Atlas, who looks after the bottom of the ocean and carries the great columns that keep heaven and earth asunder. This daughter of Atlas has got hold of poor, unhappy Ulysses, and keeps trying by every kind of blandishment to make him forget his home, so that he is tired of life, and thinks of nothing but how he may once more see the smoke of his own chimneys. You, sir, take no heed of this. And yet, when Ulysses was before Troy, did he not propitiate you with many a burnt sacrifice? Why then should you keep on being so angry with him?" And Jove said, "'My child, what are you talking about? How can I forget Ulysses, than whom there is no more capable man on earth, nor more liberal in his offerings to the immortal gods that live in heaven? Bear in mind, however, that Neptune is still furious with Ulysses for having blinded an eye of Polyphemus, king of the Cyclopes. Polyphemus is son to Neptune by the nymph Thusa, daughter to the sea-king Phorcys. Therefore, though he will not kill Ulysses outright, he torments him by preventing him from getting home. Still, let us lay our heads together and see how we can help him to return. Neptune will then be pacified for if we are all of a mind he can hardly stand out against us." And Minerva said, 
Father, son of Saturn, king of kings, if then the gods now mean that Ulysses should get home, we should first send Mercury to the Ogygian island to tell Calypso that we have made up our minds and that he is to return. In the meantime I will go to Ithaca, to put heart into Ulysses' son Telemachus. I will embolden him to call the Achaeans in assembly, and speak out to the suitors of his mother Penelope, who persist in eating up any number of his sheep and oxen. I will also conduct him to Sparta and to Pylos, to see if he can hear anything about the return of his dear father, for this will make people speak well of him." So saying, she bound on her glittering golden sandals imperishable, with which she can fly like the wind over land or sea. She grasped the redoubtable bronze-shod spear, so stout and sturdy and strong, wherewith she quells the ranks of heroes who have displeased her, and down she darted from the topmost summits of Olympus, whereon forthwith she was in Ithaca, at the gateway of Ulysses' house, disguised as a visitor, Mentes, chief of the Taphians, and she held a bronze spear in her hand. There she found the lordly suitors seated on hides of the oxen which they had killed and eaten, and playing draughts in front of the house. Men-servants and pages were bustling about to wait upon them, some mixing wine with water in the mixing-bowls, some cleaning down the tables with wet sponges and laying them out again, and some cutting up great quantities of meat. Telemachus saw her long before anyone else did. He was sitting moodily among the suitors, thinking about his brave father, and how he would send them flying out of the house if he were to come to his own again and be honoured as in days gone by. Thus brooding, as he sat among them, he caught sight of Minerva and went straight to the gate, for he was vexed that a stranger should be kept waiting for admittance. He took her right hand in his own and bade her give him her spear. "'Welcome,' said he, "'to our house. And when you have partaken of food you shall tell us what you have come for.' He led the way as he spoke, and Minerva followed him. When they were within, he took her spear and set it in the spear-stand against a strong bearing-post, along with the many other spears of his unhappy father, and he conducted her to a richly decorated seat under which he threw a cloth of damask. There was a footstool also for her feet, and he set another seat near her for himself, away from the suitors that she might not be annoyed while eating by their noise and insolence, and that he might ask her more freely about his father. A maid-servant then brought them water in a beautiful golden ewer, and poured it into a silver basin for them to wash their hands, and she drew a clean table beside them. An upper servant brought them bread, and offered them many good things of what there was in the house. The carver fetched them plates of all manner of meats, and set cups of gold by their side and a manservant brought them wine and poured it out for them. Then the suitors came in and took their places on the benches and seats. Forthwith men-servants poured water over their hands, maids went round with the bread-baskets, pages filled the mixing-bowls with wine and water, and they laid their hands upon the good things that were before them. As soon as they had had enough to eat and drink they wanted music and dancing, which were the crowning embellishments of a banquet. So a servant brought a lyre to Phemius, whom they compelled perforce to sing to them. As soon as he touched his lyre and began to sing, Telemachus spoke low to Minerva, with his head close to hers that no man might hear. "'I hope, sir,' said he, "'that you will not be offended with what I am going to say. Singing comes cheap to those who do not pay for it and all this is done at the cost of one whose bones lie rotting in some wilderness or grinding to powder in the surf. If these men were to see my father come back to Ithaca, they would pray for longer legs rather than a longer purse, for money would not serve them. But he, alas, has fallen on an ill fate, and even when people do sometimes say that he is coming, we no longer heed them. We shall never see him again. And now, sir, Tell me, and tell me true. Who are you, and where do you come from? Tell me of your town and parents, what manner of ship you came in, how your crew brought you to Ithaca, and of what nation they declared themselves to be, for you cannot have come by land. Tell me also truly 
for I want to know, are you a stranger to this house, or have you been here in my father's time? In the old days we had many visitors, for my father went about much himself. And Minerva answered, I will tell you truly and particularly all about it. I am Mentes, son of Anchialus, and I am king of the Taphians. I have come here with my ship and crew, on a voyage to men of a foreign tongue being bound for Temesa, with a cargo of iron, and I shall bring back copper. As for my ship, it lies over yonder off the open country, away from the town, in the harbour Rythron, under the wooded mountain Neritum. Our fathers were friends before us, as old Laertes will tell you, if you will go and ask him. They say, however, that he never comes to town now, and lives by himself in the country, faring hardly, with an old woman to look after him and get his dinner for him, when he comes in tired from pottering about his vineyard. They told me your father was at home again, and that was why I came, but it seems the gods are still keeping him back for he is not dead yet, not on the mainland. It is more likely he is on some sea-girt island in mid-ocean, or a prisoner among savages who are detaining him against his will. I am no prophet, and know very little about omens, but I speak as it is borne in upon me from heaven, and assure you that he will not be away much longer, for he is a man of such resource that even though he were in chains of iron he would find some means of getting home again. But tell me, and tell me true, can Ulysses really have such a fine-looking fellow for a son? You are indeed wonderfully like him about the head and eyes, for we were close friends before he set sail for Troy where the flower of all the Argives went also. Since that time we have never either of us seen the other. My mother, answered Telemachus, tells me I am son to Ulysses but it is a wise child that knows his own father. Would that I were son to one who had grown old upon his own estates, for since you ask me, there is no more ill-starred man under heaven than he who they tell me is my father." And Minerva said, There is no fear of your race dying out yet, while Penelope has such a fine son as you are. But tell me, and tell me true, what is the meaning of all this feasting, and who are these people? What is it all about? Have you some banquet, or is there a wedding in the family, for no one seems to be bringing any provisions of his own? And the guests, how atrociously they are behaving, what riot they make over the whole house! It is enough to disgust any respectable person who comes near them." Sir, said Telemachus, as regards your question, so long as my father was here it was well with us and with the house but the gods in their displeasure have willed it otherwise, and have hidden him away more closely than mortal man was ever yet hidden. I could have borne it better even though he were dead, if he had fallen with his men before Troy, or had died with his friends around him when the days of his fighting were done. For then the Achaeans would have built a mound over his ashes, and I should myself have been heir to his renown but now the storm-winds have spirited him away we know not whither. He is gone without leaving so much as a trace behind him, and I inherit nothing but dismay. Nor does the matter end simply with grief for the loss of my father. Heaven has laid sorrows upon me of yet another kind. For the chiefs from all our islands, Dulichium, Same, and the woodland island of Zacynthus, as also all the principal men of Ithaca itself, are eating up my house under the pretext of paying their court to my mother, who will neither point-blank say that she will not marry, nor yet bring matters to an end. So they are making havoc of my estate, and before long will do so also with myself." "'Is that so?' exclaimed Minerva. "'Then you indeed want Ulysses home again. Give him his helmet, shield, and a couple of lances, and if he is the man he was when I first knew him in our house, drinking and making merry, he would soon lay his hands about these rascally suitors were he to stand once more upon his own threshold. He was then coming from Ephyra, where he had been to beg poison for his arrows from Illus, son of Murmurus. Illus feared the ever-living gods and would not give him any, but my father let him have some, for he was very fond of him. 
If Ulysses is the man he then was, these suitors will have a short shrift and a sorry wedding. But there, it rests with heaven to determine whether he is to return, and take his revenge in his own house or no. I would, however, urge you to set about trying to get rid of these suitors at once. Take my advice, call the Achaean heroes in assembly tomorrow morning, lay your case before them, and call heaven to bear you witness. Bid the suitors take themselves off, each to his own place, and if your mother's mind is set on marrying again, let her go back to her father, who will find her a husband and provide her with all the marriage gifts that so dear a daughter may expect. As for yourself, let me prevail upon you to take the best ship you can get, with a crew of twenty men, and go in quest of your father, who has so long been missing. Someone may tell you something, or, and people often hear things in this way, some heaven-sent message may direct you. First go to Pylos and ask Nestor. Thence go on to Sparta and visit Menelaus, for he got home last of all the Achaeans. If you hear that your father is alive and on his way home, you can put up with the waste of these suitors will make for yet another twelve months. If, on the other hand, you hear of his death, come home at once, celebrate his funeral rites with all due pomp, build a barrow to his memory, and make your mother marry again. Then, having done all this, think it well over in your mind how, by fair means or foul, you may kill these suitors in your own house. You are too old to plead infancy any longer. Have you not heard how people are singing Orestes' praises for having killed his father's murderer, Aegisthus? You are a fine, smart-looking fellow. Show your medal, then, and make yourself a name and story. Now, however, I must go back to my ship and to my crew, who will be impatient if I keep them waiting longer. Think the matter over for yourself, and remember what I have said to you. Sir, answered Telemachus, it has been very kind of you to talk to me in this way, as though I were your own son, and I will do all you tell me. I know you want to be getting on with your voyage, but stay a little longer till you have taken a bath and refreshed yourself. I will then give you a present, and you shall go on your way rejoicing. I will give you one of great beauty and value, a keepsake such as only dear friends give to one another. Minerva answered, do not try to keep me, for I would be on my way at once. As for any present you may be disposed to make me, keep it till I come again, and I will take it home with me. You shall give me a very good one, and I will give you one of no less value in return." With these words she flew away like a bird into the air, but she had given Telemachus courage, and had made him think more than ever about his father. He felt the change, wondered at it, and knew that the stranger had been a god, so he went straight to where the suitors were sitting. Phemius was still singing, and his hearer sat rapt in silence as he told the sad tale of the return from Troy, and the ills Minerva had laid upon the Achaeans. Penelope, daughter of Icarius, heard his song from her room upstairs, and came down by the great staircase, not alone, but attended by two of her handmaids. When she reached the suitors she stood by one of the bearing-posts that supported the roof of the cloisters, with a staid maiden on either side of her. She held a veil, moreover, before her face, and was weeping bitterly. "'Phemius,' she cried, "'you know many another feat of gods and heroes, such as poets love to celebrate. Sing the suitors some one of these, and let them drink their wine in silence, but cease this sad tale for it breaks my sorrowful heart, and reminds me of my lost husband, whom I mourn ever without ceasing, and whose name was great all over Hellas and Middle Argos. Mother, answered Telemachus, let the bards sing what he has a mind to. Bards do not make the ills they sing of. It is Jove, not they, who makes them, and who sends weal or woe upon mankind according to his own good pleasure. This fellow means no harm by singing the ill-fated return of the Danaeans, for people always applaud the latest songs most warmly. Make up your mind to it and bear it. Ulysses is not the only man who never came back from Troy, but many another went down as well as he. 
Go, then, within the house and busy yourself with your daily duties, your loom, your distaff, and the ordering of your servants. For speech is man's matter, and mine above all others, for it is I who am master here." She went wondering back into the house, and laid her son saying in her heart. Then, going upstairs with her handmaids into her room, she mourned her dear husband till Minerva shed sweet sleep over her eyes. But the suitors were clamorous throughout the covered cloisters, and prayed each one that he might be her bedfellow. Then Telemachus spoke. "'Shameless!' he cried, "'and insolent suitors! Let us feast at our pleasure now, and let there be no brawling, for it is a rare thing to hear a man with such a divine voice as Phemius has. But in the morning meet me in full assembly, that I may give you formal notice to depart, and feast at one another's houses, turn and turn about, at your own cost. If, on the other hand, you choose to persist in sponging upon one man, heaven help me, but Jove shall reckon with you in full, and when you fall in my father's house there shall be no man to avenge you." The suitors bit their lips as they heard him, and marveled at the boldness of his speech. Then Antinous, son of Eupithes, said, "'The gods seem to have given you lessons in bluster and tall talking. May Jove never grant you to be chief in Ithaca, as your father was before you.' Telemachus answered, "'Antinous, do not chide with me, but God willing, I will be chief too if I can. Is this the worst fate you can think of for me? It is no bad thing to be a chief, for it brings both riches and honor. Still, now that Ulysses is dead, there are many great men in Ithaca, both old and young, and some other may take the lead among them. Nevertheless, I will be chief in my own house, and will rule those whom Ulysses has won for me." Then Eurymachus, son of Polybus, answered, "'It rests with heaven to decide who shall be chief among us, but you shall be master in your own house and over your own possessions. No one, while there is a man in Ithaca, shall do you violence nor rob you. And now, my good fellow, I want to know about this stranger. What country does he come from? Of what family is he, and where is his estate? Has he brought you news about the return of your father, or was he on business of his own? He seemed a well-to-do man, but he hurried off so suddenly that he was gone in a moment before we could get to know him. My father is dead and gone, answered Telemachus, and even if some rumor reaches me, I put no more faith in it now. My mother does indeed sometimes send for a soothsayer and question him, but I give his prophesyings no heed. As for the stranger, he was Mentes, son of Anchialus, chief of the Taphians, an old friend of my father's. But in his heart he knew that it had been the goddess. The suitors then returned to their singing and dancing until the evening, but when night fell upon their pleasuring they went home to bed each in his own abode. Timelicus's room was high up in a tower that looked on to the outer court. Hither then he hied brooding and full of thought. A good old woman, Eurycleia, daughter of Ops, the son of Pisenor, went before him with a couple of blazing torches. Laertes had bought her with his own money when she was quite young. He gave the worth of twenty oxen for her, and showed as much respect to her in his household as he did to his own wedded wife, but he did not take her to his bed for he feared his wife's resentment. She it was who now lighted Telemachus to his room, and she loved him better than any of the other women in the house did, for she had nursed him when he was a baby. He opened the door of his bedroom and sat down upon the bed. As he took off his shirt he gave it to the good old woman, who folded it tidily up and hung it for him over a peg by his bedside, after which she went out, pulled the door to by a silver catch, and drew the bolt home by means of the strap. But Telemachus, as he lay covered with a woolen fleece, kept thinking all night through of his intended voyage and of the counsel that Minerva had given him. End of Book One Book Two of The Odyssey by Homer Translated by Samuel Butler 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Odyssey, Book Two, Assembly of the People of Ithaca, Speeches of Telemachus and of the Suitors. Telemachus makes his preparations and starts for Pylos with Minerva disguised as mentor. Now, when the child of morning, rosy fingered dawn, appeared, Telemachus rose and dressed himself. He bound his sandals on to his comely feet, girded his sword about his shoulder, and left his room looking like an immortal god. He at once sent the criers round to call the people in assembly, so they called them and the people gathered thereon. Then, when they were got together, he went to the place of assembly spear in hand, not alone, for his two hounds went with him. Minerva endowed him with a presence of such divine comeliness that all marveled at him as he went by, and when he took his place in his father's seat even the oldest counsellors made way for him. Egyptius, a man bent double with age, and of infinite experience, was the first to speak. His son Antiphus had gone with Ulysses to Ilius, land of noble steeds, but the savage Cyclops had killed him when they were all shut up in the cave, and had cooked his last dinner for him. He had three sons left, of whom two still worked on their father's land, while the third, Eurynomus, was one of the suitors. Nevertheless their father could not get over the loss of Antiphus, and was still weeping for him when he began his speech. "'Men of Ithaca,' he said, "'hear my words. From the day Ulysses left us, there has been no meeting of our counsellors until now. Who then can it be, whether old or young, that finds it so necessary to convene us? Has he got wind of some host approaching, and does he wish to warn us, or would he speak upon some other matter of public moment? I am sure he is an excellent person, and I hope Jove will grant him his heart's desire." Telemachus took this speech as of good omen and rose at once, for he was bursting with what he had to say. He stood in the middle of the assembly, and the good herald Pisanor brought him his staff. Then, turning to Egyptius, Sir, he said, it is I, as you will shortly learn, who have convened you, for it is I who am the most aggrieved. I have not got wind of any host approaching about which I would warn you, nor is there any matter of public moment on which I would speak. My grievance is purely personal, and turns on two great misfortunes which have fallen upon my house. The first of these is the loss of my excellent father, who is chief among all you here present, and was like a father to every one of you. The second is much more serious, and ere long will be the utter ruin of my estate. The sons of all the chief men among you are pestering my mother to marry them against her will. They are afraid to go to her father Icarius, asking him to choose the one he likes best, and to provide marriage gifts for his daughter, but day by day they keep hanging about my father's house, sacrificing our oxen, sheep, and fat goats for their banquets, and never giving so much as a thought to the quantity of wine they drink. No estate can stand such recklessness. We have now no Ulysses to ward off harm from our doors, and I cannot hold my own against them. I shall never all my days be as good a man as he was. Still, I would indeed defend myself if I had power to do so, for I cannot stand such treatment any longer. My house is being disgraced and ruined. Have respect, therefore, to your own consciences and to public opinion. Fear, too, the wrath of heaven, lest the gods should be displeased and turn upon you. I pray you, by Jove and Themis, who is the beginning and end of counsels, do not hold back, my friends, and leave me single-handed, unless it be that my brave father Ulysses did some wrong to the Achaeans which you would now avenge on me, by aiding and abetting these suitors. Moreover, if I am to be eaten out of house and home at all, I had rather you did the eating yourselves, for I could then take action against you to some purpose, and serve you with notices from house to house till I got paid in full, whereas now I have no remedy." With this Telemachus dashed his staff to the ground and burst into tears. Everyone was very sorry for him, 
but they all sat still and no one ventured to make him an angry answer, only Antinous, who spoke thus. Telemachus, insolent braggart that you are, how dare you try to throw the blame upon us suitors? It is your mother's fault, not ours, for she is a very artful woman. This three years past, and close on four, she had been driving us out of our minds, by encouraging each one of us and sending him messages without meaning one word of what she says. And then there was that trick she played on us. She set up a great timbre frame in her room and began to work on an enormous piece of fine needlework. Sweetheart, said she, Ulysses is indeed dead. Still do not press me to marry again immediately. Wait, for I would not have skill in needlework perish unrecorded, till I have completed a pall for the hero Laertes, to be in readiness against the time when death shall take him. He is very rich, and the women of the place will talk if he is laid out without a pall. This was what she said, and we assented, whereon we could see her working on her great web all day long, but at night she would unpick the stitches again by torchlight. She fooled us in this way for three years and we never found her out, but as time wore on and she was now in her fourth year, one of her maids who knew what she was doing told us, and we caught her in the act of undoing her work, so she had to finish it whether she would or no. The suitors, therefore, make you this answer, that both you and the Achaeans may understand. Send your mother away, and bid her marry the men of her own and of her father's choice. For I do not know what will happen if she goes on plaguing us much longer with the air she gives herself on the score of the accomplishments Minerva has taught her, and because she is so clever. We never yet heard of such a woman. We know all about Tyro, Alcmena, Mausina, and the famous women of old, but they were nothing to your mother, any one of them. It was not fair of her to treat us in that way. And as long as she continues in the mind with which heaven has now endowed her, so long shall we go on eating up your estate. And I do not see why she should change, for she gets all the honor and glory, and it is you who pay for it, not she. Understand, then, that we will not go back to our lands, neither here nor elsewhere, till she has made her choice and married some one or other of us." Telemachus answered, "'Antinous, how can I drive the mother who bore me from my father's house? My father is abroad, and we do not know whether he is alive or dead. It will be hard on me if I have to pay Icarius the large sum which I must give him if I insist on sending his daughter back to him. Not only will he deal rigorously with me, but heaven will also punish me. For my mother, when she leaves the house, will call on the Erinys to avenge her. Besides, it would not be a creditable thing to do, and I will have nothing to say to it. If you choose to take offense at this, Leave the house, and feast elsewhere at one another's houses at your own cost, turn and turn about. If, on the other hand, you elect to persist in sponging upon one man, heaven help me, but Jove shall reckon with you in full, and when you fall in my father's house there shall be no man to avenge you." As he spoke, Jove sent two eagles from the top of the mountain, and they flew on and on with the wind, sailing side by side in their own lordly flight. When they were right over the middle of the assembly they wheeled and circled about, beating the air with their wings and glaring death into the eyes of them that were below. Then, fighting fiercely and tearing at one another, they flew off towards the right over the town. The people wondered as they saw them, and asked each other what all this might be. Whereon Halitherses, who was the best prophet and reader of omens among them, spoke to them plainly and in all honestly, saying, Hear me, men of Ithaca, and I speak more particularly to the suitors, for I see mischief brewing for them. Ulysses is not going to be away much longer. Indeed, he is close at hand to deal out death and destruction, not on them alone, but on many another of us who live in Ithaca. Let us then be wise in time, and put a stop to this wickedness before he comes. Let the suitors do so of their own accord. It will be better for them for I am not prophesying without due knowledge. 
Everything has happened to Ulysses, as I foretold, when the Argives set out for Troy, and he with them. I said that after going through much hardship and losing all his men, he should come home again in the twentieth year, and that no one would know him. And now all this is coming true." Eurymachus, son of Polybus, then said, "'Go home, old man, and prophesy to your own children, or it may be worse for them. I can read these omens myself much better than you can. Birds are always flying about in the sunshine somewhere or other, but they seldom mean anything. Ulysses has died in a far country, and it is a pity you are not dead along with him, instead of prating here about omens and adding fuel to the anger of Telemachus, which is fierce enough as it is. I suppose you think he will give you something for your family. But I tell you, and it shall surely be, when an old man like you, who should know better, talks a young one over till he becomes troublesome, in the first place his young friend will only fare so much the worse. He will take nothing by it, for the suitors will prevent this. And in the next he will lay a heavier fine, sir, upon yourself than you will at all like paying, for it will bear hardly upon you. As for Telemachus, I warn him in the presence of you all to send his mother back to her father, who will find her a husband and provide her with all the marriage gifts so dear a daughter may expect. Till then we shall go on harassing him with our suit. For we fear no man, and care neither for him, with all his fine speeches, nor for any fortune-telling of yours. You may preach as much as you please, but we shall only hate you the more. We shall go back and continue to eat up Telemachus's estate without paying him, till such time as his mother leaves off tormenting us by keeping us day after day on the tiptoe of expectation, each vying with the other in his suit for a prize of such rare perfection. Besides, we cannot go after the other women whom we should marry in due course, but for the way in which she treats us." Then Telemachus said, Eurymachus, and you other suitors, I shall say no more, and entreat you no further, for the gods and the people of Ithaca now know my story. Give me, then, a ship and a crew of twenty men to take me hither and thither, and I will go to Sparta and to Pylos in quest of my father, who has so long been missing. Someone may tell me something, or, and people often hear things in this way, some heaven-sent message may direct me. If I can hear of him as alive and on his way home, I will put up with the waste you suitors will make for yet another twelve months. If, on the other hand, I hear of his death, I will return at once, celebrate his funeral rites with all due pomp, build a barrow to his memory, and make my mother marry again." With these words he sat down, and Mentor, who had been a friend of Ulysses, and had been left in charge of everything with full authority over the servants, rose to speak. He then, plainly and in all honesty, addressed them thus. Hear me, men of Ithaca. I hope that you may never have a kind and well-disposed ruler any more, nor one who will govern you equitably. I hope that all your chiefs henceforward may be cruel and unjust, for there is not one of you but has forgotten Ulysses, who ruled you as though he were your father. I am not half so angry with the suitors, for if they choose to do violence in the naughtiness of their hearts, and wager their heads that Ulysses will not return, they can take the high hand and eat up his estate. But as for you others, I am shocked at the way in which you all sit still without even trying to stop such scandalous goings-on, which you could do if you chose, for you are many and they are few. Leocritus, son of Evanor, answered him, saying, Mentor, what folly is all this, that you should set the people to stay us? It is a hard thing for one man to fight with many about his victuals. Even though Ulysses himself were to set upon us while we are feasting in his house, and do his best to oust us, his wife, who wants him back so very badly, would have small cause for rejoicing, and his blood would be upon his own head if he fought against such great odds. There is no sense in what you have been saying. Now, therefore, do you people go about your business, 
and let his father's old friends, Mentor and Halitherses, speed this boy on his journey, if he goes at all, which I do not think he will, for he is more likely to stay where he is till someone comes and tells him something." On this he broke up the assembly, and every man went back to his own abode, while the suitors returned to the house of Ulysses. Then Telemachus went all alone by the seaside, washed his hands in the grey waves, and prayed to Minerva. "'Hear me,' he cried. "'You God who visited me yesterday, and bade me sail the seas in search of my father, who has so long been missing. I would obey you, but the Achaeans, and more particularly the wicked suitors, are hindering me that I cannot do so.' As thus he prayed, Minerva came close up to him in the likeness and with the voice of Mentor. Telemachus, said she, if you are made of the same stuff as your father, you will be neither fool nor coward henceforward, for Ulysses never broke his word nor left his work half done. If then you take after him, your voyage will not be fruitless, but unless you have the blood of Ulysses and of Penelope in your veins, I see no likelihood of your succeeding. Sons are seldom as good men as their fathers. They are generally worse, not better. Still, as you are not going to be either fool or coward henceforward, and are not entirely without some share of your father's wise discernment, I look with hope upon your undertaking. But, mind you, never make common cause with any of those foolish suitors, for they have neither sense nor virtue, and give no thought to death and to the doom that will shortly fall on one and all of them, so that they shall perish on the same day. As for your voyage, it shall not be long delayed. Your father was such an old friend of mine that I will find you a ship, and will come with you myself. Now, however, return home, and go about among the suitors. Begin getting provisions ready for your voyage. See everything well stowed, the wine in jars and the barley meal, which is the staff of life, in leathern bags, while I go round the town and beat up volunteers at once. There are many ships in Ithaca, both old and new. I will run my eye over them for you, and will choose the best. We will get her ready, and will put out to sea without delay." Thus spoke Minerva, daughter of Jove, and Telemachus lost no time in doing as the goddess told him. He went moodily home, and found the suitors flaying goats and singeing pigs in the outer court. Antinous came up to him at once and laughed as he took his hand in his own, saying, "'Telemachus, my fine fire-eater, bear no more ill blood, neither in word nor deed, but eat and drink with us as you used to do. The Achaeans will find you in everything, a ship and a picked crew to boot, so that you can set sail for Pylos at once and get news of your noble father.' "'Antinous,' answered Telemachus, I cannot eat in peace, nor take pleasure of any kind with such men as you are. Was it not enough that you should waste so much good property of mine while I was yet a boy? Now that I am older and know more about it, I am also stronger, and whether here among this people, or by going to Pylos, I will do you all the harm I can. I shall go, and my going will not be in vain, though, thanks to you suitors, I have neither ship nor crew of my own and must be passenger, not captain." As he spoke he snatched his hand from that of Antinous. Meanwhile the others went on getting dinner ready about the buildings, jeering at him tauntingly as they did so. "'Telemachus,' said one youngster, "'means to be the death of us. I suppose he thinks he can bring friends to help him from Pylos, or again from Sparta, where he seems bent on going. Or will he go to Ephyra as well? for poison to put in our wine and kill us." Another said, "'Perhaps if Telemachus goes on board ship, he will be like his father and perish far from his friends. In this case we should have plenty to do, for we could then divide up his property amongst us. As for the house, we can let his mother and the man who marries her have that.' This was how they talked. But Telemachus went down into the lofty and spacious storeroom where his father's treasure of gold and bronze lay heaped up upon the floor, and where the linen and spare clothes were kept in open chests. Here, too, there was a store of fragrant olive oil, while casks of old, well-ripened wine, unblended and fit for a god to drink, 
were ranged against the wall in case Ulysses should come home again after all. The room was closed with well-made doors opening in the middle. Moreover, the faithful old housekeeper Eurycleia, daughter of Ups, the son of Pisanor, was in charge of everything both night and day. Telemachus called her to the storeroom and said, "'Nurse, draw me off some of the best wine you have, after what you are keeping for my father's own drinking, in case, poor man, he should escape death and find his way home again after all. Let me have twelve jars, and see that they all have lids. Also, fill me some well-sewn leathern bags with barley meal, about twenty measures in all. Get these things put together at once, and say nothing about it. I will take everything away this evening as soon as my mother has gone upstairs for the night. I am going to Sparta and to Pylos to see if I can hear anything about the return of my dear father." When Eurycleia heard this she began to cry, and spoke fondly to him, saying, "'My dear child, whatever can have put such notion as that into your head? Where in the world do you want to go to, you who are the one hope of the house? Your poor father is dead and gone in some foreign country nobody knows where, and as soon as your back is turned these wicked ones here will be scheming to get you put out of the way, and will share all your possessions among themselves. Stay where you are among your own people, and do not go wandering and worrying your life out on the barren ocean." "'Fear not, nurse,' answered Telemachus. "'My scheme is not without heaven's sanction. But swear that you will say nothing about all this to my mother, till I have been away some ten or twelve days, unless she hears of my having gone and asks you. For I do not want her to spoil her beauty by crying." The old woman swore most solemnly that she would not, and when she had completed her oath she began drawing off the wine into jars and getting the barley meal into the bags, while Telemachus went back to the suitors. Then Minerva bethought her of another matter. She took his shape and went round the town to each one of the crew, telling them to meet at the ship by sundown. She went also to Noemon, son of Phronius, and asked him to let her have a ship, which he was very ready to do. When the sun had set and darkness was over all the land, she got the ship into the water, put all the tackle on board her that ships generally carry, and stationed her at the end of the harbour. Presently the crew came up, and the goddess spoke encouragingly to each of them. Furthermore, she went to the house of Ulysses, and threw the suitors into a deep slumber. She caused their drink to fuddle them, and made them drop their cups from their hands, so that instead of sitting over their wine they went back into the town to sleep, with their eyes heavy and full of drowsiness. Then she took the form and voice of Mentor, and called Telemachus to come outside. Telemachus, said she, the men are on board and at their oars, waiting for you to give your orders, so make haste and let us be off. On this she led the way, while Telemachus followed in her steps. When they got to the ship they found the crew waiting by the waterside, and Telemachus said, Now, my men, help me to get the stores on board. They are all put together in the cloister, and my mother does not know anything about it nor any of the maidservants except one. With these words he led the way and the others followed after. When they had brought the things as he had told them, Telemachus went on board, Minerva going before him and taking her seat in the stern of the vessel, while Telemachus sat beside her. Then the men loosed the hawsers and took their places on the benches. Minerva sent them a fair wind from the west that whistled over the deep blue waves whereon Telemachus told them to catch hold of the ropes and hoist sail, and they did as he told them. They set the mast in its socket in the cross-plank, raised it and made it fast with the forestays. Then they hoisted their white sails aloft with ropes of twisted ox-hide. As the sail bellied out with the wind, the ship flew through the deep blue water, and the foam hissed against her bows as she sped onward. Then they made all fast throughout the ship filled the mixing-bowls to the brim, and made drink-offerings to the immortal gods that are from everlasting, but more particularly to the grey-eyed daughter of Jove. End of Book Two Book Three of The Odyssey by Homer Translated by Samuel Butler 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Odyssey, Book Three, Telemachus visits Nestor at Pylos. Thus then the ship sped on her way through the watches of the night from dark till dawn, but as the sun was rising from the fair sea into the firmament of heaven to shed light on mortals and immortals, they reached Pylos, the city of Nelius. Now the people of Pylos were gathered on the seashore to offer sacrifice of black bulls to Neptune, lord of the earthquake. There were nine guilds with five hundred men in each, and there were nine bulls to each guild. As they were eating the inward meats and burning the thigh bones on the embers in the name of Neptune, Telemachus and his crew arrived, furled their sails, brought their ship to anchor, and went ashore. Minerva led the way, and Telemachus followed her. Presently she said, Telemachus, you must not be in the least shy or nervous. You have taken this voyage to try and find out where your father is buried and how he came by his end. So go straight up to Nestor that we may see what he has got to tell us. Beg of him to speak the truth, and he will tell no lies, for he is an excellent person. But how, mentor, replied Telemachus, dare I go up to Nestor, and how am I to address him? I have never been used to holding long conversations with people, and am ashamed to begin questioning one who is so much older than myself." "'Some things, Telemachus,' answered Minerva, "'will be suggested to you by your own instinct, and heaven will prompt you further. For I am assured that the gods have been with you from the time of your birth until now.' She then went quickly on, and Telemachus followed in her steps till they reached the place where the guilds of the Pylian people were assembled. There they found Nestor sitting with his sons, while his company round him were busy getting dinner ready, and putting pieces of meat onto the spits while other pieces were cooking. When they saw the strangers they crowded round them, took them by the hand and bade them take their places. Nestor's son, Pisistratus, at once offered his hand to each of them, and seated them on some soft sheepskins that were lying on the sands near his father and his brother Thrasymedes. Then he gave them their portions of the inward meats and poured wine for them into a golden cup, handing it to Minerva first and saluting her at the same time. "'Offer a prayer, sir,' said he, to King Neptune, for it is his feast that you are joining. When you have duly prayed and made your drink-offering, pass the cup to your friend that he may do so also. I doubt not that he too lifts his hands in prayer, for men cannot live without God in the world. Still, he is younger than you are, and is much of an age with myself, so I will give you the precedence." As he spoke he handed her the cup. Minerva thought it very right and proper of him to have given it to herself first. She accordingly began praying heartily to Neptune. "'O thou,' she cried, "'that circlest the earth, vouchsafe to grant the prayers of thy servants that call upon thee. More especially, we pray thee send down thy grace on Nestor and on his sons. Thereafter also make the rest of the Pylian people some handsome return for their goodly hecatomb they are offering you. Lastly, grant Telemachus and myself a happy issue, in respect of the matter that has brought us in our ship to Pylos." When she had thus made an end of praying, she handed the cup to Telemachus and he prayed likewise. By and by, when the outer meats were roasted and had been taken off the spits, the carvers gave every man his portion, and they all made an excellent dinner. As soon as they had had enough to eat and drink, Nestor, knight of Gerene, began to speak. Now, said he, that our guests have done their dinner. It will be best to ask them who they are. Who then, sir strangers, are you? And from what port have you sailed? Are you traders? Or do you sail the seas as rovers with their hand against every man and every man's hand against you? Telemachus answered boldly, for Minerva had given him courage to ask about his father and get himself a good name. Nestor, said he, son of Nelius, honor to the Achaean name, you ask whence we come, and I will tell you. We come from Ithaca under Neritum, and the matter about which I would speak is of private, not public import. I seek news of my unhappy father Ulysses, who is said to have sacked the town of Troy in company with yourself. We know what fate befell each one of the other heroes who fought at Troy, but as regards Ulysses heaven has hidden from us the knowledge even that he is dead at all, 
for no one can certify us in what place he perished, nor say whether he fell in battle, on the mainland, or was lost at sea amid the waves of Amphitrite. Therefore I am suppliant at your knees, if haply you may be pleased to tell me of his melancholy end, whether you saw it with your own eyes, or heard it from some other traveller, for he was a man born to trouble. Do not soften things out of any pity for me, but tell me in all plainness exactly what you saw. If my brave father Ulysses ever did you loyal service, either by word or deed, when you Achaeans were harassed among the Trojans, bear it in mind now as in my favour and tell me truly all." My friend, answered Nestor, you recall a time of much sorrow to my mind for the brave Achaeans suffered much both at sea while privateering under Achilles, and when fighting before the great city of King Priam. Our best men all of them fell there. Ajax, Achilles, Patroclus, peer of gods in council, and my own dear son Antilochus, a man singularly fleet of foot and in fight valiant. But we suffered much more than this. What mortal tongue indeed could tell the whole story? Though you were to stay here and question me for five years, or even six, I could not tell you all that the Achaean suffered, and you would turn homeward weary of my tale before it ended. Nine long years did we try every kind of stratagem, but the hand of heaven was against us. During all this time there was no one who could compare with your father in subtlety, if indeed you are his son, I can hardly believe my eyes, and you talk just like him too. No one would say that people of such different ages could speak so much alike. He and I never had any kind of difference from first to last, neither in camp nor council. But in singleness of heart and purpose we advised the Argives how all might be ordered for the best. When, however, we had sacked the city of Priam and were setting sail in our ships as heaven had dispersed us, then Jove saw fit to vex the Argives on their homeward voyage for they had not all been either wise or understanding, and hence many came to a bad end through the displeasure of Jove's daughter Minerva, who brought about a quarrel between the two sons of Atreus. The sons of Atreus called a meeting which was not as it should be, for it was sunset and the Achaeans were heavy with wine. When they explained why they had called the people together, it seemed that Menelaus was for sailing homeward at once, and this displeased Agamemnon, who thought that we should wait till we had offered hecatombs to appease the anger of Minerva. Fool that he was, he might have known that he would not prevail with her, for when the gods have made up their minds they do not change them lightly. So the two stood bandying hard words, whereon the Achaeans sprang to their feet with a cry that rent the air, and were of two minds as to what they should do. That night we rested and nursed our anger for Jove was hatching mischief against us. But in the morning some of us drew our ships into the water and put our goods with our women on board, while the rest, about half in number, stayed behind with Agamemnon. We, the other half, embarked and sailed, and the ships went well, for heaven had smoothed the sea. When we reached Tenedos we offered sacrifices to the gods, for we were longing to get home. Cruel Jove, however, did not yet mean that we should do so, and raised a second quarrel in the course of which some among us turned their ships back again, and sailed away under Ulysses to make their peace with Agamemnon. But I and all the ships that were with me pressed forward, for I saw that mischief was brewing. The son of Tydeus went on also with me, and his crews with him. Later on Menelaus joined us at Lesbos, and found us making up our minds about our course, for we did not know whether to go outside Chios by the island of Syra, keeping this to our left, or inside Chios over against the stormy headland of Mimas. So we asked heaven for a sign, and were shown one to the effect that we should be soonest out of danger if we headed our ships across the open sea to Euboea. This we therefore did and a fair wind sprang up which gave us a quick passage during the night to Gerestus, where we offered many sacrifices to Neptune for having helped us so far on our way. Four days later Diomed and his men stationed their ships in Argos, 
but I held on for Pylos, and the wind never fell light from the day when heaven first made it fair for me. Therefore, my dear young friend, I returned without hearing anything about the others. I know neither who got home safely, nor who were lost, but as in duty bound, I will give you without reserve the reports that have reached me since I have been here in my own house. They say the Myrmidons returned home safely under Achilles' son Neoptolemus, so also did the valiant son of Poius, Philoctetes. Idomeneus again lost no men at sea, and all his followers who escaped death in the field got safe home with him to Crete. No matter how far out of the world you live, you will have heard of Agamemnon and the bad end he came to at the hands of Aegisthus, and a fearful reckoning did Aegisthus presently pay. See what a good thing it is for a man to leave a son behind him to do as Orestes did, who killed false Aegisthus, the murderer of his noble father. You too, then, for you are a tall, smart-looking fellow. Show your mettle and make yourself a name in story. Nestor, son of Neleus, answered Telemachus. Honor to the Achaean name. The Achaeans applaud Orestes, and his name will live through all time for he has avenged his father nobly. Would that heaven might grant me to do like vengeance on the insolence of the wicked suitors, who are ill-treating me and plotting my ruin. But the gods have no such happiness in store for me and my father, so we must bear it as best we may. My friend, said Nestor, now that you remind me, I remember to have heard that your mother has many suitors, who are ill-disposed towards you and are making havoc of your estate. Do you submit to this tamely, or are public feeling and the voice of heaven against you? Who knows but what Ulysses may come back after all, and pay these scoundrels in full, either single-handed or with a force of Achaeans behind him? If Minerva were to take as great a liking to you as she did to Ulysses when we were fighting before Troy, for I never yet saw the god so openly fond of any one as Minerva then was of your father. If she would take as good care of you as she did of him, these wooers would soon some of them forget their wooing." Telemachus answered, "'I can expect nothing of the kind. It would be far too much to hope for. I dare not let myself think of it. Even though the gods themselves willed it, no such good fortune could befall me. On this Minerva said, Telemachus, what are you talking about? Heaven has a long arm if it is minded to save a man, and if it were me, I should not care how much I suffered before getting home, provided I could be safe when I was once there. I would rather this than get home quickly and then be killed in my own house as Agamemnon was by the treachery of Aegisthus and his wife. Still, death is certain, and when a man's hour is come, not even the gods can save him, no matter how fond they are of him." "'Mentor,' answered Telemachus, "'do not let us talk about it any more. There is no chance of my father's ever coming back. The gods have long since counseled his destruction. There is something else, however, about which I should like to ask Nestor, for he knows much more than any one else does. They say he has reigned for three generations, so that it is like talking to an immortal. Tell me, therefore, Nestor, and tell me true. How did Agamemnon come to die in that way? What was Menelaus doing? And how came false Aegisthus to kill so far better a man than himself? Was Menelaus away from Achaean Argos, voyaging elsewhither among mankind, that Aegisthus took heart and killed Agamemnon? I will tell you truly, answered Nestor, and indeed you have yourself divined how it all happened. If Menelaus, when he got back from Troy, had found Aegisthus still alive in his house, there would have been no barrow heaped up for him, not even when he was dead but he would have been thrown outside the city to dogs and vultures, and not a woman would have mourned him, for he had done a deed of great wickedness. But we were over there, fighting hard at Troy, and Aegisthus, who was taking his ease quietly in the heart of Argos, cajoled Agamemnon's wife Clytemnestra with incessant flattery. At first she would have nothing to do with his wicked scheme 
for she was of a good natural disposition. Moreover, there was a bard with her, to whom Agamemnon had given strict orders on setting out for Troy, that he was to keep guard over his wife. But when heaven had counseled her destruction, Aegisthus carried this bard off to a desert island and left him there for crows and seagulls to batten upon, after which she went willingly enough to the house of Aegisthus. Then he offered many burnt sacrifices to the gods, and decorated many temples with tapestries and gilding, for he had succeeded far beyond his expectations. Meanwhile Menelaus and I were on our way home from Troy, on good terms with one another. When we got to Sunium, which is the point of Athens, Apollo, with his painless shafts, killed Frontus, the steersman of Menelaus' ship, and never man knew better how to handle a vessel in rough weather, so that he died then and there with the helm in his hand, and Menelaus, though very anxious to press forward, had to wait in order to bury his comrade and give him his due funeral rites. Presently, when he too could put to sea again, and had sailed on as far as the Malian heads, Jove counseled evil against him and made it blow hard till the waves ran mountains high. Here he divided his fleet and took the one half towards Crete, where the Sidonians dwell round about the waters of the river Iardinus. There is a high headland hereabouts stretching out into the sea from a place called Gorton, and all along this part of the coast as far as Festus the sea runs high when there is a south wind blowing. But after Festus the coast is more protected, for a small headland can make a great shelter. Here this part of the fleet was driven on to the rocks and wrecked, but the crews just managed to save themselves. As for the other five ships, they were taken by winds and seas to Egypt, where Menelaus gathered much gold and substance among people of an alien speech. Meanwhile Aegisthus here at home plotted his evil deed. For seven years after he had killed Agamemnon he ruled in Mycenae, and the people were obedient under him. But in the eighth year Orestes came back from Athens to be his bane, and killed the murderer of his father. Then he celebrated the funeral rites of his mother and of false Aegisthus by a banquet to the people of Argos, and on that very day Menelaus came home, with as much treasure as his ships could carry. Take my advice, then, and do not go travelling about for long so far from home, nor leave your property with such dangerous people in your house. They will eat up everything you have among them, and you will have been on a fool's errand. Still, I should advise you by all means to go and visit Menelaus, who has lately come off a voyage among such distant people as no man could ever hope to get back from, when the winds had once carried him so far out of his reckoning. Even birds cannot fly the distance in a twelve-month, so vast and terrible are the seas that they must cross. Go to him, therefore, by sea, and take your own men with you. Or if you would rather travel by land, you can have a chariot, you can have horses, and here are my sons who can escort you to Lacedaemon where Menelaus lives. Beg of him to speak the truth, and he will tell you no lies, for he is an excellent person." As he spoke, the sun set and it came on dark, whereon Minerva said, "'Sir, all that you have said is well. Now, however, order the tongues of the victims to be cut, and mix wine that we may make drink-offerings to Neptune and the other immortals, and then go to bed, for it is bedtime. People should go away early and not keep late hours at a religious festival." Thus spoke the daughter of Jove, and they obeyed her saying. Men servants poured water over the hands of the guests, while pages filled the mixing-bowls with wine and water, and handed it round after giving every man his drink-offering. Then they drew the tongues of the victims into the fire, and stood up to make their drink-offerings. When they had made their offerings and had drunk each as much as he was minded, Minerva and Telemachus were for going on board their ship, but Nestor caught them up at once and stayed them. "'Heaven and the immortal gods!' he exclaimed, "'forbid that you should leave my house to go on board of a ship. Do you think I am so poor and short of clothes? or that I have so few cloaks as to be unable to find comfortable beds for both myself and for my guests? Let me tell you I have store both of rugs and cloaks, and shall not permit the son of my old friend Ulysses to camp down on the deck of a ship, not while I live, 
nor yet will my sons after me, but they will keep open house as I have done." Then Minerva answered, "'Sir, you have spoken well, and it will be much better that Telemachus should do as you have said. He, therefore, shall return with you and sleep at your house, but I must go back to give orders to my crew and keep them in good heart. I am the only older person among them. The rest are all young men of Telemachus' own age, who have taken this voyage out of friendship. So I must return to the ship and sleep there. Moreover, to-morrow I must go to the Coconians where I have a large sum of money long owing to me. As for Telemachus, now that he is your guest, send him to Lacedaemon in a chariot, and let one of your sons go with him. Be pleased to also provide him with your best and fleetest horses." When she had thus spoken, she flew away in the form of an eagle, and all marvelled as they beheld it. Nestor was astonished, and took Telemachus by the hand. "'My friend,' said he, "'I see that you are going to be a great hero some day, since the gods wait upon you thus while you are still so young. This can have been none other of those who dwell in heaven than Jove's redoubtable daughter, the Tritoborn, who showed such favour towards your brave father among the Argives. Holy Queen, he continued, vouchsafe to send down thy grace upon myself, my good wife, and my children. In return, I will offer you in sacrifice a broad-browed heifer of a year old, unbroken, and never yet brought by man under the yoke. I will gild her horns, and will offer her up to you in sacrifice." Thus did he pray, and Minerva heard his prayer. He then led the way to his own house, followed by his sons and sons-in-law. When they had got there and had taken their places on the benches and seats, he mixed them a bowl of sweet wine that was eleven years old, when the housekeeper took the lid off the jar that held it. As he mixed the wine, he prayed much and made drink-offerings to Minerva, daughter of Aegis-bearing Jove. Then when they had made their drink-offerings and had drunk each as much as he was minded, the others went home to bed each in his own abode. But Nestor put Telemachus to sleep in the room that was over the gateway along with Pisistratus, who was the only unmarried son now left him. As for himself, he slept in an inner room of the house, with the queen his wife by his side. Now when the child of morning, rosy-fingered dawn, appeared, Nestor left his couch and took his seat on the benches of white and polished marble that stood in front of his house. Here aforetime sat Neleus, peer of gods in council, but he was now dead, and had gone to the house of Hades. So Nestor sat in his seat, scepter in hand, as guardian of the public wheel. His sons, as they left their rooms, gathered round him. Akephron, Stratius, Perseus, Eretus, and Thrasymedes. The sixth son was Pisistratus, and when Telemachus joined them they made him sit with them. Nestor then addressed them. "'My sons,' said he, "'make haste to do as I shall bid you. I wish first and foremost to propitiate the great goddess Minerva, who manifested herself visibly to me during yesterday's festivities. Go then, one or other of you, to the plain, Tell the stockman to look me out a heifer, and come on here with it at once. Another must go to Telemachus' ship, and invite all the crew, leaving two men only in charge of the vessel. Someone else will run and fetch Laerceus, the goldsmith, to gild the horns of the heifer. The rest stay all of you where you are. Tell the maids in the house to prepare an excellent dinner, and to fetch seats, and logs of wood for a burnt offering. Tell them also to bring me some clear spring water. On this they hurried off on their several errands. The heifer was brought in from the plain, and Telemachus's crew came from the ship. The goldsmith brought the anvil, hammer, and tongs with which he worked his gold, and Minerva herself came to accept the sacrifice. Nestor gave out the gold, and the smith gilded the horns of the heifer, that the goddess might have pleasure in their beauty. Then Stratius and Akephron brought her in by the horns. Aretus fetched water from the house in a ewer that had a flower pattern on it, and in his other hand he held a basket of barley meal. Sturdy Thrasymedes stood by with a sharp axe, ready to strike the heifer, while Perseus held a bucket. Then Nestor began with washing his hands and sprinkling the barley meal, 
and he offered many a prayer to Minerva as he threw a lock from the heifer's head upon the fire. When they had done praying and sprinkling the barley meal, Thrasymedes dealt his blow, and brought the heifer down with a stroke that cut through the tendons at the base of her neck, whereon the daughters and daughters-in-law of Nestor, and his venerable wife Eurydice, she was eldest daughter to Clymenus, screamed with delight. Then they lifted the heifer's head from off the ground, and Pisistratus cut her throat. When she had done bleeding and was quite dead, they cut her up. They cut out the thigh-bones in all due course, wrapped them round in two layers of fat, and set some pieces of raw meat on the top of them. Then Nestor laid them upon the wood-fire and poured wine over them, while the young men stood near him with five-pronged spits in their hands. When the thighs were burned and they had tasted the inward meats, they cut the rest of the meat up small, put the pieces on the spits and toasted them over the fire. Meanwhile lovely Polycasta, Nestor's youngest daughter, washed Telemachus. When she had washed him and anointed him with oil, she brought him a fair mantle and shirt, and he looked like a god as he came from the bath and took his seat by the side of Nestor. When the outer meats were done, they drew them off the spits and sat down to dinner where they were waited upon by some worthy henchmen, who kept pouring them out their wine in cups of gold. As soon as they had had enough to eat and drink, Nestor said, "'Sons, put Telemachus's horses to the chariot that he may start at once.' Thus did he speak, and they did even as he had said, and yoked the fleet horses to the chariot. The housekeeper packed them up a provision of bread, wine, and sweetmeats fit for the sons of princes. Then Telemachus got into the chariot, while Pisistratus gathered up the reins and took his seat beside him. He lashed the horses on, and they flew forward nothing loth into the open country, leaving the high citadel of Pylos behind them. All that day did they travel swaying the yoke upon their necks till the sun went down and darkness was over all the land. Then they reached Ferry, where Diocles lived, who was son to Artilicus and grandson to Alpheus. Here they passed the night and Diocles entertained them hospitably. When the child of morning, rosy-fingered dawn appeared, they again yoked their horses and drove out through the gateway under the echoing gatehouse. Pisistratus lashed the horses on and they flew forward nothing loth. Presently they came to the cornlands of the open country, and in the course of time completed their journey, so well did their steeds take them. End of Book Three Book Four of The Odyssey by Homer Translated by Samuel Butler this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Odyssey Book Four The Visit to King Menelaus, Who Tells His Story. Meanwhile the suitors in Ithaca plot against Telemachus. Now when the sun had set and darkness was over the land, they reached the low-lying city of Lacedaemon, where they drove straight to the abode of Menelaus, and found him in his own house feasting with his many clansmen in honour of the wedding of his son, and also of his daughter, whom he was marrying to the son of that valiant warrior Achilles. He had given his consent and promised her to him while he was still at Troy, and now the gods were bringing the marriage about. So he was sending her with chariots and horses to the city of the Myrmidons, over whom Achilles' son was reigning. For his only son he had found a bride from Sparta, the daughter of Elector. This son, Megapenthes, was born to him of a bondwoman, for heaven vouchsafed Helen no more children after she had borne Hermione, who was fair as golden Venus herself. So the neighbors and kinsmen of Menelaus were feasting and making merry in his house. There was a bard also to sing to them and play his lyre, while two tumblers went about performing in the midst of them when the man struck up with his tune. Telemachus and the son of Nestor stayed their horses at the gate, whereon Etionius servant to Menelaus came out, and as soon as he saw them ran hurrying back into the house to tell his master. He went close up to him and said, Menelaus, there are some strangers come here, two men, who look like sons of Jove. What are we to do? Shall we take their horses out, or tell them to find friends elsewhere as best they can? Menelaus was very angry, and said, 
Etionius, son of Bethus, you never used to be a fool, but now you talk like a simpleton. Take their horses out, of course, and show the strangers in that they may have supper. You and I stayed often enough at other people's houses before we got back here, where heaven grant that we may rest in peace henceforward." So Etionius bustled back and bade the other servants come with him. They took their sweating steeds from under the yoke, made them fast to the mangers, and gave them a feed of oats and barley mixed. Then they leaned the chariot against the end wall of the courtyard, and led the way into the house. Telemachus and Pisistratus were astonished when they saw it, for its splendor was as that of the sun and moon. Then, when they had admired everything to their heart's content, they went into the bathroom and washed themselves. When the servants had washed them and anointed them with oil, they brought them woolen cloaks and shirts, and the two took their seats by the side of Menelaus. A maidservant brought them water in a beautiful golden ewer, and poured it into a silver basin for them to wash their hands, and she drew a clean table beside them. An upper servant brought them bread, and offered them many good things of what there was in the house, while the carver fetched them plates of all manner of meats and set cups of gold by their side. Menelaus then greeted them, saying, Fall to and welcome. When you have done supper, I shall ask you who you are, for the lineage of such men as you cannot have been lost. You must be descended from a line of scepter-bearing kings, for poor people do not have such sons as you are. On this he handed them a piece of fat roast loin, which had been set near him as being a prime part, and they laid their hands on the good things that were before them. As soon as they had had enough to eat and drink, Telemachus said to the son of Nestor, with his head so close that no one might hear, "'Look, Pisistratus, man after my own heart, see the gleam of bronze and gold, of amber, ivory, and silver. Everything is so splendid that it is like seeing the palace of Olympian Jove. I am lost in admiration." Menelaus overheard him and said, "'No one, my sons, can hold his own with Jove, for his house and everything about him is immortal. But among mortal men, well, there may be another who has as much wealth as I have, or there may not. But at all events I have travelled much and have undergone much hardship for it was nearly eight years before I could get home with my fleet. I went to Cyprus, Phoenicia, and the Egyptians. I went also to the Ethiopians and the Sidonians, and the Arembians, and to Libya, where the lambs have horns as soon as they are born, and the sheep lamb down there three times a year. Every one in that country, whether master or man, has plenty of cheese, meat, and good milk, for the ewes yield all the year round. But while I was travelling and getting great riches among these people, my brother was secretly and shockingly murdered through the perfidy of his wicked wife, so that I have no pleasure in being lord of all this wealth. Whoever your parents may be, they must have told you about all this, and of my heavy loss in the ruin of a stately mansion fully and magnificently furnished. Would that I had only a third of what I now have, so that I had stayed at home and all those were living who perished on the plain of Troy, far from Argos. I often grieve as I sit here in my house, for one and all of them. At times I cry aloud for sorrow, but presently I leave off again, for crying is cold comfort and one soon tires of it. Yet grieve for those as I may, I do so for one man more than for them all. I cannot even think of him without loathing both food and sleep, so miserable does he make me, for no one of all the Achaeans worked so hard or risked so much as he did. He took nothing by it, and has left a legacy of sorrow to myself, for he has been gone a long time, and we know not whether he is alive or dead. His old father, his long-suffering wife Penelope, and his son Telemachus, whom he left behind him an infant in arms, are plunged in grief on his account. Thus spoke Menelaus, and the heart of Telemachus yearned as he bethought him of his father. Tears fell from his eyes as he heard him thus mentioned, so that he held his cloak before his face with both hands. When Menelaus saw this, he doubted whether to let him choose his own time for speaking, or to ask him at once and find out what it was all about. While he was thus in two minds, Helen came down from her high-vaulted and perfumed room, 
looking as lovely as Diana herself. Adrasta brought her a seat, Alcippa a soft woolen rug, while Philo fetched her the silver workbox which Alcandra, wife of Polybus, had given her. Polybus lived in Egyptian Thebes, which is the richest city in the whole world. He gave Menelaus two baths, both of pure silver, two tripods, and ten talents of gold. Besides all this, his wife gave Helen some beautiful presents, to wit a golden distaff and a silver workbox that ran on wheels, with a gold band round the top of it. Philo now placed this by her side, full of fine-spun yarn, and a distaff charged with violet-colored wool was laid upon the top of it. Then Helen took her seat, put her feet upon the footstool, and began to question her husband. "'Do we know, Menelaus,' said she, "'the names of these strangers who have come to visit us? Shall I guess right or wrong? But I cannot help saying what I think. Never yet have I seen either man or woman so like somebody else. Indeed, when I look at him I hardly know what to think, as this young man is like Telemachus, whom Ulysses left as a baby behind him. When you Achaeans went to Troy with battle in your hearts, on account of my most shameless self. My dear wife, replied Menelaus, I see the likeness just as you do. His hands and feet are just like Ulysses. So is his hair, with the shape of his head and the expression of his eyes. Moreover, when I was talking about Ulysses, and saying how much he had suffered on my account, tears fell from his eyes, and he hid his face in his mantle. Then Pisistratus said, Menelaus, son of Atreus, you are right in thinking that this young man is Telemachus, but he is very modest, and is ashamed to come here and begin opening up discourse with one whose conversation is so divinely interesting as your own. My father Nestor sent me to escort him hither, for he wanted to know whether you could give him any counsel or suggestion. A son has always trouble at home when his father has gone away leaving him without supporters, and this is how Telemachus is now placed, for his father is absent, and there is no one among his own people to stand by him." "'Bless my heart,' replied Menelaus. "'Then I am receiving a visit from the son of a very dear friend, who suffered much hardship for my sake. I had always hoped to entertain him with most marked distinction when heaven had granted us a safe return from beyond the seas. I should have founded a city for him in Argos, and built him a house. I should have made him leave Ithaca with his goods, his son, and all his people, and should have sacked for them some one of the neighboring cities that are subject to me. We should thus have seen one another continually, and nothing but death could have interrupted so close and happy an intercourse. I suppose, however, that heaven grudged us such great good fortune, for it has prevented the poor fellow from ever getting home at all." Thus did he speak, and his words set them all a-weeping. Helen wept, Telemachus wept, and so did Menelaus. Nor could Pisistratus keep his eyes from filling, when he remembered his dear brother Antilochus, whom the son of bright dawn had killed. Thereon he said to Menelaus, Sir, my father Nestor, when we used to talk about you at home, told me you were a person of rare and excellent understanding. If then it be possible, do as I would urge you. I am not fond of crying while I am getting my supper. Morning will come in due course, and in the forenoon I care not how much I cry for those that are dead and gone. This is all we can do for the poor things. We can only shave our heads for them and wring the tears from our cheeks. I had a brother who died at Troy. He was by no means the worst man there. You are sure to have known him. His name was Antilochus. I never set eyes upon him myself, but they say that he was singularly fleet of foot and in fight valiant. Your discretion, my friend, answered Menelaus, is beyond your years. It is plain you take after your father. One can soon see when a man is son to one whom heaven has blessed both as regards wife and offspring, and it has blessed Nestor from first to last all his days, giving him a green old age in his own house, with sons about him who are both well disposed and valiant. We will put an end, therefore, to all this weeping, and attend to our supper again. 
Let water be poured over our hands. Telemachus and I can talk with one another fully in the morning." On this Asphalion, one of the servants, poured water over their hands and they laid their hands on the good things that were before them. Then Jove's daughter Helen bethought her of another matter. She drugged the wine with an herb that banishes all care, sorrow, and ill-humour. Whoever drinks wine thus drugged cannot shed a single tear all the rest of the day, not even though his father and mother, both of them, drop down dead, or he sees a brother or a son hewn in pieces before his very eyes. This drug, of such sovereign power and virtue, had been given to Helen by Polydamna, wife of Thon, a woman of Egypt, where there grow all sorts of herbs, some good to put into the mixing-bowl and others poisonous. Moreover, every one in the whole country is a skilled physician, for they are the race of Paean. When Helen had put this drug in the bowl, and had told the servants to serve the wine round, she said, Menelaus, son of Atreus, and you, my good friends, sons of honourable men, which is as Jove wills, for he is the giver both of good and evil, and can do what he chooses, feast here as you will, and listen while I tell you a tale in season. I cannot indeed name every single one of the exploits of Ulysses, but I can say what he did when he was before Troy, and you Achaeans were in all sorts of difficulties. He covered himself with wounds and bruises, dressed himself all in rags, and entered the enemy's city looking like a menial or a beggar, and quite different from what he did when he was among his own people. In this disguise he entered the city of Troy, and no one said anything to him. I alone recognized him and began to question him, but he was too cunning for me. When, however, I had washed and anointed him and had given him clothes, and after I had sworn a solemn oath not to betray him to the Trojans, till he had got safely back to his own camp and to the ships, he told me all that the Achaeans meant to do. He killed many Trojans and got much information before he reached the Argive camp, for all which things the Trojan women made lamentation, but for my own part I was glad, for my heart was beginning to yearn after my home, and I was unhappy about the wrong that Venus had done me in taking me over there, away from my country, my girl, my lawful wedded husband, who is indeed by no means deficient either in person or understanding. Then Menelaus said, All that you have been saying, my dear wife, is true. I have travelled much and have had much to do with heroes, but I have never seen such another man as Ulysses. What endurance, too, and what courage he displayed within the wooden horse, wherein all the bravest of the Argives were lying in wait to bring death and destruction upon the Trojans. At that moment you came up to us. Some god who wished well to the Trojans must have set you on to it, and you had Diphobus with you. Three times did you go all round our hiding-place and pat it. You called our chiefs each by his own name, and mimicked all our wives. Diomed, Ulysses, and I, from our seats inside, heard what a noise you made. Diomed and I could not make up our minds whether to spring out then and there, or to answer you from inside. But Ulysses held us all in check, so we sat quite still, all except Anticlus, who was beginning to answer you, when Ulysses clapped his two brawny hands over his mouth and kept them there. It was this that saved us all for he muzzled Anticlus till Minerva took you away again. "'How sad!' exclaimed Telemachus, that all this was of no avail to save him, nor yet his own iron courage. But now, sir, be pleased to send us all to bed, that we may lie down and enjoy the blessed boon of sleep." On this Helen told the maidservants to set beds in the room that was in the gatehouse, and to make them with good red rugs and spread coverlets on top of them with woolen cloaks for the guests to wear. So the maids went out carrying a torch and made the beds, to which a manservant presently conducted the strangers. Thus then did Telemachus and Pisistratus sleep there in the forecourt, while the son of Atreus lay in an inner room with lovely Helen by his side. When the child of morning, rosy-fingered dawn appeared, Menelaus rose and dressed himself. He bound his sandals on to his comely feet, girded his sword about his shoulders, and left his room looking like an immortal god. 
Then, taking a seat near Telemachus, he said, "'And what, Telemachus, has led you to take this long sea-voyage to Lacedaemon? Are you on public or private business? Tell me all about it.' "'I have come, sir,' replied Telemachus, "'to see if you can tell me anything about my father. I am being eaten out of house and home. My fair estate is being wasted, and my house is full of miscreants who keep killing great numbers of my sheep and oxen, on the pretense of paying their addresses to my mother. Therefore I am suppliant at your knees if haply you may tell me about my father's melancholy end, whether you saw it with your own eyes, or heard it from some other traveller, for he was a man born to trouble. Do not soften things out of any pity for myself, but tell me in all plainness exactly what you saw. If my brave father Ulysses ever did you loyal service either by word or deed, when you Achaeans were harassed by the Trojans, bear it in mind now as in my favour, and tell me truly all." Menelaus on hearing this was very much shocked. So, he exclaimed, these cowards would usurp a brave man's bed? A hind might as well lay her new-born young in the lair of a lion, and then go off to feed in the forest or in some grassy dell. The lion, when he comes back to his lair, will make short work of the pair of them, and so will Ulysses with these suitors. By Father Jove, Minerva, and Apollo, if Ulysses is still the man that he was when he wrestled with Philomylides and Lesbos, and threw him so heavily that all the Achaeans cheered him, if he is still such and were to come near these suitors, they would have a short shrift and a sorry wedding. As regards your questions, however, I will not prevaricate nor deceive you, but will tell you without concealment all that the old man of the sea told me. I was trying to come on here, but the gods detained me in Egypt, for my hecatombs had not given them full satisfaction, and the gods are very strict about having their dues. Now off Egypt, about as far as a ship can sail in a day with a good stiff breeze behind her, there is an island called Pharos. It has a good harbour, from which vessels can get out into open sea when they have taken in water, and here the gods becalmed me twenty days without so much as a breath of fair wind to help me forward. We should have run clean out of provisions, and my men would have starved, if a goddess had not taken pity upon me and saved me in the person of Idothea, daughter to Proteus, the old man of the sea, for she had taken a great fancy to me. She came to me one day when I was by myself, as I often was, for the men used to go with their barbed hooks all over the island in the hope of catching a fish or two, to save them from the pangs of hunger. Stranger, said she, it seems to me that you like starving in this way. At any rate, it does not greatly trouble you, for you stick here day after day, without even trying to get away, though your men are dying by inches. Let me tell you, said I, whichever of the goddesses you may happen to be, that I am not staying here of my own accord, but must have offended the gods that live in heaven. Tell me, therefore, for the gods know everything, which of the immortals it is that is hindering me in this way, and tell me also how I may sail the sea so as to reach my home. Stranger, replied she, I will make it all quite clear to you. There is an old immortal who lives under the sea hereabouts, and whose name is Proteus. He is an Egyptian, and people say he is my father. He is Neptune's head man and knows every inch of ground all over the bottom of the sea. If you can snare him and hold him tight, he will tell you about your voyage, what courses you are to take, and how you are to sail the sea so as to reach your home. He will also tell you, if you so will, all that has been going on at your house, both good and bad, while you have been away on your long and dangerous journey. Can you show me, said I, some stratagem by means of which I may catch this old god without his suspecting it and finding me out? For a god is not easily caught, not by a mortal man. Stranger, said she, I will make it all quite clear to you. About the time when the sun shall have reached mid-heaven, the old man of the sea comes up from under the waves, heralded by the west wind that furs the water over his head. As soon as he has come up he lies down and goes to sleep in a great sea-cave, where the seals, Halosidnes chickens as they call them, come up also from the grey sea and go to sleep in shoals all round him. 
and a very strong and fish-like smell do they bring with them. Early tomorrow morning I will take you to this place and will lay you in ambush. Pick out, therefore, the three best men you have in your fleet, and I will tell you all the tricks that the old man will play you. First he will look over all his seals and count them. Then, when he has seen them and tallied them on his five fingers, he will go to sleep among them, as a shepherd among his sheep. The moment you see that he is asleep, seize him. Put forth all your strength and hold him fast, for he will do his very utmost to get away from you. He will turn himself into every kind of creature that goes upon earth, and will become also both fire and water. But you must hold him fast and grip him tighter and tighter, till he begins to talk to you and comes back to what he was when you saw him go to sleep. Then you may slacken your hold and let him go. You can ask him which of the gods it is that is angry with you, and what you must do to reach your home over the seas." Having so said, she dived under the waves, whereon I turned back to the place where my ships were ranged upon the shore. And my heart was clouded with care as I went along. When I reached my ship, we got supper ready, for night was falling, and camped down upon the beach. When the child of morning, rosy-fingered dawn appeared, I took the three men on whose prowess of all kinds I could most rely, and went along by the seaside, praying heartily to heaven. Meanwhile the goddess fetched me up four sealskins from the bottom of the sea, all of them just skinned, for she meant playing a trick upon her father. She then dug four pits for us to lie in, and sat down to wait till we should come up. When we were close to her, she made us lie down in the pits one after the other, and threw a sealskin over each of us. Our ambuscade would have been intolerable, for the stench of the fishy seals was most distressing. Who would go to bed with a sea-monster if he could help it? But here, too, the goddess helped us, and thought of something that gave us great relief, for she put some ambrosia under each man's nostrils, which was so fragrant that it killed the smell of the seals. We waited the whole morning and made the best of it, watching the seals come up in hundreds to bask upon the seashore, till at noon the old man of the sea came up too, and when he found his fat seals he went over them and counted them. We were among the first he counted, and he never suspected any guile, but laid himself down to sleep as soon as he had done counting. Then we rushed upon him with a shout and seized him, on which he began at once with his old tricks, and changed himself first into a lion with a great mane, then all of a sudden he became a dragon, a leopard, a wild boar. The next moment he was a running water, and then again, directly, he was a tree. But we stuck to him and never lost hold, till at last the cunning old creature became distressed, and said, Which of the gods was it, son of Atreus, that hatched this plot with you for snaring me and seizing me against my will? What do you want? You know that yourself, old man, I answered you will gain nothing by trying to put me off. It is because I have kept so long in this island and see no sign of my being able to get away. I am losing all heart. Tell me, then, for you gods know everything, which of the immortals it is that is hindering me, and tell me also how I may sail the sea so as to reach my home." Then, he said, if you would finish your voyage and get home quickly, you must offer sacrifices to Jove and to the rest of the gods before embarking, for it is decreed that you shall not get back to your friends and to your own house till you have returned to the heaven-fed stream of Egypt and offered holy hecatombs to the immortal gods that reign in heaven. When you have done this they will let you finish your voyage." I was broken-hearted when I heard that I must go back all that long and terrible voyage to Egypt. Nevertheless, I answered, I will do all, old man, that you have laid upon me. But now tell me, and tell me true, whether all the Achaeans whom Nestor and I left behind us when we set sail from Troy have got home safely, or whether any one of them came to a bad end, either on board his own ship or among his friends when the days of his fighting were done." "'Son of Atreus,' he answered, "'why ask me? You had better not know what I can tell you, for your eyes will surely fill when you have heard my story. Many of those about whom you ask are dead and gone, but many still remain, and only two of the chief men among the Achaeans perished during their return home. As for what happened on the field of battle, 
You were there yourself. A third Achaean leader is still at sea, alive, but hindered from returning. Ajax was wrecked, for Neptune drove him on to the great rocks of Gyra. Nevertheless, he let him get safe out of the water, and in spite of all Minerva's hatred he would have escaped death if he had not ruined himself by boasting. He said the gods could not drown him even though they had tried to do so, and when Neptune heard this large talk he seized his trident in his two brawny hands and split the rock of Gyra in two pieces. The base remained where it was, but the part in which Ajax was sitting fell headlong into the sea and carried Ajax with it. So he drank salt water and was drowned. Your brother and his ships escaped, for Juno protected him, but when he was just about to reach the high promontory of Malia he was caught by a heavy gale which carried him out to sea again sorely against his will, and drove him to the foreland where Thyestes used to dwell, but where Aegisthus was then living. By and by, however, it seemed as though he was to return safely after all, for the gods backed the wind into its old quarter and they reached home, whereon Agamemnon kissed his native soil and shed tears of joy at finding himself in his own country. Now there was a watchman whom Aegisthus kept always on the watch, and to whom he had promised two talents of gold. This man had been looking out for a whole year to make sure that Agamemnon did not give him the slip and prepare war. When, therefore, this man saw Agamemnon go by, he went and told Aegisthus, who at once began to lay a plot for him. He picked twenty of his bravest warriors and placed them in ambuscade on one side of the cloister, while on the opposite side he prepared a banquet. Then he sent his chariots and horsemen to Agamemnon, and invited him to the feast, but he met foul play. He got him there, all unsuspicious of the doom that was awaiting him and killed him when the banquet was over as though he were butchering an ox in the shambles. Not one of Agamemnon's followers was left alive, nor yet one of Aegisthus, but they were all killed there in the cloisters. Thus spoke Proteus, and I was broken-hearted as I heard him. I sat down upon the sands and wept. I felt as though I could no longer bear to live nor look upon the light of the sun. Presently, when I had had my fill of weeping and writhing upon the ground, the old man of the sea said, Son of Atreus, do not waste any more time in crying so bitterly. It can do no manner of good. Find your way home as fast as ever you can, for Aegisthus may still be alive. And even though Orestes has been beforehand with you in killing him, you may yet come in for his funeral. On this I took comfort in spite of all my sorrow, and said, I know then about these two. Tell me, therefore, about the third man of whom you spoke. Is he still alive, but at sea, and unable to get home? Or is he dead? Tell me, no matter how much it may grieve me." The third man, he answered, is Ulysses, who dwells in Ithaca. I can see him in an island, sorrowing bitterly in the house of the nymph Calypso, who is keeping him prisoner, and he cannot reach his home, for he has no ships nor sailors to take him over the sea. As for your own end, Menelaus, you shall not die in Argos, but the gods will take you to the Elysian plain, which is at the ends of the world. There fair-haired Rhadamanthus reigns, and men lead an easier life than anywhere else in the world, for in Elysium there falls not rain nor hail nor snow, but Oceanus breathes ever with a west wind that sings softly from the sea and gives fresh life to all men. This will happen to you because you have married Helen, and are Jove's son-in-law." As he spoke he dived under the waves, whereon I turned back to the ships with my companions, and my heart was clouded with care as I went along. When we reached the ships we got supper ready, for night was falling, and camped down upon the beach. When the child of morning, rosy-fingered dawn appeared, we drew our ships into the water and put our masts and sails within them. Then we went on board ourselves, took our seats on the benches, and smote the grey sea with our oars. I again stationed my ships in the heaven-fed stream of Egypt, and offered hecatombs that were full and sufficient. When I had thus appeased heaven's anger, I raised a barrow to the memory of Agamemnon, that his name might live for ever, after which I had a quick passage home, for the gods sent me a fair wind. And now for yourself. 
Stay here some ten or twelve days longer, and I will then speed you on your way. I will make you a noble present of a chariot and three horses. I will also give you a beautiful chalice that so long as you live you may think of me whenever you make a drink-offering to the immortal gods." "'Son of Atreus,' replied Telemachus, "'do not press me to stay longer. I should be contented to remain with you for another twelve months. I find your conversation so delightful that I should never once wish myself at home with my parents. But my crew, whom I have left at Pylos, are already impatient, and you are detaining me from them. As for any present you may be disposed to make me, I had rather that it should be a piece of plate. I will take no horses back with me to Ithaca, but will leave them to adorn your own stables, for you have much flat ground in your kingdom where lotus thrives, as also meadow-sweet and wheat and barley, and oats with their white and spreading ears. Whereas in Ithaca we have neither open fields nor race-courses, and the country is more fit for goats than horses, and I like it the better for that. None of our islands have much level ground, suitable for horses, and Ithaca least of all." Menelaus smiled and took Telemachus's hand with his own. "'What you say,' said he, "'shows that you come of good family. I both can and will make this exchange for you, by giving you the finest and most precious piece of plate in all my house. It is a mixing-bowl by Vulcan's own hand, of pure silver except the rim, which is inlaid with gold. Phidemus, king of the Sidonians, gave it me in the course of a visit which I paid him when I returned thither on my homeward journey. I will make you a present of it." Thus did they converse, and guests kept coming to the king's house. They brought sheep and wine, while their wives had put up bread for them to take with them. So they were busy cooking their dinners in the courts. Meanwhile the suitors were throwing discs or aiming with spears at a mark on the level ground in front of Ulysses' house and were behaving with all of their old insolence. Antinous and Eurymachus, who were their ringleaders and much the foremost among them all, were sitting together when Naaman son of Phronius came up and said to Antinous, "'Have we any idea, Antinous, on what day Telemachus returns from Pylos? He has a ship of mine, and I want it, to cross over to Elis. I have twelve brood-mares there with yearling mule-foals by their side, not yet broken in, and I want to bring one of them over here and break him. They were astounded when they heard this, for they had made sure that Telemachus had not gone to the city of Nellius. They thought he was only away somewhere on the farms, and was with the sheep or with the swineherd. So Antinous said, When did he go? Tell me truly, and what young men did he take with him? Were they freemen or his own bondsmen? For he might manage that too. Tell me also, did you let him have the ship of your own free will because he asked you, or did he take it without your leave?" "'I lent it him,' answered Noemon. "'What else could I do when a man of his position said he was in a difficulty, and asked me to oblige him? I could not possibly refuse. As for those who went with him, they were the best young men we have, and I saw Mentor go on board as captain, or some god who was exactly like him. I cannot understand it, for I saw Mentor here myself yesterday morning and yet he was then setting out for Pylos. Noemon then went back to his father's house, but Antinous and Eurymachus were very angry. They told the others to leave off playing and to come and sit down along with themselves. When they came, Antinous son of Eupathes spoke in anger. His heart was black with rage and his eyes flashed fire as he said, "'Good heavens! This voyage of Telemachus is a very serious matter. We had made sure that it would come to nothing, but the young fellow has got away in spite of us, and with a picked crew, too. He will be giving us trouble presently. May Jove take him before he is full grown. Find me a ship, therefore, with a crew of twenty men, and I will lie in wait for him in the straits between Ithaca and Samos. He will then rue the day that he set out to try and get news of his father." Thus did he speak, and the others applauded his saying. They then all of them went inside the buildings. It was not long ere Penelope came to know what the suitors were plotting, for a manservant, Medon, overheard them from outside the outer court as they were laying their schemes within, and went to tell his mistress. As he crossed the threshold of her room, Penelope said, "'Medon, what have the suitors set you here for? 
Is it to tell the maids to leave their master's business and cook dinner for them? I wish they may neither woo nor dine henceforward, neither here nor anywhere else. But let this be the very last time, for the waste you all make of my son's estate. Did not your fathers tell you when you were children how good Ulysses had been to them, never doing anything high-handed or speaking harshly to anybody? Kings may say things sometimes, and they may take fancy to one man and dislike another, but Ulysses never did an unjust thing by anybody, which shows what bad hearts you have, and that there is no such thing as gratitude left in this world." Then Medan said, "'I wish, madam, that this were all. But they are plotting something much more dreadful now. May heaven frustrate their design. They are going to try and murder Telemachus as he is coming home from Pylos and Lacedaemon, where he has been to get news of his father." Then Penelope's heart sank within her, and for a long time she was speechless. Her eyes filled with tears, and she could find no utterance. At last, however, she said, "'Why did my son leave me? What business had he to go sailing off in ships that make long voyages over the ocean like seahorses? Does he want to die without leaving any one behind him to keep up his name?' "'I do not know,' answered Medan, "'whether some god set him on to it, or whether he went on his own impulse to see if he could find out if his father was dead or alive and on his way home." Then he went downstairs again, leaving Penelope in an agony of grief. There were plenty of seats in the house, but she had no heart for sitting on any one of them. She could only fling herself on the floor of her own room and cry. Whereon all the maids in the house, both old and young, gathered round her and began to cry too, till at last in a transport of sorrow she exclaimed, "'My dears, heaven has been pleased to try me with more affliction than any other woman of my age and country. First I lost my brave and lion-hearted husband, who had every good quality under heaven, and whose name was great over all Hellas and Middle Argos. And now my darling son is at the mercy of the winds and waves, without my having heard one word about his leaving home. You hussies! There was not one of you would so much as think of giving me a call out of my bed, though you all of you very well knew what he was starting. If I had known he meant taking this voyage, he would have had to give it up, no matter how much he was bent upon it, or leave me a corpse behind him, one or other. Now, however, go some of you and call old Dolius, who was given me by my father on my marriage, and who is my gardener. Bid him go at once and tell everything to Laertes, who may be able to hit on some plan for enlisting public sympathy on our side, as against those who are trying to exterminate his own race and that of Ulysses." Then the dear old nurse Eurycleia said, "'You may kill me, madam, or let me live on in your house, whichever you please. But I will tell you the real truth. I knew all about it, and gave him everything he wanted in the way of bread and wine but he made me take my solemn oath that I would not tell you anything for some ten or twelve days, unless you asked or happened to hear of his having gone, for he did not want to spoil your beauty by crying. And now, madam, wash your face, change your dress, and go upstairs with your maids to offer prayers to Minerva, daughter of Aegis-bearing Jove, for she can save him even though he be in the jaws of death. Do not trouble Laertes, he has trouble enough already. Besides, I cannot think that the gods hate the race of the son of Arcesius so much, but there will be a son left to come up after him, and inherit both the house and the fair fields that lie far all around it." With these words she made her mistress leave off crying, and dried the tears from her eyes. Penelope washed her face, changed her dress, and went upstairs with her maids. She then put some bruised barley into a basket and began praying to Minerva. Hear me she cried, daughter of Aegis-bearing Jove, unweariable. If ever Ulysses, while he was here, burned you fat thy bones of sheep or heifer, bear it in mine now as in my favour, and save my darling son from the villainy of the suitors." She cried aloud as she spoke, and the goddess heard her prayer. Meanwhile the suitors were clamorous throughout the covered cloister, and one of them said, "'The queen is preparing her marriage with one or other of us. Little does she dream that her son has now been doomed to die." This was what they said, but they did not show what was going to happen. 
Then Antinous said, Comrades, let there be no loud talking, lest some of it get carried inside. Let us be up and do that in silence, about which we are all of a mind. He then chose twenty men, and they went down to their ship and to the seaside. They drew the vessel into the water and got her mast and sails inside her. They bound the oars to the tholepins with twisted thongs of leather all in due course, and spread the white sails aloft, while their fine servants brought them their armor. Then they made the ship fast a little way out, came on shore again, got their suppers, and waited till night should fall. But Penelope lay in her own room upstairs, unable to eat or drink, and wondering whether her brave son would escape, or be overpowered by the wicked suitors. Like a lioness caught in the toils with huntsmen hemming her in on every side, she thought and thought till she sank into a slumber, and lay on her bed bereft of thought and motion. Then Minerva bethought her of another matter, and made a vision in the likeness of Penelope's sister Iphthime, daughter of Icarius, who had married Eumelus and lived in Ferry. She told the vision to go to the house of Ulysses, and to make Penelope leave off crying, so it came into her room by the hole through which the thong went for pulling the door to, and hovered over her head, saying, You are asleep, Penelope. The gods who live at ease will not suffer you to weep and be so sad. Your son has done them no wrong, so he will yet come back to you." Penelope, who was sleeping sweetly at the gates of Dreamland, answered, "'Sister, why have you come here? You do not come very often, but I suppose that is because you live such a long way off. Am I, then, to leave off crying and refrain from all the sad thoughts that torture me? I, who have lost my brave and lion-hearted husband, who had every good quality under heaven, and whose name was great all over Hellas and Middle Argos. And now my darling son has gone off on board of a ship, a foolish fellow, who has never been used to roughing it, nor to going about among gatherings of men. I am even more anxious about him than about my husband. I am all in a tremble when I think of him, lest something should happen to him, either from the people among whom he has gone, or by sea, for he has many enemies who are plotting against him and are bent on killing him before he can return home." Then the vision said, "'Take heart, and be not so much dismayed. There is one gone with him who many a man would be glad enough to have stand by his side, I mean Minerva. It is she who has compassion upon you, and who has sent me to bear you this message.' "'Then,' said Penelope, "'if you are a god or have been sent here by divine commission, tell me also about the other unhappy one. Is he still alive, or is he already dead and in the house of Hades?" And the vision said, "'I shall not tell you for certain whether he is alive or dead, and there is no use in idle conversation.' Then it vanished through the thong-hole of the door and was dissipated into thin air, but Penelope rose from her sleep refreshed and comforted, so vivid had been her dream. Meantime the suitors went on board and sailed their ways over the sea, intent on murdering Telemachus. Now there is a rocky islet called Asteris, of no great size, in mid-channel between Ithaca and Samos, and there is a harbour on either side of it where a ship can lie. Here then the Achaeans place themselves in ambush. End of Book Four Book Five of The Odyssey by Homer Translated by Samuel Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Odyssey. Book V. Calypso. Ulysses reaches Scaria on a raft. And now, as dawn rose from her couch beside Tethonus, harbinger of light alike to mortals and immortals, the gods met in council, and with them Jove, the lord of thunder, who is their king. Thereon Minerva began to tell them of the many sufferings of Ulysses, for she pitied him away there in the house of the nymph Calypso. "'Father Jove,' said she, "'and all you other gods that live in everlasting bliss, I hope there may never be such a thing as a kind and well-disposed ruler any more, nor one who will govern equitably. I hope they will be all henceforth cruel and unjust, 
for there is not one of his subjects but has forgotten Ulysses, who ruled them as though he were their father. There he is, lying in great pain in an island where dwells the nymph Calypso, who will not let him go, and he cannot get back to his own country, for he can find neither ships nor sailors to take him over the sea. Furthermore, wicked people are now trying to murder his only son Telemachus, who is coming home from Pylos and Lacedaemon, where he has been to see if he can get news of his father." "'What, my dear, are you talking about?' replied her father. "'Did you not send him there yourself, because you thought it would help Ulysses to get home and punish the suitors? Besides, you are perfectly able to protect Telemachus and to see him safely home again, while the suitors have to come hurry-scurrying back without having killed him." When he had thus spoken, he said to his son Mercury, Mercury, you are our messenger. Go therefore and tell Calypso we have decreed that poor Ulysses is to return home. He is to be convoyed neither by gods nor men, but after a perilous voyage of twenty days upon a raft, he is to reach fertile Scaria, the land of the Phaeacians, who are near of kin to the gods, and will honor him as though he were one of ourselves. They will send him in a ship to his own country and will give him more bronze and gold and raiment than he would have brought back from Troy if he had had all his prize-money and had got home without disaster. This is how we have settled that he shall return to his country and his friends." Thus he spoke, and Mercury, guide and guardian, slayer of Argus, did as he was told. Forthwith he bound on his glittering golden sandals with which he could fly like the wind over land and sea he took the wand with which he seals men's eyes in sleep or wakes them just as he pleases, and flew, holding it in his hand over Pieria. Then he swooped down through the firmament till he reached the level of the sea, whose waves he skimmed like a cormorant that flies fishing every hole and corner of the ocean and drenching its thick plumage in the spray. He flew and flew over many a weary wave, but when at last he got to the island, which was his journey's end, he left the sea and went on by land, till he came to the cave where the nymph Calypso lived. He found her at home. There was a large fire burning on the hearth, and one could smell from far the fragrant reek of burning cedar and sandalwood. As for herself, she was busy at her loom, shooting her golden shuttle through the warp and singing beautifully. Round her cave there was a thick wood of alder, poplar, and sweet-smelling cypress trees, wherein all kinds of great birds had built their nests, owls, hawks, and chattering sea-crows that occupy their business in the waters. A vine loaded with grapes was trained and grew luxuriantly about the mouth of the cave. There were also four running rills of water in channels cut pretty close together, and turned hither and thither so as to irrigate the beds of violets and luscious herbage over which they flowed. Even a god could not help being charmed with such a lovely spot, so Mercury stood still and looked at it. But when he had admired it sufficiently, he went inside the cave. Calypso knew him at once, for the gods all know each other, no matter how far they live from one another, but Ulysses was not within. He was on the seashore as usual, looking out upon the barren ocean with tears in his eyes, groaning and breaking his heart for sorrow. Calypso gave Mercury a seat and said, Why have you come to see me, Mercury, honored and ever welcome, for you do not visit me often? Say what you want, I will do it for you at once if I can, and if it can be done at all. But come inside and let me set refreshment before you. As she spoke, she drew a table loaded with ambrosia beside him and mixed him some red nectar, so Mercury ate and drank till he had had enough, and then said, We are speaking god and goddess to one another, and you ask me why I have come here, and I will tell you truly, as you would have me do. Jove sent me. It was no doing of mine. Who could possibly want to come all this way over the sea where there are no cities full of people to offer me sacrifices or choice hecatombs? Nevertheless I had to come, for none of us other gods can cross Jove, nor transgress his orders. He says that you have here the most ill-starred of all those who fought nine years before the city of King Priam, and sailed home in the tenth year after having sacked it. 
On their way home they sinned against Minerva, who raised both wind and waves against them, so that all his brave companions perished, and he alone was carried hither by wind and tide. Jove says that you are to let this man go at once, for it is decreed that he shall not perish here, far from his own people, but shall return to his house and country and see his friends again." Calypso trembled with rage when she heard this. "'You gods!' she exclaimed, "'ought to be ashamed of yourselves. You are always jealous and hate seeing a goddess take a fancy to a mortal man and live with him in open matrimony. So when rosy-fingered dawn made love to Orion, you precious gods were all of you furious, till Diana went and killed him in Ortigia. So again, when Ceres fell in love with Aeacian, and yielded to him in a thrice-ploughed fallow field, Jove came to hear of it before so very long, and killed Aeacian with his thunderbolts. And now you are angry with me, too, because I have a man here. I found the poor creature sitting all alone astride of a keel, for Jove had struck his ship with lightning and sunk it in mid-ocean, so that all his crew were drowned, while he himself was driven by wind and waves on to my island. I got fond of him and cherished him, and had set my heart on making him immortal, so that he should never grow old all his days. Still I cannot cross Jove, nor bring his counsels to nothing. Therefore, if he insists upon it, let the man go beyond the seas again but I cannot send him anywhere myself, for I have neither ships nor men who can take him. Nevertheless, I will readily give him such advice, in all good faith, as will be likely to bring him safely to his own country." "'Then send him away,' said Mercury, "'or Jove will be angry with you and punish you.' On this he took his leave, and Calypso went out to look for Ulysses, for she had heard Jove's message. She found him sitting upon the beach with his eyes ever filled with tears, and dying of sheer homesickness, for he had got tired of Calypso, and though he was forced to sleep with her in the cave by night, it was she, not he, that would have it so. As for the daytime, he spent it on the rocks and on the seashore, weeping, crying aloud for his despair, and always looking out upon the sea. Calypso then went up close to him and said, "'My poor fellow! you shall not stay here grieving and fretting your life out any longer. I am going to send you away of my own free will. So go, cut some beams of wood, and make yourself a large raft with an upper deck that it may carry you safely over the sea. I will put bread, wine, and water on board to save you from starving. I will also give you clothes, and will send you a fair wind to take you home, if the gods in heaven so will it for they know more about these things and can settle them better than I can." Ulysses shuddered as he heard her. "'Now, goddess,' he answered, "'there is something behind all this. You cannot be really meaning to help me home when you bid me do such a dreadful thing as put to sea on a raft. Not even a well-found ship with a fair wind could venture on such a distant voyage. Nothing that you can say or do shall make me go on board a raft unless you first solemnly swear that you mean me no mischief." Calypso smiled at this and caressed him with her hand. "'You know a great deal,' said she, "'but you are quite wrong here. May heaven above and earth below be my witness with the waters of the river Styx, and this is the most solemn oath which a blessed God can take, that I mean you no sort of harm, and only advising you to do exactly what I should do myself in your place. I am dealing with you quite straightforwardly. My heart is not made of iron, and I am very sorry for you." When she had thus spoken, she led the way rapidly before him, and Ulysses followed in her steps. So the pair, goddess and man, went on and on till they came to Calypso's cave, where Ulysses took the seat that Mercury had just left. Calypso set meat and drink before him of the food that mortals eat, but her maids brought ambrosia and nectar for herself and they laid their hands on the good things that were before them. When they had satisfied themselves with meat and drink, Calypso spoke, saying, Ulysses, noble son of Laertes, so you would start home to your own land at once? Good luck go with you. But if you could only know how much suffering is in store for you before you get back to your own country, you would stay where you are, 
Keep house along with me, and let me make you immortal, no matter how anxious you may be to see this wife of yours, of whom you are thinking all the time day after day. Yet I flatter myself that I am no whit less tall or well-looking than she is, for it is not to be expected that a mortal woman should compare in beauty with an immortal." Goddess, replied Ulysses, do not be angry with me about this. I am quite aware that my wife Penelope is nothing like so tall or so beautiful as yourself. She is only a woman, whereas you are an immortal. Nevertheless I want to get home, and can think of nothing else. If some god wrecks me when I am on the sea, I will bear it and make the best of it. I have had infinite trouble both by land and sea already, so let this go with the rest." Presently the sun set and it became dark, whereon the pair retired into the inner part of the cave and went to bed. When the child of morning, rosy-fingered dawn appeared, Ulysses put on his shirt and cloak, while the goddess wore a dress of a light gossamer fabric, very fine and graceful, with a beautiful golden girdle about her waist and a veil to cover her head. She at once set herself to think how she could speed Ulysses on his way. So she gave him a great bronze axe that suited his hands. It was sharpened on both sides and had a beautiful olive-wood handle fitted firmly onto it. She also gave him a sharp adze, and then led the way to the far end of the island where the largest trees grew, alder, poplar, and pine, that reached the sky, very dry and well-seasoned, so as to sail light for him in the water. Then, when she had shown him where the best trees grew, Calypso went home, leaving him to cut them, which he soon finished doing. He cut down twenty trees in all and adds them smooth, squaring them by rule in good workmanlike fashion. Meanwhile Calypso came back with some augers, so he bored holes with them and fitted the timbers together with bolts and rivets. He made the raft as broad as a skilled shipwright makes the beam of a large vessel and he fixed a deck on top of the ribs, and ran a gunwale all around it. He also made a mast with a yard-arm, and a rudder to steer with. He fenced the raft all round with wicker hurdles as a protection against the waves, and then he threw on a quantity of wood. By and by Calypso brought him some linen to make the sails, and he made these two excellently, making them fast with braces and sheets. Last of all, with the help of levers, he drew the raft down into the water. In four days he had completed the whole work, and on the fifth Calypso sent him from the island after washing him and giving him some clean clothes. She gave him a goatskin full of black wine, and another larger one of water. She also gave him a wallet full of provisions, and found him in much good meat. Moreover she made the wind fair and warm for him, and gladly did Ulysses spread his sail before it while he sat and guided the raft skillfully by means of the rudder. He never closed his eyes, but kept them fixed on the Pleiads, on late-setting booties and on the bear, which men also call the wain, and which turns round and round where it is, facing Orion, and alone never dipping into the stream of Oceanus, for Calypso had told him to keep this to his left. Day seven and ten did he sail over the sea, and on the eighteenth the dim outlines of the mountains on the nearest part of the Phaeacian coast appeared, rising like a shield on the horizon. But King Neptune, who was returning from the Ethiopians, caught sight of Ulysses a long way off, from the mountains of the Solomy. He could see him sailing upon the sea, and it made him very angry, so he wagged his head and muttered to himself, saying, "'Good heavens, so the gods have been changing their minds about Ulysses while I was away in Ethiopia and now he is close to the land of the Phaeacians, where it is decreed that he shall escape from the calamities that have befallen him. Still he shall have plenty of hardship yet before he has done with it." Thereon he gathered his clouds together, grasped his trident, stirred it round in the sea, and roused the rage of every wind that blows, till earth, sea, and sky were hidden in cloud, and night sprang forth out of the heavens. Winds from east, south, north, and west fell upon him all at the same time, and a tremendous sea got up, so that Ulysses' heart began to fail him. Alas, he said to himself in his dismay, whatever will become of me! I am afraid Calypso was right when she said I should have trouble by sea before I got home. 
It is all coming true. How black is Jove making heaven with his clouds, and what a sea the winds are raising from every quarter at once! I am now safe to perish. Blessed and thrice blessed were those Danaeans who fell before Troy in the cause of the sons of Atreus. Would that I had been killed on the day when the Trojans were pressing me so sorely about the dead body of Achilles, for then I should have had due burial and the Achaeans would have honored my name. But now it seems that I shall come to a most pitiable end." As he spoke, a sea broke over him with such terrific fury that the raft reeled again, and he was carried overboard a long way off. He let go the helm, and the force of the hurricane was so great that it broke the mast halfway up, and both sail and yard went over into the sea. For a long time Ulysses was under water, and it was all he could do to rise to the surface again, for the close Calypso had given him weighed him down. But at last he got his head above water and spat out the bitter brine that was running down his face in streams. In spite of all this, however, he did not lose sight of his craft, but swam as fast as he could towards it, got hold of it and climbed on board again so as to escape drowning. The sea took the raft and tossed it about, as autumn winds whirl thistle-down round and round upon a road. It was as though the south, north, east, and west winds were all playing battledore and shuttlecock with it at once. When he was in this plight, Eno, daughter of Cadmus, also called Leucothea, saw him. She had formerly been a mere mortal, but had since raised to the rank of a marine goddess. Seeing in what great distress Ulysses now was, she had compassion upon him, and, rising like a seagull from the waves, took her seat upon the raft. "'My poor good man,' said she, "'why is Neptune so furiously angry with you? He is giving you a great deal of trouble, but for all his bluster he will not kill you. You seem to be a sensible person. Do then as I bid you. Strip, leave your raft to drive before the wind, and swim to the Phaeacian coast where better luck awaits you.' and here take my veil and put it round your chest. It is enchanted, and you can come to no harm so long as you wear it. As soon as you touch land take it off, throw it back as far as you can into the sea, and then go away again." With these words she took off her veil and gave it him. Then she dived down again like a seagull and vanished beneath the dark blue waters. But Ulysses did not know what to think. Alas, he said to himself in his dismay, this is only some one or other of the gods who is luring me to ruin by advising me to quit my raft. At any rate, I will not do so at present, for the land where she said I should be quit of all troubles seemed to be still a good way off. I know what I will do. I am sure it will be the best. No matter what happens, I will stick to the raft as long as her timbers hold together. But when the sea breaks her up, I will swim for it. I do not see how I can do any better than this." While he was thus in two minds, Neptune sent a terrible great wave that seemed to rear itself above his head till it broke right over the raft, which then went to pieces as though it were a heap of dry chaff tossed about by a whirlwind. Ulysses got astride of one plank and rode upon it as if he were on horseback. He then took off the clothes Calypso had given him, bound Eno's veil under his arms, and plunged into the sea meaning to swim on shore. King Neptune watched him as he did so, and wagged his head, muttering to himself and saying, "'There now, swim up and down as best you can till you fall in with the well-to-do people. I do not think you will be able to say that I have let you off too lightly.' On this he lashed his horses and drove to Aegea where his palace is. But Minerva resolved to help Ulysses, so she bound the ways of all the winds except one and made them lie quite still. But she roused a good stiff breeze from the north that should lay the waters till Ulysses reached the land of the Phaeacians where he would be safe. Thereon he floated about for two nights and two days in the water, with a heavy swell on the sea and death staring him in the face. But when the third day broke, the wind fell and there was a dead calm without so much as a breath of air stirring. As he rose on the swell, he looked eagerly ahead and could see land quite near. Then, 
as children rejoice when their dear father begins to get better, after having for a long time borne sore affliction sent him by some angry spirit, but the gods deliver him from evil, so was Ulysses thankful when he again saw land and trees, and swam on with all his strength that he might once more set foot upon dry ground. When, however, he got within earshot, he began to hear the surf thundering up against the rocks, for the swell still broke against them with a terrific roar. Everything was enveloped in spray. There were no harbors where a ship might ride, nor shelter of any kind, but only headlands, low-lying rocks, and mountain tops. Ulysses' heart now began to fail him, and he said despairingly to himself, Alas, Jove has let me see land after swimming so far that I have given up all hope, but I can find no landing place, for the coast is rocky and surf beaten, the rocks are smooth and rise sheer from the sea, with deep water close under them so that I cannot climb out for want of foothold. I am afraid some great wave will lift me off my legs and dash me against the rocks as I leave the water, which would give me a sorry landing. If, on the other hand, I swim further in search of some shelving beach or harbor, a hurricane may carry me out to sea again sorely against my will, or heaven may send some great monster of the deep to attack me, for Amphitrite breeds many such, and I know that Neptune is very angry with me." While he was thus in two minds, a wave caught him and took him with such force against the rocks that he would have been smashed and torn to pieces if Minerva had not shown him what to do. He caught hold of the rock with both hands and clung to it groaning with pain till the wave retired, so he was saved that time. But presently the wave came on again and carried him back with it far into the sea, tearing his hands as the suckers of a polypus are torn when someone plucks it from its bed and the stones come up along with it. Even so did the rocks tear the skin from his strong hands, and then the wave drew him deep down under the water. Here poor Ulysses would have certainly perished, even in spite of his own destiny, if Minerva had not helped him to keep his wits about him. He swam seaward again, beyond reach of the surf that was beating against the land, and at the same time he kept looking towards the shore to see if he could find some haven, or a spit that should take the waves aslant. By and by, as he swam on, he came to the mouth of a river, and here he thought would be the best place for there were no rocks and it afforded shelter from the wind. He felt that there was a current, so he prayed inwardly and said, Hear me, O king, whoever you may be, and save me from the anger of the sea-god Neptune, for I approach you prayerfully. Any one who has lost his way has at all times a claim even upon the gods, wherefore in my distress I draw near to your stream and cling to the knees of your riverhood. Have mercy upon me, O king, for I declare myself your suppliant." Then the god stayed his stream and stilled the waves, making all calm before him, and bringing him safely into the mouth of the river. Here at last Ulysses' knees and strong hands failed him, for the sea had completely broken him. His body was all swollen, and his mouth and nostrils ran down like a river with sea-water, so that he could neither breathe nor speak and lay swooning from sheer exhaustion. Presently, when he had got his breath and came to himself again, he took off the scarf that Eno had given him and threw it back into the salt stream of the river, whereon Eno received it into her hands from the wave that bore it towards her. Then he left the river, laid himself down among the rushes, and kissed the bounteous earth. Alas! he cried to himself in his dismay, whatever will become of me, and how is it all to end? If I stay here upon the river-bed through the long watches of the night, I am so exhausted that the bitter cold and damp may make an end of me, for towards sunrise there will be a keen wind blowing from off the river. If, on the other hand, I climb the hillside, find shelter in the woods and sleep in some thicket, I may escape the cold and have a good night's rest, but some savage beast may take advantage of me and devour me. In the end he deemed it best to take to the woods, and he found one upon some high ground not far from the water. There he crept beneath two shoots of olive that grew from a single stalk, the one ungrafted sucker while the other had been grafted. No wind, however squally, could break through the cover they afforded, nor could the sun's rays pierce them, 
nor the rain get through them, so closely did they grow into one another. Ulysses crept under these and began to make himself a bed to lie on, for there was a great litter of dead leaves lying about, enough to make a covering for two or three men even in hard winter weather. He was glad enough to see this, so he laid himself down and heaped the leaves all round him. Then, as one who lives alone in the country, far from any neighbor, hides a brand as fire-seed in the ashes to save himself from having to get a light elsewhere, even so did Ulysses cover himself up with leaves, and Minerva shed a sweet sleep upon his eyes, closed his eyelids, and made him lose all memories of his sorrows. End of Book Five Book Six of The Odyssey by Homer Translated by Samuel Butler this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Odyssey, Book Six, the meeting between Nausicaa and Ulysses. So here Ulysses slept, overcome by sleep and toil, but Minerva went off to the country and city of the Phaeacians, a people who used to live in the fair town of Hyperia, near the lawless Cyclopes. Now the Cyclopes were stronger than they and plundered them. So their king, Nausitas, moved them thence and settled them in Scaria, far from all other people. He surrounded the city with a wall, built houses and temples, and divided the lands among his people. But he was dead and gone to the house of Hades, and King Alcinous, whose counsels were inspired of heaven, was now reigning. To his house, then, did Minerva high in furtherance of the return of Ulysses. She went straight to the beautifully decorated bedroom in which there slept a girl who was as lovely as a goddess, Nausicaa, daughter to King Alcinous. Two maidservants were sleeping near her, both very pretty, one on either side of the doorway, which was closed with well-made folding doors. Minerva took the form of the famous sea-captain Dimas's daughter, who was a bosom friend of Nausicaa and just her own age. Then, coming up to the girl's bedside like a breath of wind, she hovered over her head and said, "'Nausicaa, what can your mother have been about, to have such a lazy daughter? Here are your clothes all lying in disorder. Yet you are going to be married almost immediately, and should not only be well dressed yourself, but should find good clothes for those who attend you. This is the way to get yourself a good name, and to make your father and mother proud of you.' Suppose, then, that we make tomorrow a washing day, and start at daybreak. I will come and help you so that you may have everything ready as soon as possible, for all the best young men among your own people are courting you, and you are not going to remain a maid much longer. Ask your father, therefore, to have a wagon and mules ready for us at daybreak, to take the rugs, robes, and girdles, and you can ride too, which will be much pleasanter for you than walking for the washing cisterns are some way from the town." When she had said this, Minerva went away to Olympus, which they say is the everlasting home of the gods. Here no wind beats roughly, and neither rain nor snow can fall, but it abides in everlasting sunshine and in a great peacefulness of light, wherein the blessed gods are illumined for ever and ever. This was the place to which the goddess went when she had given instructions to the girl. By and by morning came and woke Nausicaa, who began wondering about her dream. She therefore went to the other end of the house to tell her father and mother all about it, and found them in their own room. Her mother was sitting by the fireside, spinning her purple yarn with her maids around her, and she happened to catch her father just as he was going out to attend a meeting of the town council which the Phaeacian alderman had convened. She stopped him and said, "'Dear Papa, could you manage to let me have a good big wagon? I want to take all our dirty clothes to the river and wash them. You are the chief man here, so it is only right that you should have a clean shirt when you attend meetings of the council. Moreover, you have five sons at home, two of them married, while the other three are good-looking bachelors.' You know they always like to have clean linen when they go to a dance, and I have been thinking about all this." She did not say a word about her own wedding, for she did not like to, but her father knew and said, 
You shall have the mules, my love, and whatever else you have a mind for. Be off with you, and the men shall get you a good strong wagon with a body to it that will hold all your clothes." On this he gave orders to the servants, who got the wagon out, harnessed the mules, and put them to, while the girl brought the clothes down from the linen-room and placed them on the wagon. Her mother prepared her a basket of provisions with all sorts of good things, and a goatskin full of wine. The girl now got into the wagon, and her mother gave her also a golden cruise of oil, that she and her women might anoint themselves. Then she took the whip and reins and lashed the mules on, whereon they set off, and their hoofs clattered on the road. They pulled without flagging, and carried not only Nausicaa and her wash of clothes, but the maids also who were with her. When they reached the waterside they went to the washing cisterns, through which there ran at all times enough pure water to wash any quantity of linen, no matter how dirty. Here they unharnessed the mules and turned them out to feed on the sweet juicy herbage that grew by the waterside. They took the clothes out of the wagon, put them in the water, and vied with one another in treading them in the pits to get the dirt out. After they had washed them and got them quite clean, they laid them out by the seaside, where the waves had raised a high beach of shingle, and set about washing themselves and anointing themselves with olive oil. Then they got their dinner by the side of the stream, and waited for the sun to finish drying the clothes. When they had done dinner they threw off the veils that covered their heads and began to play at ball, while Nausicaa sang for them. As the huntress Diana goes forth upon the mountains of Tagetus or Aramanthus to hunt wild boars or deer, and the wood-nymphs, daughters of Aegis-bearing Jove, take their sport along with her, then is Leto proud at seeing her daughter stand a full head taller than the others, and eclipse the loveliest amid a whole bevy of beauties. Even so did the girl outshine her handmaids. When it was time for them to start home, and they were folding the clothes and putting them into the wagon, Minerva began to consider how Ulysses should wake up and see the handsome girl who was to conduct him to the city of the Phaeacians. The girl, therefore, threw a ball at one of the maids, which missed her and fell into deep water. On this they all shouted, and the noise they made woke Ulysses, who sat up in his bed of leaves and began to wonder what it might all be. Alas, he said to himself, what kind of people have I come amongst? Are they cruel, savage and uncivilized, or hospitable and humane? I seem to hear the voices of young women, and they sound like those of the nymphs that haunt mountain-tops, or springs of rivers and meadows of green grass. At any rate, I am among a race of men and women. Let me try if I cannot manage to get a look at them." As he said this, he crept from under his bush, and broke off a bough covered with thick leaves to hide his nakedness. He looked like some lion of the wilderness that stalks about exulting in his strength and defying both wind and rain. His eyes glare as he prowls in quest of oxen, sheep, or deer, for he is famished, and will dare break even into a well-fenced homestead, trying to get at the sheep. Even such did Ulysses seem to the young women, as he drew near to them all naked as he was, for he was in great want. On seeing one so unkempt and so begrimed with salt water, the others scampered off along the spits that jutted out into the sea. But the daughter of Alcinous stood firm, for Minerva put courage into her heart and took away all fear from her. She stood right in front of Ulysses, and he doubted whether he should go up to her, throw himself at her feet, and embrace her knees as a suppliant, or stay where he was and entreat her to give him some clothes and show him the way to the town. In the end he deemed it best to entreat her from a distance, in case the girl should take offence at his coming near enough to clasp her knees, so he addressed her in honeyed and persuasive language. "'O oh, queen,' he said, "'I implore your aid. But tell me, are you a goddess or are you a mortal woman? If you are a goddess and dwell in heaven, I can only conjecture that you are Jove's daughter Diana, for your face and figure resemble none but hers. If, on the other hand, you are a mortal and live on earth, thrice happy are your father and mother. Thrice happy, too, are your brothers and sisters. How proud and delighted they must feel when they see so fair a scion as yourself go out to a dance. Most happy, however, of all, 
will he be whose wedding gifts have been the richest, and who takes you to his own home? I never yet saw anyone so beautiful, neither man nor woman, and am lost in admiration as I behold you. I can only compare you to a young palm-tree which I saw when I was at Delos growing near the altar of Apollo, for I was there, too, with much people after me, when I was on that journey which has been the source of all my troubles. Never yet did such a young plant shoot out of the ground as that was, and I admired and wondered at it exactly as I now admire and wonder at yourself. I dare not clasp your knees, but I am in great distress. Yesterday made the twentieth day that I have been tossing about upon the sea. The winds and waves have taken me all the way from the Ogygian island, and now fate has flung me upon this coast that I may endure still further suffering for I do not think that I have yet come to the end of it, but rather that heaven has still much evil in store for me. And now, O Queen, have pity upon me, for you are the first person I have met, and I know no one else in this country. Show me the way to your town, and let me have anything that you may have brought hither to wrap your clothes in. May heaven grant you in all things your heart's desire, husband, house, and a happy, peaceful home." for there is nothing better in this world than that man and wife should be of one mind in a house. It discomfits their enemies, makes their hearts of their friends glad, and they themselves know more about it than any one. To this Nausicaa answered, Stranger, you appear to be a sensible, well-disposed person. There is no accounting for luck. Jove gives prosperity to rich and poor, just as he chooses, so you must take what he has seen fit to send you, and make the best of it. Now, however, that you have come to this our country, you shall not want for clothes nor for anything else that a foreigner in distress may reasonably look for. I will show you the way to the town, and will tell you the name of our people. We are called Phaeacians, and I am daughter to Alcinous, in whom the whole power of the state is vested. Then she called her maids, and said, Stay where you are, you girls. Can you not see a man without running away from him? Do you take him for a robber or a murderer? Neither he nor any one else can come here to do us Phoenicians any harm, for we are dear to the gods and live apart on a land's end that juts into the sounding sea and have nothing to do with any other people. This is only some poor man who has lost his way, and we must be kind to him for strangers and foreigners in distress are under Jove's protection, and will take what they can get and be thankful. So, girls, give the poor fellow something to eat and drink, and wash him in the stream at some place that is sheltered from the wind. On this the maids left off running away, and began calling one another back. They made Ulysses sit down in the shelter, as Nausicaa had told them, and brought him a shirt and cloak. They also brought him the little golden cruise of oil, and told him to go and wash in the stream. But Ulysses said, Young women, please to stand a little on one side, that I may wash the brine from my shoulders and anoint myself with oil, for it is long enough since my skin has had a drop of oil upon it. I cannot wash as long as you all keep standing there. I am ashamed to strip before a number of good-looking young women. Then they stood on one side and went to tell the girl, while Ulysses washed himself in the stream and scrubbed the brine from his back and from his broad shoulders. When he had thoroughly washed himself and had got the brine out of his hair, he anointed himself with oil and put on the clothes which the girl had given him. Minerva then made him look taller and stronger than before. She also made the hair grow thick on the top of his head and flow down in curls like hyacinth blossoms. She glorified him about the head and shoulders as a skillful workman who has studied art of all kinds under Vulcan, and Minerva enriches a piece of silver plate by gilding it, and his work is full of beauty. Then he went and sat down a little way off upon the beach, looking quite young and handsome, and the girl gazed on him with admiration. Then she said to her maids, "'Hush, my dears, for I want to say something.' I believe the gods who live in heaven have sent this man to the Phaeacians. When I first saw him I thought him plain, but now his appearance is like that of the gods who dwell in heaven. 
I should like my future husband to be just such another as he is, if he would only stay here and not want to go away. However, give him something to eat and drink." They did as they were told, and set food before Ulysses, who ate and drank ravenously, for it was long since he had had food of any kind. Meanwhile Nausicaa bethought her of another matter. She got the linen folded and placed in the wagon, she then yoked the mules, and as she took her seat she called Ulysses. "'Stranger,' said she, "'rise and let us be going back to the town. I will introduce you at the house of my excellent father, where I can tell you that you will meet all the best people among the Phaeacians. But be sure and do as I bid you, for you seem to be a sensible person. As long as we are going past the fields and farmlands, follow briskly behind the wagon along with the maids, and I will lead the way myself. Presently, however, we shall come to the town, where you will find a high wall running all round it, and a good harbour on either side with a narrow entrance into the city, and the ships will be drawn up by the roadside, for every one has a place where his own ship can lie. You will see the market-place with a temple of Neptune in the middle of it, and paved with large stones bedded in the earth. Here people deal in ships' gear of all kinds, such as cables and sails, and here too are the places where oars are made, for the Phaeacians are not a nation of archers. They know nothing about bows and arrows, but are a seafaring folk, and pride themselves on their masts, oars, and ships, with which they travel far over the sea. I am afraid of the gossip and scandal that may be set on foot against me later on. For the people here are very ill-natured, and some low fellow, if he met us, might say, Who is this fine-looking stranger that is going about with Nausicaa? Where did she find him? I suppose she is going to marry him. Perhaps he is a vagabond sailor whom she has taken from some foreign vessel, for we have no neighbors. Or some god has at last come down from heaven in answer to her prayers, and she is going to live with him all the rest of her life. It would be a good thing if she would take herself off and find a husband somewhere else, for she will not look at one of the many excellent young Phaeacians who are in love with her. This is the kind of disparaging remark that would be made about me, and I could not complain, for I should myself be scandalized at seeing any other girl do the like, and go about with men in spite of everything, while her father and mother were still alive, and without having been married in the face of all the world. If, therefore, you want my father to give you an escort and to help you home, do as I bid you. You will see a beautiful grove of poplars by the roadside, dedicated to Minerva. It has a well in it and a meadow all round it. Here my father has a field of rich garden ground, about as far from the town as a man's voice will carry. Sit down there and wait for a while till the rest of us can get into the town and reach my father's house. Then when you think we must have done this, come into the town and ask the way to the house of my father Alcinous. You will have no difficulty in finding it. Any child will point it out to you, for no one else in the whole town has anything like such a fine house as he has. When you have got past the gates and through the outer court, go right across the inner court till you come to my mother. You will find her sitting by the fire and spinning her purple wool by firelight. It is a fine sight to see her as she leans back against one of the bearing-posts with her maids all ranged behind her. Close to her seat stands that of my father, on which he sits and topes like an immortal god. Never mind him, but go up to my mother and lay your hands upon her knees if you would get home quickly. If you can gain her over, you may hope to see your own country again, no matter how distant it may be." So saying she lashed the mules with her whip and they left the river. The mules drew well and their hoofs went up and down upon the road. She was careful not to go too fast for Ulysses and the maids who were following on foot along with the wagon, so she plied her whip with judgment. As the sun was going down they came to the sacred grove of Minerva, and there Ulysses sat down and prayed to the mighty daughter of Jove. "'Hear me!' he cried, "'daughter of aegis-bearing Jove unweariable! Hear me now! For you gave no heed to my prayers when Neptune was wrecking me. Now, therefore, have pity upon me, and grant that I may find friends and be hospitably received by the Phaeacians.' 
Thus did he pray, and Minerva heard his prayer, but she would not show herself to him openly, for she was afraid of her uncle Neptune, who was still furious in his endeavors to prevent Ulysses from getting home. End of Book Six Book Seven of The Odyssey by Homer Translated by Samuel Butler this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Odyssey, Book Seven, Reception of Ulysses at the Palace of King Alcinous. Thus then did Ulysses wait and pray, but the girl drove on to the town. When she reached her father's house, she drew up at the gateway, and her brothers, comely as the gods, gathered round her, took the mules out of the wagon and carried the clothes into the house while she went to her own room, where an old servant, Eurymedusa of Epeira, lit the fire for her. This old woman had been brought by sea from Epeira, and had been chosen as a prize for Alcinous, because he was king over the Phaeacians, and the people obeyed him as though he were a god. She had been nurse to Nausicaa, and had now lit the fire for her, and brought her supper for her into her own room. Presently Ulysses got up to go towards the town, and Minerva shed a thick mist all round him, to hide him in case any of the proud Phaeacians who met him should be rude to him, or ask him who he was. Then, as he was just entering the town, she came towards him in the likeness of a little girl carrying a pitcher. She stood right in front of him, and Ulysses said, "'My dear, will you be so kind as to show me the house of King Alcinous? I am an unfortunate foreigner in distress, and do not know one in your town and country." Then Minerva said, "'Yes, father stranger, I will show you the house you want, for Alcinous lives quite close to my own father. I will go before you and show the way, but say not a word as you go, and do not look at any man, nor ask him questions, for the people here cannot abide strangers, and do not like men who come from some other place. They are a seafaring folk, and sail the seas by the grace of Neptune in ships that glide along like thought, or as a bird in the air." On this she led the way, and Ulysses followed in her steps. But not one of the Phaeacians could see him as he passed through the city in the midst of them, for the great goddess Minerva in her good will towards him had hidden him in a thick cloud of darkness. He admired their harbors, ships, places of assembly and the lofty walls of the city, which, with the palisade on top of them, were very striking, and when they reached the king's house Minerva said, "'This is the house, father stranger, which you would have me show you. You will find a number of great people sitting at table, but do not be afraid. Go straight in, for the bolder a man is the more likely he is to carry his point, even though he is a stranger. First find the queen. Her name is Aridi, and she comes of the same family as her husband Alcinous. They both descend originally from Neptune, who is father to Nausitus by Perabea, a woman of great beauty. Perabea was the youngest daughter of Eurymedon, who at one time reigned over the giants, but he ruined his ill-fated people and lost his own life to boot. Neptune, however, lay with his daughter, and she had a son by him the great Nausitus, who reigned over the Phaeacians. Nausitus had two sons, Rexenor and Alcinous. Apollo killed the first of them while he was still a bridegroom, and without male issue. But he left a daughter, Aridi, whom Alcinous married, and honors as no other woman is honored of all those that keep house along with their husbands. Thus she both was, and still is, respected beyond measure by her children, by Alcinous himself and by the whole people, who look upon her as a goddess, and greet her whenever she goes about the city, for she is a thoroughly good woman both in head and heart, and when any women are friends of hers, she will help their husbands also to settle their disputes. If you can gain her good will, you may have every hope of seeing your friends again, and getting safely back to your home and country. Then Minerva left Scaria and went away over the sea. She went to Marathon and to the spacious streets of Athens, where she entered the abode of Erechtheus. But Ulysses went on to the house of Alcinous, 
and he pondered much as he paused a while before reaching the threshold of bronze, for the splendor of the palace was like that of the sun or moon. The walls on either side were of bronze from end to end, and the cornice was of blue enamel. The doors were gold and hung on pillars of silver that rose from a floor of bronze, while the lintel was silver and the hook of the door was of gold. On either side there stood gold and silver mastiffs, which Vulcan, with his consummate skill, had fashioned expressly to keep watch over the palace of King Alcinous. So they were immortal and could never grow old. Seats were ranged all along the wall, here and there from one end to the other, with coverings of fine woven work which the women of the house had made. Here the chief persons of the Phaeacians used to sit and eat and drink, for there was abundance at all seasons and there were golden figures of young men with lighted torches in their hands, raised on pedestals, to give light by night to those who were at table. There are fifty maidservants in the house, some of whom are always grinding rich yellow grain at the mill, while others work at the loom, or sit and spin, and their shuttles go backwards and forwards like the fluttering of aspen leaves, while the linen is so closely woven that it will turn oil. As the Phaeacians are the best sailors in the world, so their women excel all others in weaving, for Minerva has taught them all manner of useful arts, and they are very intelligent. Outside the gate of the outer court there is a large garden of about four acres with a wall all round it. It is full of beautiful trees, pears, pomegranates, and the most delicious apples. There are luscious figs also, and olives in full growth. The fruits never rot nor fail all the year round, neither winter nor summer, for the air is so soft that a new crop ripens before the old has dropped. Pear grows on pear, apple on apple, and fig on fig, and so also with the grapes, for there is an excellent vineyard. On the level ground of a part of this the grapes are being made into raisins. In another part they are being gathered, some are being trodden in the wine-tubs, Others further on have shed their blossom and are beginning to show fruit, others again are just changing color. In the furthest part of the ground there are beautifully arranged beds of flowers that are in bloom all the year round. Two streams go through it, the one turned in ducts throughout the whole garden, while the other is carried under the ground of the outer court to the house itself, and the town's people draw water from it. Such, then, were the splendors with which the gods had endowed the house of King Alcinous. So here Ulysses stood for a while and looked about him, but when he had looked long enough he crossed the threshold and went within the precincts of the house. There he found all the chief people among the Phaeacians making their drink-offerings to Mercury, which they always did the last thing before going away for the night. He went straight through the court still hidden by the cloak of darkness in which Minerva had enveloped him, till he reached Arete and King Alcinous. Then he laid his hands upon the knees of the queen, and at that moment the miraculous darkness fell away from him and he became visible. Everyone was speechless with surprise at seeing a man there, but Ulysses began at once with his petition. "'Queen Arete,' he exclaimed, "'daughter of the great Rexener, in my distress I humbly pray you, as also your husband and these your guests, who may heaven prosper with long life and happiness, and may they leave their possessions to their children and all the honors conferred upon them by the state, to help me home to my own country as soon as possible, for I have been long in trouble and away from my friends." Then he sat down on the hearth among the ashes, and they all held their peace till presently the old hero Echeneus, who was an excellent speaker and an elder among the Phaeacians, plainly and in all honesty addressed them thus. Alcinous, said he, it is not creditable to you that a stranger should be seen sitting among the ashes of your hearth. Everyone is waiting to hear what you are about to say. Tell him, then, to rise and take a seat on a stool inlaid with silver, and bid your servants mix some wine and water that we may make a drink-offering to Jove the Lord of Thunder, who takes all well-disposed suppliants under his protection. And let the housekeeper give him some supper, of whatever there may be in the house." When Alcinous heard this he took Ulysses by the hand, 
raised him from the hearth and bade him take the seat of Laodamus, who had been sitting beside him and was his favorite son. A maidservant then brought him water in a beautiful golden ewer and poured it into a silver basin for him to wash his hands, and she drew a clean table beside him. An upper servant brought him bread and offered him many good things of what there was in the house. And Ulysses ate and drank. Then Alcinous said to one of the servants, Pontinus, mix a cup of wine and hand it round that we may make drink offerings to Jove the Lord of Thunder, who is the protector of all well-disposed suppliants. Pontinus then mixed wine and water, and hand it round after giving every man his drink offering. When they had made their offerings, and had drunk each as much as he was minded, Alcinous said, Aldermen and town councillors of the Phaeacians, hear my words. You have had your supper, so now go home to bed. Tomorrow morning I shall invite a still larger number of aldermen, and will give a sacrificial banquet in honor of our guest. We can then discuss the question of his escort, and consider how we may at once send him back rejoicing to his own country, without trouble or inconvenience to himself, no matter how distant it may be. We must see that he comes to no harm while on his homeward journey. But when he is once at home, he will have to take the luck he was born with for better or worse like other people. It is possible, however, that the stranger is one of the immortals who has come down from heaven to visit us. But in this case the gods are departing from their usual practice, for hitherto they have made themselves perfectly clear to us when we have been offering them hecatombs. They come and sit at our feasts just like one of ourselves, and if any solitary wayfarer happens to stumble upon some one or other of them, they affect no concealment, for we as near of kin to the gods as the cyclopes and the savage giants are. Then Ulysses said, Pray, Alcinous, do not take any such notion into your head. I have nothing of the immortal about me, neither in body nor mind, and most resemble those among you who are the most afflicted. Indeed, were I to tell you all that heaven has seen fit to lay upon me, you would say that I was still worse off than they are. Nevertheless, let me sup in spite of sorrow, for an empty stomach is a very important thing, and thrust itself on a man's notice no matter how dire is his distress. I am in great trouble, yet it insists that I shall eat and drink, bids me lay aside all memory of my sorrows and dwell only on the due replenishing of itself. As for yourselves, do as you propose, and at break of day set about helping me to get home. I shall be content to die if I may first once more behold my property, my bondsmen, and all the greatness of my house." Thus did he speak. Every one approved his saying, and agreed that he should have his escort inasmuch as he had spoken reasonably. Then when they had made their drink-offerings, and had drunk each as much as he was minded, they went home to bed every man in his own abode, leaving Ulysses in the cloister with Aridi and Alcinous, while the servants were taking the things away after supper. Aridi was the first to speak, for she recognized the shirt, cloak, and good clothes that Ulysses was wearing, as the work of herself and of her maids. So she said, Stranger, before we go any further, there is a question I should like to ask you. Who and whence are you, and who gave you those clothes? Did you not say you had come here from beyond the sea? And Ulysses answered, it would be a long story, madam, were I to relate in full the tale of my misfortunes, for the hand of heaven has been laid heavy upon me. But as regards your question, there is an island far away in the sea which is called the Ogygian. Here dwells the cunning and powerful goddess Calypso, daughter of Atlas. She lives by herself far from all neighbors human or divine. Fortune, however, brought me to her hearth all desolate and alone for Jove struck my ship with his thunderbolts and broke it up in mid-ocean. My brave comrades were drowned every man of them, but I stuck to the keel and was carried hither and thither for the space of nine days, till at last, during the darkness of the tenth night, the gods brought me to the Ogygian island, where the great goddess Calypso lives. She took me in and treated me with the utmost kindness. Indeed, she wanted to make me immortal that I might never grow old but she could not persuade me to let her do so. I stayed with Calypso seven years straight on end, 
and watered the good clothes she gave me with my tears during the whole time. But at last, when the eighth year came round, she bade me depart of her own free will, either because Jove had told her she must, or because she had changed her mind. She sent me from her island on a raft, which she provisioned with abundance of bread and wine. Moreover, she gave me good stout clothing, and sent me a wind that blew both warm and fair. Day seven and ten did I sail over the sea, and on the eighteenth I caught sight of the first outlines of the mountains upon your coast. And glad indeed was I to set eyes upon them. Nevertheless, there was still much trouble in store for me, for at this point Neptune would let me go no further, and raised a great storm against me. The sea was so terribly high that I could no longer keep to my raft, which went to pieces under the fury of the gale, and I had to swim for it, till wind and current brought me to your shores. There I tried to land, but could not, for it was a bad place and the waves dashed me against the rocks, so I again took to the sea and swam on till I came to a river that seemed the most likely landing place, for there were no rocks and it was sheltered from the wind. Here then I got out of the water and gathered my senses together again. Night was coming on, so I left the river and went into a thicket, where I covered myself all over with leaves, and presently heaven sent me off into a very deep sleep. Sick and sorry as I was, I slept among the leaves all night, and through the next day till afternoon, when I woke as the sun was westering, and saw your daughter's maidservants playing upon the beach, and your daughter among them looking like a goddess. I besought her aid, and she proved to be of an excellent disposition, much more so than could be expected from so young a person, for young people are apt to be thoughtless. She gave me plenty of bread and wine, and when she had had me washed in the river she also gave me the clothes in which you see me. Now, therefore, though it has pained me to do so, I have told you the whole truth." Then Alcinous said, "'Stranger, it was very wrong of my daughter not to bring you on at once to my house along with the maids, seeing that she was the first person whose aid you asked.' "'Pray do not scold her,' replied Ulysses. She is not to blame. She did tell me to follow along with the maids, but I was ashamed and afraid, for I thought you might perhaps be displeased if you saw me. Every human being is sometimes a little suspicious and irritable." "'Stranger,' replied Alcinous, "'I am not the kind of man to get angry about nothing. It is always better to be reasonable. But by Father Jove, Minerva, and Apollo, now that I see what kind of person you are, and how much you think as I do, I wish you would stay here, marry my daughter, and become my son-in-law. If you will stay, I will give you a house and an estate, but no one, heaven forbid, shall keep you here against your own wish, and that you may be sure of this, I will attend to-morrow to the matter of your escort. You can sleep during the whole voyage if you like, and the men shall sail you over smooth waters, either to your own home or wherever you please, even though it be a long way further off than Euboea which those of my people who saw it when they took yellow-haired Rhadamanthus to see Titius the son of Gaia, tell me is the furthest of any place, and yet they did the whole voyage in a single day without distressing themselves, and came back again afterwards. You will thus see how much my ships excel all others, and what magnificent oarsmen my sailors are." Then was Ulysses glad and prayed aloud, saying, "'Father Jove, Grant that Alcinous may do all as he has said, for so he will win an imperishable name among mankind, and at the same time I shall return to my country." Thus did they converse. Then Arete told her maids to set a bed in the room that was in the gatehouse, and make it with good red rugs, and to spread coverlets on the top of them with woolen cloaks for Ulysses to wear. The maids thereon went out with torches in their hands and when they had made the bed they came up to Ulysses and said, "'Rise, sir stranger, and come with us, for your bed is ready,' and glad indeed was he to go to his rest. So Ulysses slept in a bed placed in a room over the echoing gateway. But Alcinous lay in the inner part of the house, with the queen his wife by his side. End of Book Seven Book Eight 
of the Odyssey by Homer, translated by Samuel Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Odyssey, Book Eight, Banquet in the House of Alcinous, the Games. Now, when the child of morning, rosy fingered dawn appeared, Alcinous and Ulysses both rose, and Alcinous led the way to the Phaeacian place of assembly, which was near the ships. When they got there, they sat down side by side on a seat of polished stone, while Minerva took the form of one of Alcinous' servants, and went round the town in order to help Ulysses to get home. She went up to the citizens, man by man, and said, Aldermen and town councillors of the Phaeacians, come to the assembly all of you and listen to the stranger, who has just come off a long voyage to the house of King Alcinous. He looks like an immortal god." With these words she made them all want to come, and they flocked to the assembly till seats and standing-room were alike crowded. Every one was struck with the appearance of Ulysses, for Minerva had beautified him about the head and shoulders, making him look taller and stouter than he really was, that he might impress the Phaeacians favorably as being a very remarkable man, and might come off well in the many trials of skill to which they would challenge him. Then when they were got together, Alcinous spoke. "'Hear me,' said he, "'aldermen and town councillors of the Phaeacians, that I may speak even as I am minded. This stranger, whoever he may be, has found his way to my house from somewhere or other east or west. He wants an escort and wishes to have the matter settled. Let us then get one ready for him, as we have done for others before him. Indeed, no one who ever yet came to my house has been able to complain of me for not speeding on his way soon enough. Let us draw a ship into the sea, one that has never yet made a voyage, and man her with two and fifty of our smartest young sailors. Then when you have made fast your oars each by his own seat, leave the ship and come to my house to prepare a feast. I will find you in everything. I am giving these instructions to the young men who will form the crew, for as regards you aldermen and town councillors, you will join me in entertaining our guest in the cloisters. I can take no excuses, and we will have Demodocus to sing to us, for there is no bard like him whatever he may choose to sing about." Alcinous then led the way, and the others followed after, while a servant went to fetch Demodocus. The fifty-two picked oarsmen went to the seashore as they had been told, and when they got there they drew the ship into the water, got her mast and sails inside her, bound the oars to the thole-pins with twisted thongs of leather, all in due course, and spread the white sails aloft. They moored the vessel a little way out from the land, and then came on shore and went to the house of King Alcinous. The outhouses, yards, and all the precincts were filled with crowds of men in great multitudes, both old and young. And Alcinous killed them a dozen sheep, eight full-grown pigs, and two oxen. These they skinned and dressed, so as to provide a magnificent banquet. A servant presently led in the famous bard Demodocus, whom the muse had dearly loved, but to whom she had given both good and evil, for though she had endowed him with a divine gift of song, she had robbed him of his eyesight. Pontinus set a seat for him among the guests, leaning it up against a bearing-post. He hung the lyre for him on a peg over his head, and showed him where he was to feel for it with his hands. He also set a fair table with a basket of victuals by his side, and a cup of wine from which he might drink whenever he was so disposed. The company then laid their hands upon the good things that were before them, but as soon as they had had enough to eat and drink, the muse inspired Demodocus to sing the feats of heroes, and more especially a matter that was then in the mouths of all men, to wit the quarrel between Ulysses and Achilles, and the fierce words that they heaped on one another as they sat together at a banquet. But Agamemnon was glad when he heard his chieftains quarreling with one another, for Apollo had foretold him this at Pytho, when he crossed the stone floor to consult the oracle. Here was the beginning of the evil that by the will of Jove fell both upon Danaeans and Trojans. Thus sang the bard, but Ulysses drew his purple mantle over his head and covered his face, for he was ashamed to let the Phaeacians see that he was weeping. When the bard left off singing, he wiped the tears from his eyes, uncovered his face, and, taking his cup, made a drink-offering to the gods. But when the Phaeacians pressed Demodocus to sing further, for they delighted in his lays, then Ulysses again drew his mantle over his head and wept bitterly. 
No one noticed his distress except Alcinous, who was sitting near him, and heard the heavy sighs that he was heaving. So he at once said, Aldermen and town councillors of the Phaeacians, we have had enough now, both of the feast and of the minstrelsy that is its due accompaniment. Let us proceed, therefore, to the athletic sports, so that our guest on his return home may be able to tell his friends how much we surpass all other nations as boxers, wrestlers, jumpers, and runners." With these words he led the way, and the others followed after. A servant hung Demonicus's lyre on its peg for him, led him out of the cloister, and set him on the same way as that along which all the chief men of the Phaeacians were going to see the sports. A crowd of several thousands of people followed them, and there were many excellent competitors for all the prizes. Acronios, Ochialus, Elatrius, Nautius, Primnius, Anchialus, Eretmius, Pontius, Prorius, Thoan, Anabasinius, and Amphilius, son of Polinius, son of Tecton. There was also Euryalus, son of Nobilus, who was like Mars himself, and was the best-looking man among the Phaeacians except Laodamus. Three sons of Alcinus, Laodamus, Helios, and Clytonius competed also. The foot-races came first. The course was set out for them from the starting-post, and they raised a dust upon the plain as they all flew forward at the same moment. Clytonius came in first by a long way. He left every one else behind him by the length of the furrow that a couple of mules can plough in a fallow field. They then turned to the painful art of wrestling, and here Euryalus proved to be the best man. Amphialus excelled all the others in jumping, while at throwing the disc there was no one who could approach Elatrius. Alcinous's son Laodamus was the best boxer, and he it was who presently said, when they had all been diverted with the games, let us ask the stranger whether he excels in any of these sports. He seems very powerfully built. His thighs, calves, hands, and neck are of prodigious strength, nor is he at all old. But he has suffered much lately, and there is nothing like the sea for making havoc with a man, no matter how strong he is." "'You are quite right, Laodamus,' replied Euryalus. "'Go up to your guest and speak to him about it yourself.' When Laodamus heard this, he made his way into the middle of the crowd, and said to Ulysses, "'I hope, sir, that you will enter yourself for some one or other of our competitions if you are skilled in any of them, and you must have gone in for many a one before now. There is nothing that does any one so much credit all his life long as the showing himself a proper man with his hands and feet. Have a try, therefore, at something, and banish all sorrow from your mind. Your return home will not be long delayed for the ship is already drawn into the water and the crew is found." Ulysses answered, "'Laodamus, why do you taunt me in this way? My mind is set rather on cares than contests. I have been through infinite trouble, and am come among you now as a suppliant, praying your king and people to further me on my return home.' Then Euryalus reviled him outright, and said, I gather, then, that you are unskilled in any of the many sports that men generally delight in. I suppose you are one of those grasping traders that go about in ships as captains or merchants, and who think of nothing but their own outward freights and homeward cargoes. There does not seem to be much of the athlete about you." "'For shame, sir,' answered Ulysses fiercely. "'You are an insolent fellow. So true is it that the gods do not grace all men alike in speech, person, and understanding. One man may be of weak presence, but heaven has adorned this with such good conversation that he charms every one who sees him. His honeyed moderation carries his hearers with him so that he is leader in all assemblies of his fellows, and wherever he goes he is looked up to. Another may be as handsome as a god, but his good looks are not crowned with discretion. This is your case. No god could make a finer-looking fellow than you are, but you are a fool. Your ill-judged remarks have made me exceedingly angry, and you are quite mistaken, for I excel in a great many athletic exercises. Indeed, so long as I had youth and strength, I was among the first athletes of the age. Now, however, I am worn out by labor and sorrow, for I have gone through much both on the field of battle and by the waves of the weary sea. Still, in spite of all this I will compete, for your taunts have stung me to the quick." So he hurried up without even taking his cloak off, and seized a disc, 
larger, more massive, and much heavier than those used by the Phaeacians when disthrowing among themselves. Then, swinging it back, he threw it from his brawny hand, and it made a humming sound in the air as he did so. The Phaeacians quailed beneath the rushing of its flight as it sped gracefully from his hand, and flew beyond any mark that had been made yet. Minerva, in the form of a man, came and marked the place where it had fallen. "'A blind man, sir,' said she, "'could easily tell your mark by groping for it. It is so far ahead of any other. You may make your mind easy about this contest, for no Phaeacian can come near to such a throw as yours.' Ulysses was glad when he found he had a friend among the lookers-on, so he began to speak more pleasantly. "'Young men,' said he, "'come up to that throw if you can, and I will throw another disc as heavy or even heavier. If anyone wants to have a bout with me, let him come on, for I am exceedingly angry. I will box, wrestle, or run, I do not care what it is, with any man of you, all except Laodamus, but not with him, because I am his guest and one cannot compete with one's own personal friend. At least, I do not think it a prudent or a sensible thing for a guest to challenge his host's family at any game, especially when he is in a foreign country. He will cut the ground from under his own feet if he does. But I make no exception as regards any one else, for I want the matter out and know which is the best man. I am a good hand at every kind of athletic sport known among mankind. I am an excellent archer. In battle I am always the first to bring a man down with my arrow, no matter how many more are taking aim at him alongside of me. Philoctetes was the only man who could shoot better than I could when we Achaeans were before Troy and in practice. I far excel everyone else in the whole world, of those who still eat bread upon the face of the earth, but I should not like to shoot against the mighty dead, such as Hercules or Eurytus the Oechalian, men who could shoot against the gods themselves. This, in fact, was how Eurytus came prematurely by his end, for Apollo was angry with him and killed him because he challenged him as an archer. I can throw a dart farther than anyone else can shoot an arrow. Running is the only point in respect of which I am afraid some of the Phaeacians might beat me, for I have been brought down very low at sea. My provisions ran short, and therefore I am still weak. They all held their peace except King Alcinous, who began, Sir, we have had much pleasure in hearing all that you have told us, for which I understand that you are willing to show your prowess, as having been displeased with some insolent remarks that have been made to you by one of our athletes, and which could never have been uttered by any one who knows how to talk with propriety. I hope you will apprehend my meaning, and will explain to any one of your chief men who may be dining with yourself and your family when you get home that we have an hereditary aptitude for accomplishments of all kinds. We are not particularly remarkable for our boxing, nor yet as wrestlers, but we are singularly fleet of foot and are excellent sailors. We are extremely fond of good dinners, music, and dancing. We also like frequent changes of linen, warm baths, and good beds. So now, please, some of you who are best dancers, set about dancing that our guest on his return home may be able to tell his friends how much we surpass all other nations as sailors, runners, dancers, and minstrels. Demodocus has left his lyre at my house, so run some one or other of you and fetch it for him." On this a servant hurried off to bring the lyre from the king's house, and the nine men who had been chosen as stewards stood forward. It was their business to manage everything connected with the sports, so they made the ground smooth and marked a wide space for the dancers. Presently the servant came back with Demodocus's lyre, and he took his place in the midst of them, whereon the best young dancers in the town began to foot and trip it so nimbly that Ulysses was delighted with the merry twinkling of their feet. Meanwhile the bard began to sing the loves of Mars and Venus, and how they first began their intrigue in the house of Vulcan. Mars made Venus many presents, and defiled King Vulcan's marriage bed. So the son, who saw what they were about, told Vulcan. Vulcan was very angry when he heard such dreadful news, so he went to his smithy brooding mischief, got his great anvil into its place, and began to forge some chains which none could either unloose or break, so that they might stay there in that place. When he had finished his snare he went into his bedroom and festooned the bedposts all over with chains like cobwebs. He also let many hang down from the great beam of the ceiling. 
Not even a god could see them, so fine and subtle were they. As soon as he had spread the chains all over the bed, he made as though he were setting out for the fair state of Lemnos, which of all places in the world was the one he was most fond of. But Mars kept no blind lookout, and as soon as he saw him start, hurried off to his house, burning with love for Venus. Now Venus was just come in from a visit to her father Jove, and was about sitting down when Mars came inside the house, and said, as he took her hand in his own, Let us go to the couch of Vulcan. He is not at home, but has gone off to Lemnos among the Sintians, whose speech is barbarous. She said nothing loth, so they went to the couch to take their rest, whereon they were caught in the toils which cunning Vulcan had spread for them, and could neither get up nor stir hand or foot, but found too late that they were in a trap. Then Vulcan came up to them, for he had turned back before reaching Lemnos, when his scout the sun told him what was going on. He was in a furious passion, and stood in the vestibule making a dreadful noise as he shouted to all the gods. "'Father Jove!' he cried, "'and all you other blessed gods who live for ever! Come here, and see the ridiculous and disgraceful sight that I will show you! Jove's daughter Venus is always dishonoring me because I am lame. She is in love with Mars, who is handsome and clean-built, whereas I am a cripple. But my parents are to blame for that, not I. They ought never to have forgotten me. Come and see the pair together asleep on my bed. It makes me furious to look at them. They are very fond of one another, but I do not think they will lie there longer than they can help, nor do I think that they will sleep much. There, however, they shall stay, till her father has repaid me the sum I gave him for his baggage of a daughter, who is fair but not honest." On this the gods gathered to the house of Vulcan. Earth and circling Neptune came, and Mercury, the bringer of luck, and King Apollo, but the goddesses stayed at home all of them for shame. Then the givers of all good things stood in the doorway, and the blessed gods roared with inextinguishable laughter as they saw how cunning Vulcan had been, whereon one would turn towards his neighbor, saying, "'Ill deeds do not prosper, and the weak confound the strong. See how limping Vulcan, lame as he is, has caught Mars who is the fleetest god in heaven. And now Mars will be cast in heavy damages.' Thus did they converse, but King Apollo said to Mercury, "'Messenger Mercury, giver of good things, you would not care how strong the chains were, would you, if you could sleep with Venus?" King Apollo answered Mercury, I only wish I might get the chance, though there were three times as many chains, and you might look on, all of you, gods and goddesses, but I would sleep with her if I could. The immortal gods burst out laughing as they heard him, but Neptune took it all seriously, and kept on imploring Vulcan to set Mars free again. Let him go, he cried and I will undertake, as you require, that he shall pay you all the damages that are held reasonable among the immortal gods." "'Do not,' replied Vulcan, "'ask me to do this. A bad man's bond is bad security. What remedy could I enforce against you if Mars should go away and leave his debts behind him along with his chains?' "'Vulcan,' said Neptune, "'if Mars goes away without paying his damages, I will pay you myself.' So Vulcan answered, in this case I cannot and must not refuse you." Thereon he loosed the bonds that bound them, and as soon as they were free they scampered off, Mars to Thrace and laughter-loving Venus to Cyprus and to Paphos, where is her grove and her altar fragrant with burnt offerings. Here the graces bathed her and anointed her with oil of ambrosia, such as the immortal gods make use of, and they clothed her in raiment of the most enchanting beauty. Thus sang the bard, and both Ulysses and the seafaring Phaeacians were charmed as they heard him. Then Alcinous told Laodamus and Helias to dance alone, for there was no one to compete with them. So they took a red ball which Polybus had made for them, and one of them bent himself backwards and threw it up towards the clouds, while the other jumped from off the ground and caught it with ease before it came down again. When they had done throwing the ball straight up into the air, they began to dance, and at the same time kept on throwing it backwards and forwards to one another, while all the young men in the ring applauded and made a great stamping with their feet. Then Ulysses said, King Alcinous, 
You said your people were the nimblest dancers in the world, and indeed they have proved themselves to be so. I was astonished as I saw them." The king was delighted at this, and exclaimed to the Phaeacians, "'Aldermen and town councillors, our guest seems to be a person of singular judgment. Let us give him such proof of our hospitality as he may reasonably expect. There are twelve chief men among you, and counting myself there are thirteen. Contribute each of you a clean cloak, a shirt, and a talent of fine gold. Let us give him all this in a lump down at once, so that when he gets his supper he may do so with a light heart. As for Euryalus, he will have to make a formal apology and a present too, for he has been rude." Thus did he speak. The others all of them applauded his saying, and sent their servants to fetch the presents. Then Euryalus said, King Alcinous, I will give the stranger all the satisfaction you require. He shall have my sword, which is of bronze, all but the hilt, which is of silver. I will also give him the scabbard of newly sawn ivory into which it fits. It will be worth a great deal to him." As he spoke he placed the sword in the hands of Ulysses, and said, "'Good luck to you, father stranger. If anything has been said amiss may the winds blow it away with them, and may heaven grant you a safe return, for I understand you have been long away from home, and have gone through much hardship.' To which Ulysses answered, "'Good luck to you, too, my friend, and may the gods grant you every happiness. I hope you will not miss the sword you have given me along with your apology." With these words he girded the sword about his shoulders, and towards sundown the presents began to make their appearance, as the servants of the donors kept bringing them to the house of King Alcinous. Here his sons received them, and placed them under their mother's charge. Then Alcinous led the way to the house and bade his guests take their seats. "'Wife,' said he, turning to Queen Arete, "'go, fetch the best chest we have, and put a clean cloak and shirt in it. Also, set a copper on the fire and heat some water. Our guest will take a warm bath. See also to the careful packing of the presents that the noble Phaeacians have made him. He will thus better enjoy both his supper and the singing that will follow. I shall myself give him this golden goblet, which is of exquisite workmanship, that he may be reminded of me for the rest of his life whenever he makes a drink-offering to Jove or to any of the gods." Then Aridi told her maids to set a large tripod upon the fire as fast as they could. Whereon they set a tripod full of bath-water on to a clear fire. They threw on sticks to make it blaze, and the water became hot as the flame played about the belly of the tripod. Meanwhile Aridi brought a magnificent chest from her own room, and inside it she packed all the beautiful presents of gold and raiment which the Phaeacians had brought. Lastly she added a cloak and a good shirt from Alcinous, and said to Ulysses, "'See to the lid yourself, and have the whole bound round at once, for fear any one should rob you by the way when you are asleep in your ship.' When Ulysses heard this, he put the lid on the chest and made it fast with the bond that Circe had taught him. He had done so before an upper servant told him to come to the bath and wash himself. He was very glad of a warm bath, for he had had no one to wait upon him ever since he left the house of Calypso, who as long as he remained with her had taken as good care of him as though he had been a god. When the servants had done washing and anointing him with oil, and had given him a clean cloak and shirt, he left the bathroom and joined the guests who were sitting over their wine. Lovely Nausicaa stood by one of the bearing-posts supporting the roof of the cloister, and admired him as she saw him pass. "'Farewell, stranger,' said she. Do not forget me when you are safe at home again, for it is to me first that you owe a ransom for having saved your life." And Ulysses said, Nausicaa, daughter of great Alcinous, may Jove the mighty husband of Juno grant that I may reach my home. So shall I bless you as my guardian angel all my days, for it was you who saved me." When he had said this, he seated himself beside Alcinous. Supper was then served, and the wine was mixed for drinking. A servant led in the favorite bard Demodocus, and set him in the midst of the company, near one of the bearing-posts, supporting the cloister, that he might lean against it. Then Ulysses cut off a piece of roast pork with plenty of fat, for there was abundance left on the joint, and said to a servant, 
take this piece of pork over to Demodocus and tell him to eat it. For all the pain his legs may cause me, I will salute him none the less. Bars are honored and respected throughout the world, for the muse teaches them their songs and loves them." The servant carried the pork in his fingers over to Demodocus, who took it and was very much pleased. They then laid their hands on the good things that were before them, and as soon as they had had to eat and drink, Ulysses said to Demodocus, Demodocus, there is no one in the world whom I admire more than I do you. You must have studied under the muse, Jove's daughter, and under Apollo, so accurately do you sing the return of the Achaeans with all their sufferings and adventures. If you were not there yourself, you must have heard it all from someone who was. Now, however, change your song and tell us of the wooden horse which Epius made with the assistance of Minerva, and which Ulysses got by stratagem into the fort of Troy, after freighting it with the men, who afterwards sacked the city. If you will sing this tale aright, I will tell all the world how magnificently heaven has endowed you." The bard inspired of heaven took up the story at the point where some of the Argives set fire to their tents and sailed away, while others, hidden within the horse, were waiting with Ulysses in the Trojan place of assembly. For the Trojans themselves had drawn the horse into their fortress, and it stood there while they sat in council round it, and were in three minds as to what they should do. Some were for breaking it up then and there, others would have dragged it to the top of the rock on which the fortress stood, and then thrown it down the precipice, while yet others were for letting it remain as an offering and propitiation for the gods. And this was how they settled it in the end, for the city was doomed when it took in that horse, within which were all the bravest of the Argives waiting to bring death and destruction on the Trojans. Anon he sang how the sons of the Achaeans issued from the horse and sacked the town, breaking out from their ambuscade. He sang how they overran the city hither and thither, and ravaged it, and how Ulysses went raging like Mars along with Menelaus to the house of Deiphobus. It was there that the fight raged most furiously, nevertheless by Minerva's help he was victorious. All this he told, but Ulysses was overcome as he heard him, and his cheeks were wet with tears. He wept as a woman weeps when she throws herself on the body of her husband, who has fallen before his own city and people, fighting bravely in defense of his home and children. She screams aloud and flings her arms about him as he lies gasping for breath and dying, but her enemies beat her from behind about the back and shoulders, and carry her off into slavery, to a life of labor and sorrow, and the beauty fades from her cheeks. Even so piteously did Ulysses weep, but none of those present perceived his tears except Alcinous, who was sitting near him, and could hear the sobs and sighs that he was heaving. The king therefore at once rose and said, Aldermen and town councillors of the Phaeacians, let Demodocus cease his song, for there are those present who do not seem to like it. From the moment that we had done supper and Demodocus began to sing, our guest has been all the time groaning and lamenting. He is evidently in great trouble, so let the bard leave off, that we may enjoy ourselves, hosts and guests alike. This will be much more as it should be, for all these festivities, with the escort and the presents that we are making with so much good will, are wholly in his honor, and any one with even a moderate amount of right feeling knows that he ought to treat a guest and a suppliant as though he were his own brother. Therefore, sir, do you on your part affect no more concealment nor reserve in the matter about which I shall ask you. It will be more polite in you to give me a plain answer. Tell me the name by which your father and mother over yonder used to call you, and by which you were known among your neighbors and fellow citizens. There is no one, neither rich nor poor, who is absolutely without any name whatever, for people's fathers and mothers give them names as soon as they are born. Tell me also your country, nation, and city, that our ships may shape their purpose accordingly and take you there. For the Phaeacians have no pilots. Their vessels have no rudders, as those of other nations have but the ships themselves understand what it is that we are thinking about and want. They know all the cities and countries in the whole world, and can traverse the sea just as well even when it is covered with mist and cloud, so that there is no danger of being wrecked or coming to any harm. Still I do remember hearing my father say that Neptune was angry with us for being too easy-going in the matter of giving people escorts. 
he said that one of these days he should wreck a ship of ours as it was returning from having escorted someone, and bury our city under a high mountain. This is what my father used to say, but whether the god will carry out his threat or no is a matter which he will decide for himself. And now, tell me and tell me true. Where have you been wandering, and in what countries have you travelled? Tell us of the peoples themselves and of their cities, who were hostile, savage and uncivilized, and who, on the other hand, hospitable and humane. Tell us also why you are made so unhappy on hearing about the return of the Argive Danaeans from Troy. The gods arranged all this and sent them their misfortunes in order that future generations might have something to sing about. Did you lose some brave kinsman of your wife's when you were before Troy, a son-in-law or father-in-law, which are the nearest relations a man has outside his own flesh and blood? Or was it some brave and kindly-natured comrade, for a good friend is as dear to a man as his own brother? End of Book Eight Book Nine of The Odyssey by Homer Translated by Samuel Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Odyssey, Book Nine. Ulysses declares himself and begins his story. The Cycons, Lodophagi, and Cyclopes. And Ulysses answered, King Alcinous, it is a good thing to hear a bard with such a divine voice as this man has. There is nothing better or more delightful than when a whole people make merry together, with the guests sitting orderly to listen, while the table is loaded with bread and meats, and the cup-bearer draws wine and fills his cup for every man. This is, indeed, as fair a sight as a man can see. Now, however, since you are inclined to ask the story of my sorrows, and rekindle my own sad memories in respect of them, I do not know how to begin nor yet how to continue and conclude my tale, for the hand of heaven has been laid heavily upon me. Firstly, then, I will tell you my name, that you too may know it, and one day, if I outlive this time of sorrow, may become my guests, though I live so far away from all of you. I am Ulysses, son of Laertes, renowned among mankind for all manner of subtlety, so that my fame ascends to heaven. I live in Ithaca, where there is a high mountain called Neritum, covered with forests. And not far from it there is a group of islands very near to one another, Dulichium, Sami, and the wooded island of Zacynthus. It lies squat on the horizon, all highest up in the sea towards the sunset, while the others lie away from it towards dawn. It is a rugged island, but it breeds brave men, and my eyes know none that they better love to look upon. The goddess Calypso kept me with her in her cave, and wanted me to marry her, as did also the cunning Aeon goddess Circe, but they could neither of them persuade me, for there is nothing dearer to a man than his own country and his parents, and however splendid a home he may have in a foreign country, if it be far from father or mother, he does not care about it. Now, however, I will tell you of the many hazardous adventures which, by Jove's will, I met with on my return from Troy. When I had set sail thence, the wind took me first to Ismarus, which is the city of the Sycans. There I sacked the town and put the people to the sword. We took their wives and also much booty, which we divided equitably amongst us, so that none might have reason to complain. I then said that we had better make off at once, but my men very foolishly would not obey me so they stayed there drinking much wine and killing great numbers of sheep and oxen on the seashore. Meanwhile the Sycans cried out for help to other Sycans who lived inland. These were more in number, and stronger, and they were more skilled in the art of war, for they could fight, either from chariots or on foot, as the occasion served. In the morning, therefore, they came as thick as leaves and bloom in summer, and the hand of heaven was against us, so that we were hard pressed. They set the battle in array near the ships, and the hosts aimed their bronze-shod spears at one another. So long as the day waxed it was still morning. We held our own against them, though they were more in number than we. But as the sun went down, towards the time when men lose their oxen, the Sycans got the better of us, 
and we lost half a dozen men from every ship we had, so we got away with those that were left. Thence we sailed onward with sorrow in our hearts, but glad to have escaped death though we had lost our comrades, nor did we leave till we had thrice invoked each one of the poor fellows who had perished by the hands of the Sycans. Then Jove raised the north wind against us till it blew a hurricane, so that land and sky were hidden in thick clouds, and night sprang forth out of the heavens. We let the ships run before the gale, but the force of the wind tore our sails to tatters, so we took them down for fear of shipwreck, and rowed our hardest towards the land. There we lay two days and two nights, suffering much alike from toil and distress of mind. But on the morning of the third day we again raised our masts, set sail, and took our places, letting the wind and steersman direct our ship. I should have got home at that time unharmed, had not the north wind and the currents been against me as I was doubling Cape Malia, and set me off my course hard by the island of Cythera. I was driven thence by foul winds for a space of nine days upon the sea, but on the tenth day we reached the land of the lotus-eaters, who live on a food that comes from a kind of flower. Here we landed to take in fresh water, and our crews got their midday meal on the shore near the ships. When they had eaten and drunk, I sent two of my company to see what manner of men the people of the place might be, and they had a third man under them. They started at once and went about among the lotus-eaters, who did them no hurt, but gave them to eat of the lotus, which was so delicious that those who ate of it left off caring about home, and did not even want to go back and say what had happened to them, but were for staying and munching lotus with the lotus-eaters without thinking further of their return. Nevertheless, though they wept bitterly, I forced them back to the ships, and made them fast under the benches. Then I told the rest to go on board at once, lest any of them should taste of the lotus and leave off wanting to get home, so they took their places and smote the grey sea with their oars. We sailed hence, always in much distress, till we came to the land of the lawless and inhuman Cyclopes. Now the Cyclopes neither plant nor plough, but trust in Providence, and live on such wheat, barley, and grapes as grow wild without any kind of tillage and their wild grapes yield them wine as the sun and the rain may grow them. They have no laws nor assemblies of the people, but live in caves on the tops of high mountains. Each is lord and master in his family, and they take no account of their neighbors. Now off their harbor there lies a wooded and fertile island not quite close to the land of the Cyclopes, but still not far. It is overrun with wild goats, that breed there in great numbers and are never disturbed by foot of man. For sportsmen, who as a rule will suffer so much hardship in forest or among mountain precipices, do not go there, nor yet again is it ever ploughed or fed down, but it lies a wilderness untilled and unsown from year to year, and has no living thing upon it but only goats. For the Cyclopes have no ships, nor yet shipwrights who could make ships for them. They cannot therefore go from city to city, or sail over the sea to one another's country as people who have ships can do. If they had had these, they would have colonized the island, for it is a very good one, and would yield everything in due season. There are meadows that in some places come right down to the seashore, well watered and full of luscious grass. Grapes would do there excellently. There is level land for ploughing, and it would always yield heavily at harvest time for the soil is deep. There is a good harbour where no cables are wanted, nor yet anchors, nor need a ship be moored, but all one has to do is beach one's vessel and stay there till the wind becomes fair for putting out to sea again. At the head of the harbour there is a spring of clear water coming out of a cave, and there are poplars growing all round it. Here we entered, but so dark was the night that some god must have brought us in, for there was nothing whatever to be seen. A thick mist hung all round our ships. The moon was hidden behind a mass of clouds so that no one could have seen the island if he had looked for it, nor were there any breakers to tell us we were close in shore before we found ourselves upon the land itself. When, however, we had beached the ships, we took down the sails, went ashore and camped upon the beach till daybreak. When the child of morning, rosy-fingered dawn appeared, 
we admired the island and wandered all over it, while the nymphs, Jove's daughters, roused the wild goats that we might get some meat for our dinner. On this we fetched our spears and bows and arrows from the ships, and dividing ourselves into three bands began to shoot the goats. Heaven sent us excellent sport. I had twelve ships with me, and each ship got nine goats, while my own ship had ten. Thus through the livelong day to the going down of the sun we ate and drank our fill, and we had plenty of wine left, for each one of us had taken many jars full when we sacked the city of the Sycans, and this had not yet run out. While we were feasting we kept turning our eyes towards the island of the Cyclopes, which was hard by, and saw the smoke of their stubble fires. We could almost fancy we heard their voices and the bleeding of their sheep and goats. But when the sun went down and it came on dark, we camped down upon the beach, and next morning I called a council. "'Stay here, my brave fellows,' said I, "'all the rest of you, while I go with my ship and exploit these people myself. I want to see if they are uncivilized savages or a hospitable and humane race.' I went on board, bidding my men to do so also, and loose the hawsers so they took their places and smote the grey sea with their oars. When we got to the land, which was not far, there on the face of a cliff near the sea we saw a great cave overhung with laurels. It was a station for a great many sheep and goats, and outside there was a large yard, with a high wall round it made of stones built into the ground and of trees both pine and oak. This was the abode of a huge monster who was then away from home shepherding his flocks. He would have nothing to do with other people, but led the life of an outlaw. He was a horrid creature, not like a human being at all, but resembling rather some crag that stands out boldly against the sky on the top of a high mountain. I told my men to draw the ship ashore and stay where they were, all but the twelve best among them, who were to go along with myself. I also took a goatskin of sweet black wine, which had been given me by Maron, son of Euanthes who was priest of Apollo the patron god of Ismarus, and lived within the wooded precincts of the temple. When we were sacking the city we respected him and spared his life, as also his wife and child. So he made me some presents of great value, seven talents of fine gold and a bowl of silver, with twelve jars of sweet wine, unblended, and of the most exquisite flavor. Not a man nor maid in the house knew about it, but only himself, his wife, and one housekeeper. When he drank it he mixed twenty parts of water to one of wine, and yet the fragrance from the mixing-bowl was so exquisite that it was impossible to refrain from drinking. I filled a large skin with this wine and took a wallet full of provisions with me, for my mind misgave me that I might have to deal with some savage who would be of great strength and would respect neither right nor law. We soon reached his cave but he was out shepherding, so we went inside and took stock of all that we could see. His cheese-racks were loaded with cheeses, and he had more lambs and kids than his pens could hold. They were kept in separate flocks. First there were the hoggets, then the oldest of the younger lambs, and lastly the very young ones, all kept apart from one another. As for his dairy, all the vessels, bowls, and milk-pails into which he milked were swimming with whey. When they saw all this, my men begged me to let them first steal some cheeses and make off with them to the ship. They would then return, drive down the lambs and kids, put them on board and sail away with them. It would have been indeed better if we had done so, but I would not listen to them, for I wanted to see the owner himself, in the hope that he might give me a present. When, however, we saw him, my poor men found him ill to deal with. We lit a fire, offered some of the cheeses in sacrifice, ate others of them, and then sat waiting till the cyclops should come in with his sheep. When he came he brought in with him a huge load of dry firewood to light the fire for his supper, and this he flung with such noise on to the floor of his cave that we hid ourselves for fear at the far end of the cavern. Meanwhile he drove all the ewes inside, as well as the she-goats that he was going to milk, leaving the males, both rams and he-goats, outside in the yards. Then he rolled a huge stone to the mouth of the cave, so huge that two and twenty strong four-wheeled wagons would not be enough to draw it from its place against the doorway. 
When he had so done, he sat down and milked his ewes and goats, all in due course, and then let each of them have their own young. He curdled half the milk and set it aside in wicker strainers, but the other half he poured into bowls that he might drink it for his supper. When he had got through with all his work, he lit the fire and then caught sight of us, whereon he said, "'Strangers, who are you? Where do you sail from? Are you traders, or do you sail the sea as rovers, with your hands against every man and every man's hand against you?' We were frightened out of our senses by his loud voice and monstrous form, but I managed to say, we are Achaeans on our way home from Troy, but by the will of Jove and stress of weather we have been driven far out of our course. We are the people of Agamemnon, son of Atreus, who has won infinite renown throughout the whole world by sacking so great a city and killing so many people. We therefore humbly pray you to show us some hospitality, and otherwise make us such presents as visitors may reasonably expect. May your excellency fear the wrath of heaven, for we are your suppliants, and Jove takes all respectable travellers under his protection, for he is the avenger of all suppliants and foreigners in distress." To this he gave me but a pitiless answer. Stranger, said he, you are a fool, or else you know nothing of this country. Talk to me, indeed, about fearing the gods or shunning their anger. We Cyclopes do not care about Jove or any of your blessed gods, for we are ever so much stronger than they. I shall not spare either yourself or your companions out of any regard for Jove, unless I am in the humour for doing so. And now tell me where you made your ship fast when you came on shore. Was it round the point, or is she lying straight off the land?" He said this to draw me out, but I was too cunning to be caught in that way, so I answered with a lie. Neptune, said I, set my ship on to the rocks at the far end of your country and wrecked it. We were driven on to them from the open sea, but I and those who are with me escaped the jaws of death." The cruel wretch vouchsafed me not one word of answer, but with a sudden clutch he gripped up two of my men at once and dashed them down upon the ground as though they had been puppies. Their brains were shed upon the ground, and the earth was wet with their blood. Then he tore them limb from limb and supped upon them. He gobbled them up like a lion in the wilderness flesh, bones, marrow, and entrails, without leaving anything uneaten. As for us, we wept and lifted up our hands to heaven on seeing such a horrid sight, for we did not know what else to do. But when the Cyclops had filled his huge paunch, and had washed down his meal of human flesh with a drink of neat milk, he stretched himself full length upon the ground among his sheep, and went to sleep. I was at first inclined to seize my sword, draw it, and drive it into his vitals, but I reflected that if I did we should all certainly be lost, for we should never be able to shift the stone which the monster had put in front of the door. So we stayed, sobbing and sighing where we were, till morning came. When the child of morning, rosy-fingered dawn, appeared, he again lit his fire, milked his goats and ewes, all quite rightly, and then let each have her own young one. As soon as he had got through with all his work, he clutched up two more of my men and began eating them for his morning's meal. Presently, with the utmost ease, he rolled the stone away from the door and drove out his sheep, but he at once put it back again, as easily as though he were merely clapping the lid onto a quiver full of arrows. As soon as he had done so he shouted and cried, shoo, shoo, after his sheep to drive them on to the mountain, so I was left to scheme some way of taking my revenge and covering myself with glory. In the end I deemed it would be the best plan to do as follows. The Cyclops had a great club which was lying near one of the sheep pens. It was of green olive wood, and he had cut it intending to use it for a staff as soon as it should be dry. It was so huge that we could only compare it to the mast of a twenty-oared merchant vessel of large burden, and able to venture out into open sea. I went up to this club and cut off about six feet of it. I then gave this piece to the men and told them to find it evenly off at one end, which they proceeded to do, and lastly I brought it to a point myself, charring the end in the fire to make it harder. When I had done this I hid it under dung, which was lying about all over the cave, 
and told the men to cast lots which of them should venture along with myself to lift it and bore it into the monster's eye while he was asleep. The lot fell upon the very four whom I should have chosen, and I myself made five. In the evening the wretch came back from shepherding, and drove his flocks into the cave, this time driving them all inside and not leaving any in the yards. I suppose some fancy must have taken him, or a god must have prompted him to do so. As soon as he had put the stone back to its place against the door, he sat down, milked his ewes and his goats all quite rightly, and then let each have their own young one. When he had got through with all his work, he gripped up two more of my men and made his supper off them. So I went up to him with an ivy-wood bowl of black wine in my hands. "'Look here, Cyclops,' said I, "'you have been eating a great deal of man's flesh. So take this and drink some wine, that you may see what kind of liquor we had on board my ship. I was bringing it to you as a drink-offering, in the hope that you would take compassion upon me and further me on my way home, whereas all you do is to go on ramping and raving most intolerably. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. How can you expect people to come to see you any more if you treat them in this way?" He then took the cup and drank. He was so delighted with the taste of the wine that he begged me for another bowlful. "'Be so kind,' he said, "'as to give me some more, and tell me your name at once. I want to make you a present that you will be glad to have. We have wine even in this country, for our soil grows grapes and the sun ripens them but this drinks like nectar and ambrosia all in one." I then gave him some more. Three times did I fill the bowl for him, and three times did he drain it without thought or heed. Then, when I saw that the wine had got into his head, I said to him as plausibly as I could, "'Cyclops, you ask my name and I will tell you. Give me, therefore, the present you promised me. My name is Noman. This is what my father and mother and my friends have always called me. But the cruel wretch said, Then I will eat all no man's comrades before no man himself, and will keep no man for the last. This is the present that I will make him. As he spoke he reeled, and fell sprawling face upwards on the ground. His great neck hung heavily backwards, and a deep sleep took hold upon him. Presently he turned sick, and threw up both wine and the gobbets of human flesh on which he had been gorging, for he was very drunk. Then I thrust the beam of wood far into the embers to heat it, and encouraged my men lest any of them should turn faint-hearted. When the wood, green though it was, was about to blaze, I drew it out of the fire glowing with heat, and my men gathered round me, for heaven had filled their hearts with courage. We drove the sharp end of the beam into the monster's eye, and bearing upon it with all my weight, I kept turning it round and round, as though I were boring a hole in a ship's plank with an auger, which two men with a wheel and strap can keep on turning as long as they choose. Even thus did we bore the red-hot beam into his eye, till the boiling blood bubbled all over it as we worked it round and round, so that the steam from the burning eyeball scalded his eyelids and eyebrows, and the roots of the eye sputtered in the fire. As a blacksmith plunges an axe or hatchet into cold water to temper it, for it is this that gives strength to the iron, and it makes a great hiss as he does so, even thus did the cyclops' eye hiss round the beam of olive wood, and his hideous yells made the cave ring again. We ran away in a fright, but he plucked the beam all besmirched with gore from his eye and hurled it from him in a frenzy of rage and pain, shouting as he did so to the other cyclopes who lived on the bleak headlands near him. So they gathered from all quarters round his cave when they heard him crying, and asked what was the matter with him. "'What ails you, Polyphemus?' said they, "'that you make such a noise, breaking the stillness of the night and preventing us from being able to sleep. Surely no man is carrying off your sheep. Surely no man is trying to kill you either by fraud or by force.' But Polyphemus shouted to them from inside the cave, "'No man is killing me by fraud.' no man is killing me by force. Then said they, If no man is attacking you, you must be ill. When Jove makes people ill, there is no help for it, and you had better pray to your father Neptune. Then they went away, and I laughed inwardly at the success of my clever stratagem. 
but the Cyclops, groaning and in an agony of pain, felt about with his hands till he found the stone and took it from the door. Then he sat in the doorway and stretched his hands in front of it to catch anyone going out with the sheep, for he thought I might be foolish enough to attempt this. As for myself, I kept on puzzling to think how I could best save my own life and those of my companions. I schemed and schemed as one who knows that his life depends upon it, for the danger was very great. In the end I deemed that this plan would be the best. The male sheep were well grown, and carried a heavy black fleece, so I bound them noiselessly in threes together, with some of the withies on which the wicked monster used to sleep. There was to be a man under the middle sheep, and the two on either side were to cover him, so that there were three sheep to each man. As for myself, there was a ram finer than any of the others. So I caught hold of him by the back, ensconced myself in the thick wool under his belly, and hung on patiently to his fleece, face upwards, keeping a firm hold on it all the time. Thus, then, did we wait in great fear of mind till morning came. But when the child of morning, rosy-fingered dawn, appeared, the male sheep hurried out to feed, while the ewes remained bleeding about the pens waiting to be milked, for their udders were full to bursting. But their master, in spite of all his pain, felt the backs of all the sheep as they stood upright, without being sharp enough to find out that the men were underneath their bellies. As the ram was going out last of all, heavy with its fleece and with the weight of my crafty self, Polyphemus laid hold of it and said, My good ram, what is it that makes you the last to leave my cave this morning? You are not wont to let the ewes go before you, but lead the mob with a run whether to flowery meat or bubbling fountain, and are the first to come home again at night. But now you lag last of all. Is it because you know your master has lost his eye, and are sorry because that wicked no man and his horrid crew has got him down in his drink and blinded him? but I will have his life yet. If you could understand and talk, you would tell me where the wretch is hiding, and I would dash his brains upon the ground till they flew all over the cave. I should thus have some satisfaction for the harm this no-good no-man has done me." As he spoke, he drove the ram outside, but when we were a little way out from the cave and yards, I first got from under the ram's belly and then freed my comrades. As for the sheep, which were very fat, by constantly heading them in the right direction, we managed to drive them down to the ship. The crew rejoiced greatly at seeing those of us who had escaped death, but wept for the others whom the Cyclops had killed. However, I made signs to them by nodding and frowning that they were to hush their crying and told them to get all the sheep on board at once and put out to sea. So they went aboard, took their places, and smote the grey sea with their oars. Then, when I had got as far out as my voice would reach, I began to jeer at the Cyclops. "'Cyclops,' said I, "'you should have taken better measure of your man before eating up his comrades in your cave. You wretch, eat up your visitors in your own house. You might have known that your sin would find you out, and now Jove and the other gods have punished you.' He got more and more furious as he heard me so he tore the top from off a high mountain and flung it just in front of my ship, so that it was within a little of hitting the end of the rudder. The sea quaked as the rock fell into it, and the wash of the wave it raised carried us back towards the mainland and forced us toward the shore. But I snatched up a long pole and kept the ship off, making signs to my men by nodding my head that they must row for their lives, whereon they laid out with a will. When we had got twice as far as we were before, I was for jeering at the Cyclops again, but the men begged and prayed of me to hold my tongue. Do not, they exclaimed, be mad enough to provoke this savage creature further. He has thrown one rock at us already which drove us back again to the mainland, and we made sure it had been the death of us. If he had then heard any further sound of voices, he would have pounded our heads and our ship's timbers into a jelly with the rugged rocks he would have heaved at us, for he can throw them a long way. But I would not listen to them, and shouted out to him in my rage, Cyclops, if any one asks you who it was that put your eye out and spoiled your beauty, say it was the valiant warrior Ulysses, son of Laertes, who lives in Ithaca. On this he groaned and cried out, Alas, alas! then the old prophecy about me is coming true. 
There was a prophet here at one time, a man both brave and of great stature, Telemus, son of Eurymus, who was an excellent seer and did all the prophesying for the Cyclopes till he grew old. He told me that all this would happen to me some day, and said I should lose my sight by the hand of Ulysses. I have been all along expecting some one of imposing presence and superhuman strength, whereas he turns out to be a little insignificant weakling, who has managed to blind my eye by taking advantage of me in my drink. Come here, then, Ulysses, that I may make you presents to show my hospitality, and urge Neptune to help you forward on your journey, for Neptune and I are father and son. He, if he so will, shall heal me, which no one else, neither God nor man, can do. Then I said, I wish I could be as sure of killing you outright and sending you down to the house of Hades, as I am that it will take more than Neptune to cure that eye of yours. On this he lifted up his hands to the firmament of heaven and prayed, saying, Hear me, great Neptune, if I am indeed your own true begotten son, grant that Ulysses may never reach his home alive. Or, if he must get back to his friends at last, let him do so late and in sore plight after losing all his men, let him reach his home in another man's ship and find trouble in his house. Thus did he pray, and Neptune heard his prayer. Then he picked up a rock much larger than the first, swung it aloft and hurled it with prodigious force. It fell just short of the ship, but was within a little of hitting the end of the rudder. The sea quaked as the rock fell into it, and the wash of the wave it raised drove us onwards on our way towards the shore of the island. When, at last, we got to the island where we had left the rest of our ships, we found our comrades lamenting us and anxiously awaiting our return. We ran our vessel upon the sands and got out of her onto the seashore. We also landed the Cyclops' sheep and divided them equitably amongst us so that none might have reason to complain. As for the ram, my companions agreed that I should have it as an extra share. So I sacrificed it on the seashore and burned its thigh-bones to Jove, who is the lord of all. But he heeded not my sacrifice, and only thought how he might destroy both my ships and my comrades. Thus through the livelong day to the going down of the sun we feasted our fill on meat and drink, but when the sun went down and it came on dark we camped upon the beach. When the child of morning, rosy-fingered dawn, appeared, I bade my men on board and loose the hawsers. Then they took their places and smote the grey sea with their oars. So we sailed on with a sorrow in our hearts, but glad to have escaped death, though we had lost our comrades. End of Book Nine Book Ten of The Odyssey by Homer Translated by Samuel Butler this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Odyssey, Book Ten, Aeolus, the Lestrigonese, Circe. Thence we went on to the Aeolian island, where lives Aeolus, son of Hippotus, dear to the immortal gods. It is an island that floats, as it were, upon the sea, iron bound with a wall that girds it. Now Aeolus has six daughters and six lusty sons, so he made the sons marry the daughters and they all live with their dear father and mother, feasting and enjoying every conceivable kind of luxury. All day long the atmosphere of the house is loaded with the savor of roasting meats till it groans again, yard and all. But by night they sleep on their well-made bedsteads, each with his own wife between the blankets. These were the people among whom we had now come. Aeolus entertained me for a whole month asking me questions all the time about Troy, the Argive fleet, and the return of the Achaeans. I told him exactly how everything had happened, and when I said I must go, and asked him to further me on my way, he made no sort of difficulty, but set about doing so at once. Moreover, he flayed me a prime ox-hide to hold the ways of the roaring winds, which he shut up in the hide as in a sack, for Jove had made him captain over the winds, and he could stir or still each one of them according to his own pleasure. He put the sack in the ship and bound the mouth so tightly with a silver thread that not even a breath of a side-wind could blow from any quarter. 
the west wind which was fair for us did he alone let blow as it chose. But it all came to nothing, for we were lost through our own folly. Nine days and nine nights did we sail, and on the tenth day our native land showed on the horizon. We got so close in that we could see the stubble fires burning, and I, being then dead beat, fell into a light sleep, for I had never let the rudder out of my hands, that we might get home the faster. On this the men fell to talking among themselves, and said I was bringing back gold and silver in the sack that Aeolus had given me. Bless my heart, would one turn to his neighbor, saying, How this man gets honored and makes friends to whatever city or country he may go! See what fine prizes he has taken home from Troy, while we, who have traveled just as far as he has, come back with hands as empty as we set out with. And now Aeolus has given him ever so much more. Quick, let us see what it all is, and how much gold and silver there is in the sack he gave him." Thus they talked and evil counsels prevailed. They loosed the sack, whereupon the wind flew howling forth, and raised a storm that carried us weeping out to sea and away from our own country. Then I awoke, and knew not whether to throw myself into the sea, or to live on and make the best of it. But I bore it, covered myself up, and lay down in the ship while the men lamented bitterly as the fierce winds bore our fleet back to the Aeolian island. When we reached it, we went ashore to take in water, and dined hard by the ships. Immediately after dinner I took a herald and one of my men and went straight to the house of Aeolus, where I found him feasting with his wife and family. So we sat down as suppliants on the threshold. They were astounded when they saw us and said, Ulysses, what brings you here? What god has been ill-treating you? We took great pains to further you on your way home to Ithaca, or wherever it was that you wanted to go." Thus did they speak, but I answered sorrowfully, My men have undone me, they and cruel sleep have ruined me. My friends, mend me this mischief, for you can if you will. I spoke as movingly as I could, but they said nothing, till their father answered, Vilest of mankind, get you gone at once out of the island. Him whom heaven hates will I no wise help. Be off, for you come here as one aboard of heaven." And with these words he sent me sorrowing from his door. Thence we sailed sadly on till the men were worn out with long and fruitless rowing, for there was no longer any wind to help them. Six days, night and day, did we toil, and on the seventh day we reached the rocky stronghold of Lamus, Telipolis, the city of the Lestragonians where the shepherd who is driving in his sheep and goats to be milked salutes him who is driving out his flock to feed, and this last answered the salute. In that country a man who could do without sleep might earn double wages, one as a herdsman of cattle, and another as a shepherd, for they work much the same by night as they do by day. When we reached the harbor we found it landlocked under steep cliffs, with a narrow entrance between two headlands. My captains took all their ships inside, and made them fast close to one another, for there was never so much as a breath of wind inside, but it was always dead calm. I kept my own ship outside, and moored it to a rock at the very end of the point. Then I climbed a high rock to reconnoiter, but could see no sign neither of man nor cattle, only some smoke rising from the ground. So I sent two of my company with an attendant to find out what sort of people the inhabitants were. The men, when they got on shore, followed a level road by which the people draw their firewood from the mountains into the town, till presently they met a young woman who had come outside to fetch water, and who was daughter to a Lestragonian named Antiphates. She was going to the fountain Artatia from which the people bring in their water, and when my men had come close up to her, they asked her who the king of that country might be, and over what kind of people he ruled. So she directed them to her father's house but when they got there they found his wife to be a giantess as huge as a mountain, and they were horrified at the sight of her. She at once called her husband Antiphates from the place of assembly, and forthwith he set about killing my men. He snatched up one of them and began to make his dinner off him then and there, whereon the other two ran back to the ships as fast as ever they could. But Antiphates raised a hue and cry after them, and thousands of sturdy Lestragonians sprang up from every quarter ogres, not men. 
they threw vast rocks at us from the cliffs as though they had been mere stones, and I heard the horrid sound of the ships crunching up against one another, and the death cries of my men, as the Lestragonians speared them like fishes and took them home to eat them. While they were thus killing my men within the harbour, I drew my sword, cut the cable of my own ship, and told my men to row with all their might if they too would not fare like the rest. So they laid out for their lives, and were thankful enough when we got into the open water out of reach of the rocks they hurled at us. As for the others, there was not one of them left. Thence we sailed sadly on, glad to have escaped death, though we had lost our comrades, and came to the Eean island, where Circe lives. A great and cunning goddess, who is own sister to the magician Aetes, for they are both children of the sun by Percy, who is daughter to Oceanus. We brought our ship into a safe harbour without a word, for some god guided us thither, and having landed we lay there for two days and two nights, worn out in body and mind. When the morning of the third day came I took my spear and my sword, and went away from the ship to reconnoitre, and see if I could discover signs of human handiwork, or hear the sound of voices. Climbing to the top of a high lookout, I espied the smoke of Circe's house rising upwards amid a dense forest of trees, and when I saw this I doubted whether, having seen the smoke, I would not go on at once and find out more, but in the end I deemed it best to go back to the ship, give the men their dinners, and send some of them instead of going myself. When I had nearly got back to the ship, some god took pity upon my solitude and sent a fine antlered stag right into the middle of my path. He was coming down his pasture in the forest to drink of the river, for the heat of the sun drove him, and as he passed I struck him in the middle of the back. The bronze point of the spear went clean through him, and he lay groaning in the dust until the life went out of him. Then I set my foot upon him, drew my spear from the wound, and laid it down. I also gathered rough grass and rushes, and twisted them into a fathom or so of good stout rope, with which I bound the four feet of the noble creature together. Having done so, I hung him round my neck and walked back to the ship leaning upon my spear, for the stag was much too big for me to be able to carry him on my shoulder, steadying him with one hand. As I threw him down in front of the ship, I called the men and spoke cheeringly man by man to each of them. "'Look here, my friends,' said I, "'we are not going to die so much before our time after all, and at any rate we will not starve so long as we have got something to eat and drink on board.' On this they uncovered their heads upon the seashore and admired the stag, for he was indeed a splendid fellow. Then, when they had feasted their eyes upon him sufficiently, they washed their hands and began to cook him for dinner. Thus through the live-long day to the going down of the sun we stayed there eating and drinking our fill, but when the sun went down and it came on dark we camped upon the seashore. When the child of morning, rosy-fingered dawn appeared, I called a council and said, my friends, we are in very great difficulties. Listen therefore to me. We have no idea where the sun either sets or rises, so that we do not even know east from west. I see no way out of it. Nevertheless, we must try and find one. We are certainly on an island, for I went as high as I could this morning and saw the sea reaching all round it to the horizon. It lies low, but towards the middle I saw smoke rising from out of a thick forest of trees. Their hearts sank as they heard me, for they remembered how they had been treated by the Lestragonian Antiphates, and by the savage ogre Polyphemus. They wept bitterly in their dismay, but there was nothing to be got by crying, so I divided them into two companies and set a captain over each. I gave one company to Eurylochus, while I took command of the other myself. Then we cast lots in a helmet, and the lot fell upon Eurylochus. So he set out with his twenty-two men, and they wept, as also did we who were left behind. When they reached Circe's house they found it built of cut stones, on a site that could be seen from far, in the middle of the forest. There were wild mountain wolves and lions prowling all round it, poor bewitched creatures whom she had tamed by her enchantments, and drugged into subjection. They did not attack my men, but wagged their great tails, fawned upon them and rubbed their noses lovingly against them. As hounds crowd round their master when they see him coming from dinner, for they know he will bring them something, 
Even so did these wolves and lions with their great claws fawn upon my men, but the men were terribly frightened at seeing such strange creatures. Presently they reached the gates of the goddess's house, and as they stood there they could hear Circe within, singing most beautifully as she worked at her loom, making a web so fine, so soft, and of such dazzling colors, as no one but a goddess could weave. On this Polites, whom I valued and trusted more than any other of my men, said, There is someone inside working at a loom and singing most beautifully. The whole place resounds with it. Let us call her and see whether she is woman or goddess. They called her and she came down, unfastened the door, and bade them enter. They, thinking no evil, followed her, all except Eurylochus, who suspected mischief and stayed outside. When she had got them into her house, she set them upon benches and seats and mixed them a mess with cheese, honey-meal, and Pramnian wine, but she drugged it with wicked poisons to make them forget their homes, and when they had drunk she turned them into pigs by a stroke of her wand, and shut them up in her pigsties. They were like pigs head, hair, and all, and they grunted just as pigs do, but their senses were the same as before, and they remembered everything. Thus then were they shut up squealing, and Circe threw them some acorns and beech masts such as pigs eat, but Eurylochus hurried back to tell me about the sad fate of our comrades. He was so overcome with dismay that though he tried to speak he could find no words to do so. His eyes filled with tears, and he could only sob and sigh, till at last we forced his story out of him, and he told us what had happened to the others. We went, said he, as you told us, through the forest, and in the middle of it there was a fine house built with cut stones in a place that could be seen from far. There we found a woman, or else she was a goddess, working at her loom and singing sweetly. So the men shouted to her and called her, whereon she at once came down, opened the door, and invited us in. The others did not suspect any mischief, so they followed her into the house, but I stayed where I was, for I thought there might be some treachery. From that moment I saw them no more, for not one of them ever came out, though I sat a long time watching for them. Then I took my sword of bronze and slung it over my shoulders. I also took my bow and told Eurylochus to come back with me and show me the way. But he laid hold of me with both his hands and spoke piteously, saying, Sir, do not force me to go with you, but let me stay here, for I know you will not bring one of them back with you, nor even return alive yourself. Let us rather see if we cannot escape at any rate with the few that are left us, for we may still save our lives. Stay where you are, then, answered I, eating and drinking at the ship, but I must go, for I am most urgently bound to do so. With this I left the ship and went up inland. When I got through the charmed grove and was near the great house of the enchantress Circe, I met Mercury with his golden wand, disguised as a young man in the heyday of his youth and beauty with the down just coming upon his face. He came up to me and took my hand within his own, saying, My poor unhappy man, whither are you going over this mountain top, alone and without knowing the way? Your men are shut up in Circe's pigsties, like so many wild boars in their lairs. You surely do not fancy that you can set them free. I can tell you that you will never get back and will have to stay there with the rest of them. But never mind, I will protect you and get you out of your difficulty. Take this herb, which is one of great value, and keep it about you when you go to Circe's house. It will be a talisman to you against every kind of mischief. And I will tell you of all the wicked witchcraft that Circe will try to practice upon you. She will mix a mess for you to drink and she will drug the meal with which she makes it, but she will not be able to charm you, for the virtue of the herb that I shall give you will prevent her spells from working. I will tell you all about it. When Circe strikes you with her wand, draw your sword and spring upon her as though you were going to kill her. She will then be frightened and will desire you to go to bed with her. On this you must not point-blank refuse her, for you want her to set your companions free, and to take good care also of yourself but you must make her swear solemnly by all the blessed gods that she will plot no further mischief against you, or else when she has got you naked she will unman you and make you fit for nothing." As he spoke he pulled the herb out of the ground and showed me what it was like. 
The root was black, while the flower was white as milk. The gods call it moli, and mortal men cannot uproot it, but the gods can do whatever they like." Then Mercury went back to High Olympus, passing over the wooded island. But I fared onward to the house of Circe, and my heart was clouded with care as I walked along. When I got to the gates I stood there and called the goddess, and as soon as she heard me she came down, opened the door, and asked me to come in. So I followed her, much troubled in my mind. She set me on a richly decorated seat inlaid with silver, there was a footstool also under my feet, and she mixed a mess in a golden goblet for me to drink. But she drugged it, for she met me mischief. When she had given it me, and I had drunk it without its charming me, she struck me with her wand. There now, she cried, be off to the pigsty, and make your lair with the rest of them. But I rushed at her with my sword drawn as though I would kill her, whereon she fell with a loud scream, clasped my knees, and spoke piteously, saying, Who and whence are you? From what place and people have you come? How can it be that my drugs have no power to charm you? Never yet was any man able to stand so much as a taste of the herb I gave you. You must be spell-proof. Surely you can be none other than the bold hero Ulysses, who Mercury always said would come here some day with his ship while on his way home from Troy. So be it, then. Sheathe your sword, and let us go to bed, that we may make friends and learn to trust each other. And I answered, Circe, how can you expect me to be friendly with you when you have just been turning all my men into pigs? And now that you have got me here yourself, you mean me mischief when you ask me to go to bed with you, and will unman me and make me fit for nothing. I shall certainly not consent to go to bed with you unless you will first take your solemn oath to plot no further harm against me." So she swore at once as I had told her, and when she had completed her oath then I went to bed with her. Meanwhile her four servants, who are her housemaids, set about their work. They are the children of the groves and fountains, and of the holy waters that run down into the sea. One of them spread a fair purple cloth over a seat and laid a carpet underneath it. Another brought tables of silver up to the seats, and set them with baskets of gold. A third mixed some sweet wine with water in a silver bowl and put golden cups upon the tables, while the fourth brought in water and set it to boil in a large cauldron over a good fire which she had lighted. When the water in the cauldron was boiling, she poured cold into it until it was just as I liked, and then she set me in a bath and began washing me from the cauldron about the head and shoulders, to take the tire and stiffness out of my limbs. As soon as she was done washing me and anointing me with oil, she arrayed me in a good cloak and shirt and led me to a richly decorated seat inlaid with silver. There was a footstool also under my feet. A maidservant then brought me water in a beautiful golden ewer and poured it into a silver basin for me to wash my hands, and she drew a clean table beside me. An upper servant brought me bread and offered me many things of what there was in the house, and then Circe bade me eat. But I would not, and sat without heeding what was before me, still moody and suspicious. When Circe saw me sitting there without eating, and in great grief, she came to me and said, Ulysses, why do you sit like that as though you were dumb, gnawing at your own heart, and refusing both meat and drink? Is it that you are still suspicious? You ought not to be, for I have already sworn solemnly that I will not hurt you. And I said, Circe, no man with any sense of what is right can think of either eating or drinking in your house until you have set his friends free and let him see them. If you want me to eat and drink, you must free my men and bring them to me that I may see them with mine own eyes." When I had said this, she went straight through the court with her wand in her hand and opened the pigsty doors. My men came out like so many prime hogs and stood looking at her. But she went about among them and anointed each with a second drug, whereon the bristles that the bad drug had given them fell off, and they became men again, younger than they were before and much taller and better looking. They knew me at once, seized me each of them by the hand, and wept for joy till the whole house was filled with the sound of their hallow-ballooing, and Circe herself was so sorry for them that she came up to me and said, Ulysses, noble son of Laertes, go back at once to the sea where you have left your ship, and first draw it on to the land, 
Then hide all your ship's gear and property in some cave and come back here with your men. I agreed to this, so I went back to the seashore and found the men at the ship weeping and wailing most piteously. When they saw me, the silly blubbering fellows began frisking round me as calves break out and gamble round their mothers, when they see them coming home to be milked after they have been feeding all day, and the homestead resounds with their lowing. They seemed as glad to see me as though they had got back to their own rugged Ithaca, where they had been born and bred. Sir, said the affectionate creatures, we are as glad to see you back as though we had got safe home to Ithaca. But tell us all about the fate of our comrades. I spoke comfortingly to them and said, We must draw our ship on to the land and hide the ship's gear with all our property in some cave. Then come with me all of you as fast as you can to Circe's house, where you will find your comrades eating and drinking in the midst of great abundance. On this the men would have come with me at once, but Eurylochus tried to hold them back and said, Alas, poor wretches that we are, what will become of us? Rush not on your ruin by going to the house of Circe, who will turn us all into pigs or wolves or lions, and we shall have to keep guard over her house. Remember how the Cyclops treated us when our comrades went inside his cave, and Ulysses with them. It was all through his sheer folly that those men lost their lives. When I heard him, I was in two minds whether or no to draw the keen blade that hung by my sturdy thigh and cut his head off in spite of his being a near relation of my own. But the men interceded for him and said, "'Sir, if it may so be, let this fellow stay here and mind the ship, but take the rest of us with you to Circe's house.' On this we all went inland, and Eurylochus was not left behind after all, but came on too, for he was frightened by the severe reprimand that I had given him. Meanwhile Circe had been seeing that the men who had been left behind were washed and anointed with olive oil. She had also given them woolen cloaks and shirts, and when we came we found them all comfortably at dinner in her house. As soon as the men saw each other face to face and knew one another, they wept for joy and cried aloud till the whole palace rang again. Thereon Circe came up to me and said, Ulysses, noble son of Laertes, tell your men to leave off crying. I know how much you all of you have suffered at sea, and how ill you have fared among cruel savages on the mainland, but that is over now. So stay here, and eat and drink till you are once more as strong and hardy as you were when you left Ithaca. For at present you are weakened both in body and mind. You keep all the time thinking of the hardships you have suffered during your travels, so that you have no more cheerfulness left in you." Thus did she speak, and we assented. We stayed with Circe for a whole twelve-month feasting upon an untold quantity both of meat and wine. But when the year had passed in the waning of moons and the long days had come round, my men called me apart and said, Sir, it is time you began to think about going home. If so be you are to be spared to see your house and native country at all. Thus did they speak, and I assented. Thereon, through the livelong day to the going down of the sun, we feasted our fill on meat and wine, but when the sun went down and it came on dark, the men laid themselves down to sleep in the covered cloisters. I, however, after I had got into bed with Circe, besought her by her knees, and the goddess listened to what I had got to say. Circe, said I, please to keep the promise you made me about furthering me on my homeward voyage. I want to get back, and so do my men. They are always pestering me with their complaints as soon as ever your back is turned. And the goddess answered, Ulysses, noble son of Laertes, you shall none of you stay here any longer if you do not want to. But there is another journey which you have got to take before you can sail homewards. You must go to the house of Hades and of dread Prosperpina to consult the ghost of the blind Theban prophet Tiresias, whose reason is still unshaken. To him alone has Prosperpina left his understanding even in death, but the other ghosts flit about aimlessly. I was dismayed when I heard this. I sat up in bed and wept, and would gladly have lived no longer to see the light of the sun. But presently, when I was tired of weeping and tossing myself about, I said, And who shall guide me upon this voyage? For the house of Hades is a port that no ship can reach. You will want no guide, she answered. Raise your mast, 
set your white sails, sit quite still, and the north wind will blow you there of itself. When your ship has traversed the waters of Oceanus, you will reach the fertile shore of Prosperpina's country, with its groves of tall poplars and willows that shed their fruit untimely. Here beach your ship upon the shore of Oceanus, and go straight on to the dark abode of Hades. You will find it near the place where the rivers Periphlegathon and Cocytus, which is a branch of the river Styx, flow into Acheron, and you will see a rock near it, just where two roaring rivers run into one another. When you have reached this spot, as I now tell you, dig a trench of a cubit or so in length, breadth and depth, and pour into it as a drinking offering to all the dead, first honey mixed with milk, then wine, and in the third place water, sprinkling white barley meal over the whole. Moreover, you must offer many prayers to the poor feeble ghosts, and promise them that when you get back to Ithaca you will sacrifice a barren heifer to them, the best you have, and will load the pyre with good things. More particularly, you must promise that Tiresias shall have a black sheep all to himself, the finest in all your flocks. When you shall have thus besought the ghosts with your prayers, offer them a ram and a black ewe, bending their heads towards Erebus. But yourself turn away from them as though you would make towards the river. On this many dead men's ghosts will come to you, and you must tell your men to skin the two sheep that you have just killed, and offer them as a burnt sacrifice with prayers to Hades and to Prosperpina. Then draw your sword and sit there, so as to prevent any other poor ghost from coming near the spilt blood before Tiresia shall have answered your questions. The seer will presently come to you, and will tell you about your voyage, what stages you are to make, and how you are to sail the sea so as to reach your home. It was daybreak by the time she had done speaking, so she dressed me in my shirt and cloak. As for herself, she threw a beautiful light gossamer fabric over her shoulders, fastening it with a golden girdle round her waist, and she covered her head with a mantle. Then I went about among the men everywhere all over the house, and spoke kindly to each of them man by man. "'You must not lie sleeping here any longer,' said I to them. "'We must be going, for Circe has told me all about it.' And on this they did as I bade them. Even so, however, I did not get them away without misadventure. We had with us a certain youth named Elpinor, not very remarkable for sense or courage, who had got drunk and was lying on the housetop away from the rest of the men, to sleep off his liquor in the cool. When he heard the noise of the men bustling about, he jumped up on a sudden and forgot all about coming down by the main staircase, so he tumbled right off the roof and broke his neck, and his soul went down to the house of Hades. When I had got the men together I said to them, "'You think you are about to start home again, but Circe has explained to me that, instead of this, we have got to go to the house of Hades and Prosperpina to consult the ghost of the Theban prophet Tiresias.' The men were broken-hearted as they heard me, and threw themselves on the ground groaning and tearing their hair. But they cannot mend matters by crying. When we reached the seashore, weeping and lamenting our fate, Circe brought the ram and the ewe, and we made them fast hard by the ship. She passed through the midst of us without our knowing it, for who can see the comings and goings of a god if the god does not wish to be seen? End of Book Ten Book Eleven of The Odyssey by Homer, translated by Samuel Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Odyssey, Book Eleven, The Visit to the Dead. Then, when we had got down to the seashore, we drew our ship into the water and got her mast and sails into her. We also put the sheep on board and took our places, weeping and in great distress of mind. Circe, that great and cunning goddess, sent us a fair wind that blew dead aft and stayed steadily with us keeping our sails all the time well filled. So we did whatever wanted doing to the ship's gear and let her go as the wind and helmsman headed her. All day long her sails were full as she held her course over the sea, but when the sun went down and darkness was over all the earth, we got into the deep waters of the river Oceanus, where lie the land and city of the Cimmerians, who live enshrouded in mist and darkness, which the rays of the sun never pierce, 
neither at his rising nor as he goes down again out of the heavens, but the poor wretches live in one long melancholy night. When we got there we beached the ship, took the sheep out of her, and went along by the waters of Oceanus till we came to the place of which Circe had told us. Here Perimides and Eurylochus held the victims, while I drew my sword and dug the trench a cubit each way. I made a drink-offering to all the dead, first with honey and milk, then with wine, and thirdly with water. And I sprinkled white barley-meal over the whole, praying earnestly to the poor feckless ghosts, and promising them that when I got back to Ithaca I would sacrifice a barren heifer for them, the best I had, and would load the pyre with good things. I also particularly promised that Teresius should have a black sheep to himself, the best in all my flocks. When I had prayed sufficiently to the dead, I cut the throats of the two sheep, and let the blood run into the trench, whereon the ghosts came trooping up from Erebus, brides, young bachelors, old men worn out with toil, maids who had been crossed in love, and brave men who had been killed in battle, with their armor still smirched with blood. They came from every quarter and flitted round the trench with a strange kind of screaming sound that made me turn pale with fear. When I saw them coming, I told the men to be quick and flay the carcasses of the two dead sheep and make burnt offerings of them, and at the same time to repeat prayers to Hades and to Persephone. But I sat where I was with my sword drawn and would not let the poor feckless ghosts come near the blood till Tiresias should have answered my questions. The first ghost that came was that of my comrade Elpiner, for he had not yet been laid beneath the earth. We had left his body unwaked and unburied in Circe's house, for we had had too much else to do. I was very sorry for him and cried when I saw him. Elpiner, said I, how did you come down here into this gloom and darkness? You have got here on foot quicker than I have with my ship. Sir, he answered with a groan, it was all bad luck and mine own unspeakable drunkenness. I was lying asleep on the top of Circe's house, and never thought of coming down again by the great staircase but fell right off the roof and broke my neck, so my soul came down to the house of Hades. And now I beseech you, by all those whom you have left behind you, though they are not here, by your wife, by the father who brought you up when you were a child, and by Telemachus who is the one hope of your house, do what I shall now ask you. I know that when you leave this limbo, you will again hold your ship for the E and island. Do not go thence leaving me unwaked and unburied behind you, or I may bring heaven's anger upon you. But burn me with whatever armor I have, build a barrow for me on the seashore, that may tell people in days to come what a poor unlucky fellow I was, and plant over my grave the oar I used to row with, when I was yet alive and with my messmates and I said, My poor fellow, I will do all that you have asked of me. Thus then did we sit and hold sad talk with one another, I on the one side of the trench with my sword held over the blood, and the ghost of my comrade saying all this to me from the other side. Then came the ghost of my dead mother Anticlea, daughter to Autilicus. I had left her alive when I set out for Troy, and was moved to tears when I saw her. But even so, for all my sorrow, I would not let her come near the blood till I had asked my questions of Tiresias. Then came also the ghost of Theban Tiresias, with his golden scepter in his hand. He knew me and said, Ulysses, noble son of Laertes, why, poor man, have you left the light of day and come down to visit the dead in this sad place? Stand back from the trench and withdraw your sword that I may drink of the blood and answer your questions truly. So I drew back and sheathed my sword, whereon, when he had drank of the blood, he began with his prophecy. "'You want to know,' said he, "'about your return home, but heaven will make this hard for you. I do not think that you will escape the eye of Neptune, who still nurses his bitter grudge against you for having blinded his son. Still, after much suffering, you may get home if you can restrain yourself and your companions when your ship reaches the Thrinacian island, where you will find the sheep and cattle belonging to the sun, who sees and gives ear to everything. If you leave these flocks unharmed and think of nothing but getting home, you may yet, after much hardship, reach Ithaca. But if you harm them, 
Then I forewarn you of the destruction both of your ship and of your men. Even though you may yourself escape, you will return in bad plight after losing all your men, in another man's ship, and you will find trouble in your house, which will be overrun by high-handed people, who are devouring your substance under the pretext of paying court and making presents to your wife. When you get home, you will take revenge on these suitors, and after you have killed them by force or fraud in your own house, you must take a well-made oar and carry it on and on, till you come to a country where the people have never heard of the sea, and do not even mix salt with their food, nor do they know anything about ships, and oars that are as the wings of a ship. I will give you this certain token which cannot escape your notice. A wayfarer will meet you and will say it must be a winnowing shovel that you have got upon your shoulder. On this you must fix the oar in the ground and sacrifice a ram, a bull, and a boar to Neptune. Then go home and offer hecatombs to all the gods in heaven one after the other. As for yourself, death shall come to you from the sea, and your life shall ebb away very gently when you are full of years and peace of mind, and your people shall bless you. All that I have said will come true. This, I answered, must be as it may please heaven. But tell me, and tell me, and tell me true. I see my poor mother's ghost close by us. She is sitting by the blood without saying a word, and though I am her own son, she does not remember me and speak to me. Tell me, sir, how can I make her know me? That, said he, I can soon do. Any ghost that you let taste of the blood will talk to you like a reasonable being, but if you do not let them have any blood, they will go away again. On this the ghost of Tiresias went back to the house of Hades, for his prophesyings had now been spoken, but I sat where I was until my mother came up and tasted the blood. Then she knew me at once and spoke fondly to me, saying, My son, how did you come down to this abode of darkness while you are still alive? It is a hard thing for the living to see these places, for between us and them there are great and terrible waters, and there is Oceanus, which no man can cross on foot, but he must have a good ship to take him. Are you all this time trying to find your way home from Troy, and have you never yet got back to Ithaca nor seen your wife in your own house? Mother, said I, I was forced to come here to consult the ghost of the Theban prophet Tiresias. I have never yet been near the Achaean land nor set foot on my native country. And I have had nothing but one long series of misfortunes from the very first day that I set out with Agamemnon for Ilius, the land of noble steeds, to fight the Trojans. But tell me, and tell me true, in what way did you die? Did you have a long illness? or did heaven vouchsafe you a gentle easy passage to eternity? Tell me also about my father, and the son whom I left behind me. Is my property still in their hands, or has someone else got hold of it, who thinks that I shall not return to claim it? Tell me again what my wife intends doing, and in what mind she is. Does she live with my son and guard my estate securely, or has she made the best match she could and married again? My mother answered, your wife still remains in your house, but she is in great distress of mind and spends her whole time in tears both night and day. No one as yet has got possession of your fine property, and Telemachus still holds your lands undisturbed. He has to entertain largely, as of course he must, considering his position as a magistrate and how every one invites him. Your father remains at his old place in the country and never goes near the town. He has no comfortable bed nor bedding. In the winter he sleeps on the floor in front of the fire with the men, and goes about all in rags, but in summer, when the warm weather comes on again, he lies out in the vineyard on a bed of vine-leaves thrown anyhow upon the ground. He grieves continually about your never having come home, and suffers more and more as he grows older. As for my own end, it was in this wise. Heaven did not take me swiftly and painlessly in my own house, nor was I attacked by any illness such as those that generally wear people out and kill them, but my longing to know what you were doing and the force of my affection for you, this it was that was the death of me. Then I tried to find some way of embracing my poor mother's ghost, 
Thrice I sprang towards her and tried to clasp her in my arms, but each time she flitted from my embrace as it were a dream or phantom, and being touched to the quick I said to her, "'Mother, why do you not stay still when I would embrace you? If we could throw our arms around one another we might find sad comfort in the sharing of our sorrows, even in the house of Hades. Does Prosperpony want to lay a still further load of grief upon me by mocking me with a phantom only?' My son, she answered, most ill-fated of all mankind, it is not Prosperpony that is beguiling you, but all people are like this when they are dead. The sinews no longer hold the flesh and bones together. These perish in the fierceness of consuming fire as soon as life has left the body, and the soul flits away as though it were a dream. Now, however, go back to the light of day as soon as you can, and note all these things that you may tell them to your wife hereafter. Thus did we converse, and anon Prosperpony sent up the ghosts of the wives and daughters of all the most famous men. They gathered in crowds about the blood, and I considered how I might question them severally. In the end I deemed that it would be best to draw the keen blade that hung by my sturdy thigh and keep them from all drinking the blood at once. So they came up one after the other, and each one as I questioned her told me her race and lineage. The first I saw was Tyro. She was daughter of Salmonius and wife of Cretheus, the son of Aeolus. She fell in love with the river Enipius, who is much the most beautiful river in the whole world. Once, when she was taking a walk by his side as usual, Neptune, disguised as her lover, lay with her at the mouth of the river, and a huge blue wave arched itself like a mountain over them to hide both woman and god, whereon he loosed her virgin girdle and laid her in a deep slumber. When the god had accomplished the deed of love, he took her hand in his own and said, Tyro, rejoice in all good will. The embraces of the gods are not fruitless, and you will have fine twins about this time twelve months. Take great care of them. I am Neptune, so now go home, but hold your tongue and do not tell anyone. Then he dived under the sea, and she, in due course, bore Peleus and Nellius who both of them served Jove with all their might. Polyus was a great breeder of sheep and lived in Aeolcus, but the other lived in Pylos. The rest of her children were by Cretheus, namely Aeson, Pheres, and Amethaean, who was a mighty warrior and charioteer. Next to her I saw Antiope, daughter to Asopus, who could boast of having slept in the arms of even Jove himself, and who bore him two sons, Amphion and Zethus. These founded Thebes with its seven gates, and built a wall all round it, for strong though they were they could not hold Thebes till they had walled it. Then I saw Alcmena, the wife of Amphitryon, who also bore to Jove indomitable Hercules, and Megara, who was the daughter to great King Creon, and married the redoubtable son of Amphitryon. I also saw fair Epicaste, mother of King Antipodes, whose awful lot it was to marry her own son without suspecting it. He married her after having killed his father, but the gods proclaimed the whole story to the world. Whereon he remained king of Thebes, in great grief for the spite the gods had borne him. But Epicaste went to the house of the mighty jailer Hades, having hanged herself for grief, and the avenging spirits haunted him as for an outraged mother, to his ruing bitterly thereafter. Then I saw Chloris, whom Nellius married for her beauty, having given priceless presents for her. She was youngest daughter to Amphion, son of Aeasus, and king of Minion Orchomenus, and was queen in Pylos. She bore Nestor, Chromius, and Periclymenus, and she also bore that marvelously lovely woman Pero, who was wooed by all the country round. But Nellius would only give her to him who should raid the cattle of Iphicles from the grazing grounds of Phileus, and this was a hard task. The only man who would undertake to raid them was a certain excellent seer, but the will of heaven was against him, for the rangers of the cattle caught him and put him in prison. Nevertheless, when a full year had passed and the same season came round again, Iphicles set him at liberty, after he had expounded all the oracles of heaven. Thus then was the will of Jove accomplished. And I saw Leda, the wife of Tyndarus, who bore him two famous sons, Castor, breaker of horses, and Pollux, the mighty boxer. Both these heroes are lying under the earth, though they are still alive. 
for by a special dispensation of Jove, they die and come to life again, each one of them every other day throughout all time, and they have the rank of gods. After her I saw Iphimedea, wife of Elias, who boasted the embrace of Neptune. She bore two sons, Otus and Ephialtes, but both were short-lived. They were the finest children that were ever born in this world, and the best-looking, Orion only excepted. For at nine years old they were nine fathoms high, and measured nine cubits around the chest. They threatened to make war with the gods in Olympus, and tried to set Mount Osa on the top of Mount Olympus, and Mount Pelion on the top of Osa, that they might scale heaven itself. And they would have done it, too, if they had been grown up. But Apollo, son of Leto, killed both of them, before they had got so much as a sign of hair upon their cheeks or chin. Then I saw Phaedra and Procris, and fair Ariadne, daughter of the magician Minos, whom Theseus was carrying off from Crete to Athens, but he did not enjoy her, for before he could do so Diana killed her in the island of Dia on account of what Bacchus had said against her. I also saw Mera and Clymene and hateful Eryphile, who sold her own husband for gold. But it would take me all night if I were to name every single one of the wives and daughters of heroes whom I saw, and it was time for me to go to bed, either on board ship with my crew or here. As for my escort, heaven and yourselves will see to it." Here he ended, and the guests sat all of them enthralled and speechless throughout the covered cloister. Then Aridi said to them, "'What do you think of this man, O Phaeacians? Is he not tall and good-looking, and is he not clever? True, he is my own guest, but all of you share in the distinction. Do not be in a hurry to send him away, nor niggardly in the presence you make to one who is in such great need, for heaven has blessed all of you with great abundance." Then spoke the aged hero Achenius, who was one of the oldest men among them. "'My friends,' said he, "'what our august queen has just said to us is both reasonable and to the purpose. Therefore be persuaded by it. But the decision whether in word or deed rests ultimately with King Alcinous." "'The thing shall be done,' exclaimed Alcinous, "'as surely as I still live and reign over the Phaeacians. Our guest is indeed very anxious to get home. Still we must persuade him to remain with us until tomorrow, by which time I shall be able to get together the whole sum that I mean to give him. As regards his escort, it will be a matter for you all, and mine above all others as the chief person among you." And Ulysses answered, "'King Alcinous, if you were to bid me to stay here for a whole twelve months, and then speed me on my way, loaded with your noble gifts, I should obey you gladly. And it would redound greatly to my advantage, for I should return fuller-handed to my own people, and should thus be more respected and beloved by all who see me when I get back to Ithaca." Ulysses, replied Alcinous, not one of us who sees you has any idea that you are a charlatan or a swindler. I know there are many people going about who tell such plausible stories that it is very hard to see through them, but there is a style about your language which assures me of your good disposition. Moreover, you have told the story of your own misfortune, and those of the Argives, as though you were a practiced bard. But tell me, and tell me true whether you saw any of the mighty heroes who went to Troy at the same time with yourself and perished there. The evenings are still at their longest, and it is not yet bedtime. Go on, therefore, with your divine story, for I could stay here listening till tomorrow morning, so long as you will continue to tell us of your adventures." Alcinous, answered Ulysses, there is a time for making speeches and a time for going to bed. Nevertheless, since you so desire, I will not refrain from telling you the still sadder tale of those of my comrades who did not fall fighting with the Trojans, but perished on their return through the treachery of a wicked woman. When Prosperpine had dismissed the female ghosts in all directions, the ghost of Agamemnon, son of Atreus, came sadly up to me, surrounded by those who had perished with him in the house of Aegisthus. As soon as he had tasted the blood he knew me and weeping bitterly stretched out his arms towards me to embrace me. But he had no strength nor substance any more, and I too wept and pitied him as I beheld him. 
How did you come by your death, said I, King Agamemnon? Did Neptune raise his winds and waves against you when you were at sea, or did your enemies make an end of you on the mainland when you were cattle-lifting or sheep-stealing, or while they were fighting in defense of their wives and city? Ulysses, he answered, noble son of Laertes, I was not lost at sea in any storm of Neptune's raising, nor did my foes dispatch me upon the mainland, but Aegisthus and my wicked wife were the death of me between them. He asked me to his house, feasted me, and then butchered me most miserably, as though I were a fat beast in a slaughterhouse, while all around me my comrades were slain like sheep or pigs for the wedding breakfast or picnic or gorgeous banquet of some great nobleman. You must have seen numbers of men killed either in a general engagement or in single combat, but you never saw anything so truly pitiable as the way in which we fell in that cloister, with the mixing-bowl and the loaded tables lying all about, and the ground reeking with our blood. I heard Priam's daughter Cassandra scream as Clytemnestra killed her close beside me. I lay dying upon the earth with the sword in my body, and raised my hands to kill the slut of a murderess but she slipped away from me. She would not even close my lips nor my eyes when I was dying, for there is nothing in this world so cruel and so shameless as a woman when she has fallen into such guilt as hers was. Fancy murdering her own husband! I thought I was going to be welcomed home by my children and my servants, but her abominable crime has brought disgrace on herself and all women who shall come after, even on the good ones and I said, In truth Jove has hated the house of Atreus from first to last in the matter of their women's counsels. See how many of us fell for Helen's sake, and now it seems that Clytemnestra hatched mischief against you too during your absence. Be sure, therefore, continued Agamemnon, and not be too friendly even with your own wife. Do not tell her all that you know perfectly well yourself. Tell her a part only, and keep your own counsel about the rest. Not that your wife, Ulysses, is likely to murder you, for Penelope is a very admirable woman, and has an excellent nature. We left her a young bride with an infant at her breast when we set out for Troy. This child, no doubt, is now grown up happily to man's estate, and he and his father will have a joyful meeting and embrace one another, as it is right they should do, whereas my wicked wife did not even allow me the happiness of looking upon my son but killed me ere I could do so. Furthermore, I say, and lay my saying to your heart, do not tell people when you are bringing your ship to Ithaca, but steal a march upon them, for after all this there is no trusting women. But now tell me, and tell me true. Can you give me any news of my son Orestes? Is he in Orchomenus, or at Pylos, or is he at Sparta with Menelaus, for I presume that he is still living? And I said, Agamemnon, why do you ask me? I do not know whether your son is alive or dead, and it is not right to talk when one does not know. As we two sat weeping and talking thus sadly with one another, the ghost of Achilles came up to us with Patroclus, Antilochus, and Ajax, who was the finest and goodliest man of all the Danaeans after the son of Peleus. The fleet descendant of Aeacus knew me and spoke piteously, saying, Ulysses, noble son of Laertes, what deed of daring will you undertake next, that you venture down to the house of Hades among us silly dead, who are but the ghost of them who can labor no more? And I said, Achilles, son of Peleus, foremost champion of the Achaeans, I came to consult Tiresias, and see if he could advise me about my return home to Ithaca, for I have never yet been able to get near the Achaean land, nor to set foot in my own country but have been in trouble all the time. As for you, Achilles, no one was ever yet so fortunate as you have been, nor ever will be. For you were adored by all us Argives as long as you were alive, and now that you are here you are a great prince among the dead. Do not, therefore, take it so much to heart even if you are dead." "'Say not a word,' he answered, in death's favor. I would rather be a paid servant in a poor man's house and be above ground than king of kings among the dead. But give me news about my son. Is he gone to the wars, and will he be a great soldier, or is this not so? Tell me also if you have heard anything about my father Peleus, 
Does he still rule among the Myrmidons, or do they show him no respect throughout Hellas and Thea, now that he is old and his limbs fail him? Could I but stand by his side, in the light of day, with the same strength that I had when I killed the bravest of our foes upon the plain of Troy? Could I but be as I then was, and go even for a short time to my father's house, any one who tried to do him violence or supersede him would soon rue it. I have heard nothing, I answered, of Peleus, but I can tell you all about your son Neoptolemus, for I took him in my own ship from Skyros with the Achaeans. In our councils of war before Troy he was always first to speak, and his judgment was unerring. Nestor and I were the only two who could surpass him, and when it came to fighting on the plain of Troy he would never remain with the body of his men, but would dash on far in front, for most of them in all valor. Many a man did he kill in battle. I cannot name every single one of those whom he slew while fighting on the side of the Argives, but will only say how he killed that valiant hero Eurypylus, son of Telephus, who was the handsomest man I ever saw except Memnon. Many others also of the Cetaeans fell around him by reason of a woman's bribes. Moreover, when all the bravest of the Argives went inside the horse that Epius had made, and it was left to me to settle when we should either open the door of our ambuscade or close it, though all the other leaders and chief men among the Danaeans were drying their eyes and quaking in every limb, I never once saw him turn pale nor wipe a tear from his cheek. He was all the time urging me to break out from the horse, grasping the handle of his sword and his bronze-shod spear, and breathing fury against the foe. Yet when we had sacked the city of Priam, he got his handsome share of the prize-money and went on board, such as the fortune of war, without a wound upon him, neither from a thrown spear nor in close combat, for the rage of Mars is a matter of great chance. When I had told him this, the ghost of Achilles strode off across a meadow full of asphodel, exulting over what I had said concerning the prowess of his son. The ghosts of other dead men stood near me and told me each his own melancholy tale. But that of Ajax son of Telamon alone held aloof, still angry with me for having won the cause in our dispute about the armor of Achilles. Thetis had offered it as a prize, but the Trojan prisoners and Minerva were the judges. Would that I had never gained the day in such a contest, for it cost the life of Ajax who was foremost of all the Danaeans after the son of Peleus, alike in stature and prowess. When I saw him I tried to pacify him and said, Ajax, will you not forget and forgive even in death, but must the judgment about that hateful armor still rankle with you? It cost us Argives dear enough to lose such a tower of strength as you were to us. We mourned you as much as we mourned Achilles, son of Peleus himself nor can the blame be laid on anything but on the spite which Jove bore against the Danaeans, for it was this that made him counsel your destruction. Come hither, therefore, bring your proud spirit into subjection, and hear what I can tell you." He would not answer, but turned away to Erebus and to the other ghosts. Nevertheless I should have made him talk to me in spite of his being so angry, or I should have gone on talking to him, only that there were still others among the dead whom I desired to see. Then I saw Minos, son of Jove, with his golden scepter in his hand sitting in judgment on the dead, and the ghosts were gathered sitting and standing round him in the spacious house of Hades, to learn his sentences upon them. After him I saw a huge Orion in a meadow full of asphodel driving the ghosts of the wild beasts that he had killed upon the mountains, and he had a great bronze club in his hand, unbreakable for ever and ever and I saw Titius, son of Gaia, stretched upon the plain and covering some nine acres of ground. Two vultures on either side of him were digging their beaks into his liver, and he kept on trying to beat them off with his hands, but could not. For he had violated Jove's mistress Leto as she was going through Panopeus on her way to Pytho. I saw also the dreadful fate of Tantalus, who stood in a lake that reached his chin. He was dying to quench his thirst, but could never reach the water for whenever the poor creature stooped to drink it dried up and vanished, so that there was nothing but dry ground, parched by the spite of heaven. There were tall trees, moreover, that shed their fruit over his head—pears, pomegranates, apples, sweet figs, and juicy olives, 
but whenever the poor creature stretched out his hand to take some, the wind tossed the branches back again to the clouds. And I saw Sisyphus, at his endless task, raising his prodigious stone with both his hands. With hands and feet he tried to roll it up to the top of the hill, but always, just before he could roll it over onto the other side, its weight would be too much for him, and the pitiless stone would come thundering down again onto the plain. Then he would begin trying to push it uphill again, and the sweat ran off him and the steam rose after him. After him I saw a mighty Hercules, but it was his phantom only, for he is feasting ever with the immortal gods and has lovely Hebe to wife, who is daughter of Jove and Juno. The ghosts were screaming round him like scared birds flying all withers. He looked black as night with his bare bow in his hands and his arrow on the string, glaring around as though ever on the point of taking aim. About his breast there was a wondrous golden belt adorned in the most marvelous fashion with bears, wild boars, and lions with gleaming eyes. There was also war, battle, and death. The man who made that belt, do what he might, would never be able to make another like it. Hercules knew me at once when he saw me, and spoke piteously, saying, My poor Ulysses, noble son of Laertes, are you too leading the same sorry kind of life that I did when I was above ground? I was son of Jove, but I went through an infinity of suffering, for I became bondsman to one who was far beneath me, a low fellow who set me all manner of labors. He once sent me here to fetch the hell-hound, for he did not think he could find anything harder for me than this, but I got the hound out of Hades and brought him to him, for Mercury and Minerva helped me. On this Hercules went down again into the house of Hades, but I stayed where I was in case some other of the mighty dead should come to me. And I should have seen still other of them that are gone before, whom I would fain have seen, Theseus and Peritus, glorious children of the gods, but so many thousands of ghosts came round me and uttered such appalling cries that I was panic-stricken lest Prosperpine should send up from the house of Hades the head of that awful monster Gorgon. On this I hastened back to my ship and ordered my men to go on board at once and loose the hawsers. So they embarked and took their places, whereon the ship went down the stream of the river Oceanus. We had to row at first, but presently a fair wind sprang up. End of Book Eleven. Book Twelve of the Odyssey by Homer, translated by Samuel Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Odyssey, Book Twelve, The Sirens, Scylla and Charybdis, The Cattle of the Sun. After we were clear of the river Oceanus and had got out into the open sea, we went on till we reached the Aeaean island, where there is dawn and sunrise as in other places. We then drew our ship onto the sands and got out of her onto the shore, where we went to sleep and waited till day should break. Then, when the child of morning, rosy-fingered dawn appeared, I sent some men to Circe's house to fetch the body of Elpiner. We cut firewood from a wood where the headland jutted out into the sea and after we had wept over him and lamented him we performed his funeral rites. When his body and armor had been burned to ashes, we raised a cairn, set a stone over it, and at the top of the cairn we fixed the oar that he had been used to row with. While we were doing all this, Circe, who knew that we had got back from the house of Hades, dressed herself and came to see us as fast as she could, and her maid-servants came with her bringing us bread, meat, and wine. Then she stood in the midst of us and said, You have done a bold thing in going down alive to the house of Hades, and you will have died twice, to other people's once. Now then, stay here for the rest of the day, feast your fill, and go on with your voyage at daybreak tomorrow morning. In the meantime I will tell Ulysses about your course, and will explain everything to him, so as to prevent your suffering from misadventure either by land or sea. We agreed to do as she had said, and feasted through the livelong day to the going down of the sun, but when the sun had set and it came on dark, the men laid themselves down to sleep by the stern cables of the ship. Then Circe took me by the hand and bade me be seated away from the others, while she reclined by my side and asked me all about our adventures. 
So far so good, said she, when I had ended my story. And now pay attention to what I am about to tell you. Heaven itself indeed will recall it to your recollection. First you will come to the sirens who enchant all who come near them. If any one unwarily draws in too close and hears the singing of the sirens, his wife and children will never welcome him home again, for they sit in a green field and warble him to death with the sweetness of their song. There is a great heap of dead men's bones lying all around, with the flesh still rotting off them. Therefore pass these sirens by, and stop your men's ears with wax that none of them may hear. But if you like, you can listen yourself, for you may get the men to bind you as you stand upright on a cross-piece halfway up the mast, and they must lash the rope's ends to the mast itself, that you may have the pleasure of listening. If you beg and pray the men to unloose you, then they must bind you faster. When your crew have taken you past these sirens, I cannot give you coherent directions as to which of two courses you are to take. I will lay the two alternatives before you, and you must consider them for yourself. On the one hand there are some overhanging rocks against which the deep blue waves of Amphitrite beat with terrific fury. The blessed gods call these rocks the wanderers. Here not even a bird may pass, no, not even the timid doves that bring ambrosia to Father Jove, but the sheer rock always carries off one of them, and Father Jove has to send another to make up their number. No ship that ever yet came to these rocks has got away again, but the waves and whirlwinds of fire are freighted with wreckage, and with the bodies of dead men. The only vessel that ever sailed and got through was the famous Argo on her way from the house of Aetes, and she too would have gone against these great rocks, only that Juno piloted her past them for the love she bore to Jason. Of these two rocks the one reaches heaven and its peak is lost in a dark cloud. This never leaves it, so that the top is never clear not even in summer and early autumn. No man, though he had twenty hands and twenty feet, could get a foothold on it and climb it, for it runs sheer up, as smooth as though it had been polished. In the middle of it there is a large cavern, looking west and turned towards Erebus. You must take your ship this way, but the cave is so high up that not even the stoutest archer could send an arrow into it. Inside it Scylla sits and yelps with a voice that you might take to be that of a young hound, but in truth she is a dreadful monster and no one, not even a god, could face her without being terror-struck. She has twelve misshapen feet and six necks of the most prodigious length, and at the end of each neck she has a frightful head with three rows of teeth in each, all set very close together, so that they would crunch any one to death in a moment. And she sits deep within her shady cell, thrusting out her heads and peering all round the rock, fishing for dolphins or dogfish or any larger monster that she can catch, of the thousands with which Amphitrite teems. No ship ever yet got past her without losing some men, for she shoots out all her heads at once and carries off a man in each mouth. You will find the other rock lie lower, but they are so close together that there is not more than a bow-shot between them. A large fig-tree in full leaf grows upon it, and under it lies the sucking whirlpool of Charybdis. Three times in the day does she vomit forth her waters, and three times she sucks them down again. See that you be not there when she is sucking, for if you are, Neptune himself could not save you. You must hug the Scyllicide and drive ship by as fast as you can, for you had better lose six men than your whole crew. Is there no way, said I, of escaping Charybdis, and at the same time keeping Scylla off when she is trying to harm my men? You daredevil, replied the goddess, you are always wanting to fight somebody or something. You will not let yourself be beaten even by the immortals. For Scylla is not mortal. Moreover, she is savage, extreme, rude, cruel, and invincible. There is no help for it. Your best chance will be to get by her as fast as ever you can. For if you dawdle about her rock while you are putting on your armor, she may catch you with the second cast of her six heads and snap up another half dozen of your men. So drive your ship past her at full speed, and roar out lustily to Crataeus, who is Scylla's dam, bad luck to her. 
She will then stop her from making a second raid upon you. You will now come to the Thrinacian island, and here you will see many herds of cattle and flocks of sheep belonging to the sun-god, seven herds of cattle and seven flocks of sheep, with fifty head in each flock. They do not breed, nor do they become fewer in number, and they are tended by the goddesses Phithusa and Lampidi, who are children of the sun-god Hyperion by Niera. Their mother, when she had borne them and had done suckling them, sent them to the Thrinacian island, which was a long way off, to live there and look after their father's flocks and herds. If you leave these flocks unharmed, and think of nothing but getting home, you may yet after much hardship reach Ithaca. But if you harm them, then I forewarn you of the destruction both of your ship and of your comrades. And even though you may yourself escape, you will return late, in bad plight, after losing all your men." Here she ended, and dawn enthroned in gold began to show in heaven, whereon she returned inland. I then went on board and told my men to loose the ship from her moorings. So they at once got into her, took their places, and began to smite the grey sea with their oars. Presently the great and cunning goddess Circe befriended us with a fair wind that blew dead aft and stayed steadily with us, keeping our sails well filled, so we did whatever wanted doing to the ship's gear, and let her go as wind and helmsman headed her. Then, being much troubled in mind, I said to my men, My friends, it is not right that one or two of us alone should know the prophecies that Circe has made me. I will therefore tell you about them, so that whether we live or die we may do so with our eyes open. First she said we were to keep clear of the sirens, who sit and sing most beautifully in a field of flowers. But she said I might hear them myself, so long as no one else did. Therefore take me and bind me to the cross-piece halfway up the mast. Bind me as I stand upright, with a bond so fast that I cannot possibly break away, and lash the rope's ends to the mast itself. If I beg and pray you to set me free, then bind me more tightly still." I had hardly finished telling everything to the men before we reached the island of the two sirens, for the wind had been very favorable. Then all of a sudden it fell dead calm. There was not a breath of wind nor ripple upon the water. So the men furled the sails and stowed them. Then, taking to their oars, they whitened the water with the foam they raised in rowing. Meanwhile I took a large wheel of wax and cut it up small with my sword. Then I kneaded the wax in my strong hands till it became soft, which it soon did between the kneading and the rays of the sun-god's son of Hyperion. Then I stopped the ears of all my men, and they bound me hands and feet to the mast as I stood upright on the cross-piece. But they went on rowing themselves. When we had got within earshot of the land, and the ship was going at a good rate, the sirens saw that we were getting in shore and began with their singing. Come here, they sang, renowned Ulysses, honor to the Achaean name, and listen to our two voices. No one ever sailed past us without staying to hear the enchanting sweetness of our song, and he who listens will go on his way not only charmed but wiser, for we know all the ills that the gods laid upon the Argives and the Trojans before Troy and can tell you everything that is going to happen over the whole world." They sang these words most musically, and as I longed to hear them further I made signs by frowning to my men that they should set me free. But they quickened their stroke, and Eurolochus and Paramedes bound me with still stronger bonds till we had got out of hearing of the sirens' voices. Then my men took the wax from their ears and unbound me. Immediately after we had got past the island, I saw a great wave from which spray was rising, and I heard a loud roaring sound. The men were so frightened that they loosed hold of their oars, for the whole sea resounded with the rushing of the waters, but the ship stayed where it was, for the men had left off rowing. I went round, therefore, and exhorted them man by man not to lose heart. "'My friends,' said I, "'this is not the first time that we have been in danger and we are in nothing like so bad a case as when the Cyclops shut us up in his cave. Nevertheless, my courage and wise counsel saved us then, and we shall live to look back on all this as well. Now, therefore, let us all do as I say, 
trust in Jove, and row on with might and main. As for you, coxswain, these are your orders. Attend to them, for the ship is in your hands. Turn her head away from these steaming rapids and hug the rock, or she will give you the slip and be over yonder before you know where you are, and you will be the death of us. So they did as I told them, but I said nothing about the awful monster Scylla, for I knew the men would not go on rowing if I did, but would huddle together in the hold. In one thing only did I disobey Circe's strict instructions. I put on my armor. Then, seizing two strong spears, I took my stand on the ship's bows, for it was there that I expected first to see the monster of the rock, who was to do my men so much harm. But I could not make her out anywhere, though I strained my eyes with looking the gloomy rock all over and over. Then we entered the straits in great fear of mind, for on the one hand was Scylla, and on the other dread Charybdis kept sucking up the salt water. As she vomited it up, it was like the water in a cauldron when it is boiling over upon a great fire, and the spray reached the top of the rocks on either side. When she began to suck again, we could see the water all inside whirling round and round, and it made a deafening sound as it broke against the rocks. We could see the bottom of the whirlpool all black with sand and mud, and the men were at their wits' ends for fear. While we were taken up with this, and were expecting each moment to be our last, Scylla pounced down suddenly upon us and snatched up my six best men. I was looking at once after both ship and men, and in a moment I saw their hands and feet ever so high above me, struggling in the air as Scylla was carrying them off, and I heard them all call out my name in one last despairing cry. As a fisherman, seated, spear in hand, upon some jutting rock throws bait into the water to deceive the poor little fishes, and spears them with the ox's horn with which his spear is shot, throwing them gasping onto the land as he catches them one by one. Even so did Scylla land these panting creatures on her rock and munch them up at the mouth of her den, while they screamed and stretched out their hands to me in their mortal agony. This was the most sickening sight that I saw throughout all my voyages. When we had passed the wandering rocks, with Scylla and terrible Charybdis, we reached the noble island of the sun-god, where were the goodly cattle and sheep belonging to the sun Hyperion. While still at sea in my ship I could hear the cattle lowing as they came home to the yards, and the sheep bleeding. Then I remembered what the blind Theban prophet Tiresias had told me, and how carefully E and Circe had warned me to shun the island of the blessed sun-god. So being much troubled, I said to the men, My men, I know you are hard-pressed, but listen while I tell you the prophecy that Tiresias made me, and how carefully E and Circe warned me to shun the island of the blessed sun-god. For it was here, she said, that our worst danger would lie. Head the ship, therefore, away from the island. The men were in despair at this, and Eurylochus at once gave me an insolent answer. "'Ulysses,' said he, "'you are cruel. You are very strong yourself, and never get worn out. You seem to be made of iron, and now, though your men are exhausted with toil and want of sleep, you will not let them land and cook themselves a good supper upon this island, but bid them put out to sea and go faring fruitlessly on through the watches of the flying night. It is by night that the winds blow hardest and do so much damage.' How can we escape should one of those sudden squalls spring up from southwest or west, which so often wreck a vessel when our lords the gods are unpropitious? Now, therefore, let us obey the behests of night and prepare a supper here hard by the ship. Tomorrow morning we will go on board again and put out to sea. Thus spoke Eurylochus, and the men approved his words. I saw that heaven meant us mischief, and said, You force me to yield for you are many against one. But at any rate each one of you must take his solemn oath that if he meet with a herd of cattle or a large flock of sheep, he will not be so mad as to kill a single head of either, but will be satisfied with the food that Circe has given us." They all swore as I bade them, and when they had completed their oath we made the ship fast in a harbour that was near a stream of fresh water, and the men went ashore and cooked their suppers. As soon as they had had enough to eat and drink, they began talking about their poor comrades whom Scylla had snatched up and eaten. 
this set them weeping, and they went on crying till they fell off into a sound sleep. In the third watch of the night, when the stars had shifted their places, Jove raised a great gale of wind that flew a hurricane, so that land and sea were covered with thick clouds, and night sprang forth out of the heavens. When the child of morning, rosy-fingered dawn appeared, we brought the ship to land and drew her into a cave wherein the sea-nymphs hold their courts and dances, and I called the men together in council. "'My friends,' said I, "'we have meat and drink in the ship. Let us mind, therefore, and not touch the cattle, or we shall suffer for it. For these cattle and sheep belong to the mighty sun, who sees and gives ear to everything.' And again they promised that they would obey. For a whole month the wind blew steadily from the south, and there was no other wind but only south and east. As long as corn and wine held out, the men did not touch the cattle when they were hungry. When, however, they had eaten all there was in the ship, they were forced to go further afield with hook and line, catching birds and taking whatever they could lay their hands on, for they were starving. One day, therefore, I went up inland that I might pray heaven to show me some means of getting away. When I had gone far enough to be clear of all my men, and had found a place that was well sheltered from the wind, I washed my hands and prayed to all the gods in Olympus till by and by they sent me off into a sweet sleep. Meanwhile Eurylochus had been giving evil counsel to the men. "'Listen to me,' said he, "'my poor comrades. All deaths are bad enough, but there is none so bad as famine. Why should not we drive in the best of these cows and offer them in sacrifice to the immortal gods?' If we ever get back to Ithaca, we can build a fine temple to the sun-god and enrich it with every kind of ornament. If, however, he is determined to sink our ship out of revenge for these homed cattle, and the other gods are of the same mind, I for one would rather drink salt water once for all and have done with it, than be starved to death by inches in such a desert island as this is." Thus spoke Eurylochus, and the men approved his words. Now the cattle, so fair and goodly, were feeding not far from the ship. The men, therefore, drove in the best of them, and they all stood round them saying their prayers and using young oak-shoots instead of barley-meal, for there was no barley left. When they had done praying they killed the cows and dressed their carcasses. They cut out the thigh-bones, wrapped them round in two layers of fat, and set some pieces of raw meat on top of them. They had no wine with which to make drink-offerings over the sacrifice while it was cooking, so they kept pouring on a little water from time to time while the inward meats were being grilled. Then, when the thigh-bones were burned and they had tasted the inward meats, they cut the rest up small and put the pieces upon the spits. By this time my deep sleep had left me, and I turned back to the ship and to the seashore. As I drew near I began to smell hot roast meat so I groaned out a prayer to the immortal gods. "'Father Jove,' I exclaimed, "'and all you other gods who live in everlasting bliss, you have done me a cruel mischief by the sleep into which you have sent me. See what fine work these men of mine have been making in my absence!' Meanwhile Lampiti went straight off to the sun and told him we had been killing his cows, whereon he flew into a great rage, and said to the immortals, Father Jove, and all you other gods who live in everlasting bliss, I must have vengeance on the crew of Ulysses' ship. They have had the insolence to kill my cows, which were the one thing I loved to look upon, whether I was going up heaven or down again. If they do not square accounts with me about my cows, I will go down to Hades and shine there among the dead." Son, said Jove, go on shining upon us gods and upon mankind over the fruitful earth. I will shiver their ship into little pieces with a bolt of white lightning as soon as they get out to sea." I was told all this by Calypso, who said she had heard it from the mouth of Mercury. As soon as I got down to my ship and to the seashore, I rebuked each one of the men separately, but we could see no way out of it, for the cows were dead already. And indeed the gods began at once to show signs and wonders among us, for the hides of the cattle crawled about and the joints upon the spits began to low like cows, and the meat, whether cooked or raw, kept on making a noise just as cows do. For six days my men kept driving in the best cows and feasting upon them, 
but when Jove the son of Saturn had added a seventh day, the fury of the gale abated. We therefore went on board, raised our masts, spread sail, and put out to sea. As soon as we were well away from the island and could see nothing but sky and sea, the son of Saturn raised a black cloud over our ship, and the sea grew dark beneath it. We did not get on much further, for in another moment we were caught by a terrific squall from the west that snapped the forestays of the mast so that it fell aft, while all the ship's gear tumbled about at the bottom of the vessel. The mast fell upon the head of the helmsman in the ship's stern, so that the bones of his head were crushed to pieces, and he fell overboard as though he were diving, with no more life left in him. Then Jove let fly with his thunderbolts, and the ship went round and round, and was filled with fire and brimstone as the lightning struck it. The men all fell into the sea. They were carried about in the water round the ship, looking like so many seagulls. But the god presently deprived them of all chance of getting home again. I stuck to the ship till the sea knocked her sides from her keel, which drifted about by itself, and struck the mast out of her in the direction of the keel. But there was a backstay of stout ox thongs still hanging about it, and with this I lashed the mast and keel together, and getting astride of them was carried wherever the winds chose to take me. The gale from the west had now spent its force, and the wind got into the south again, which frightened me, lest I should be taken back to the terrible whirlpool of Charybdis. This, indeed, was what actually happened, for I was borne along by the waves all night, and by sunrise had reached the rock of Scylla and the whirlpool. She was then sucking down the salt sea-water, but I was carried aloft toward the fig-tree, which I caught hold of and clung on to like a bat. I could not plant my feet anywhere so as to stand securely, for the roots were a long way off and the boughs that overshadowed the whole pool were too high, too vast, and too far apart for me to reach them. So I hung patiently on, waiting till the pool should discharge my mast and raft again, and a very long while it seemed. A juryman is not more glad to get home to supper after having been long detained in court by troublesome cases than I was to see my raft beginning to work its way out of the whirlpool again. At last I let go with my hands and feet, and fell heavily into the sea, hard by my raft on which I then got, and began to row with my hands. As for Scylla, the father of gods and men would not let her get further sight of me, otherwise I should have certainly been lost. Hence I was carried along for nine days, till on the tenth night the gods stranded me on the Ogygian island, where dwells the great and powerful goddess Calypso. She took me in and was kind to me, but I need say no more about this, for I told you and your noble wife all about it yesterday, and I hate saying the same thing over and over again. End of Book Twelve Book Thirteen of The Odyssey by Homer Translated by Samuel Butler This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Odyssey Book Thirteen Ulysses leaves Scaria and returns to Ithaca. Thus did he speak and they all held their peace throughout the covered cloister, enthralled by the charm of his story, till presently Alcinous began to speak. Ulysses, said he, now that you have reached my house, I doubt not you will get home without further misadventure, no matter how much you have suffered in the past. To you others, however, who come here night after night to drink my choicest wine and listen to my bard, I would insist as follows. Our guest has already packed up the clothes, wrought gold, and other valuables which you have brought for his acceptance. Let us now, therefore, present him further, each one of us, with a large tripod and a cauldron. We will recoup ourselves by the levy of a general rate, for private individuals cannot be expected to bear the burden of such a handsome present. Everyone approved of this, and then they went home to bed each in his own abode. When the child of morning, rosy-fingered dawn appeared, they hurried down to the ship and brought their cauldrons with them. Alcinous went on board and saw everything so securely stowed under the ship's benches that nothing could break adrift and injure the rowers. Then they went to the house of Alcinous to get dinner, and he sacrificed a bull for them in honor of Jove who is the lord of all. They set the steaks to grill and made an excellent dinner, after which the inspired bard, Demodocus, 
who was a favorite with everyone, sang to them. But Ulysses kept on turning his eyes towards the sun, as though to hasten its setting, for he was longing to be on his way. As one who has been all day plowing a fallow field with a couple of oxen keeps thinking about his supper and is glad when night comes that he may go and get it, for it is all his legs can do to carry him, even so did Ulysses rejoice when the sun went down, and he at once went to the Phaeacians, addressing himself more particularly to King Alcinous. Sir and all of you farewell. Make your drink-offerings and send me on my way rejoicing, for you have fulfilled my heart's desire by giving me an escort and making me presents, which heaven grant that I may turn to good account. May I find my admirable wife living in peace among friends, and may you whom I leave behind me give satisfaction to your wives and children. May heaven vouchsafe you every good grace, and may no evil thing come among your people." Thus did he speak. His hearers all of them approved his saying, and agreed that he should have his escort inasmuch as he had spoken reasonably. Alcinous therefore said to his servant, "'Pontinus, mix some wine and hand it round to everybody, that we may offer a prayer to Father Jove, and speed our guest upon his way." Pontinus mixed the wine, and handed it to every one in turn. The others each from his own seat made a drink-offering to the blessed gods that live in heaven. But Ulysses rose and placed the double cup in the hands of Queen Aridi. "'Farewell, Queen,' said he, "'henceforward and forever, till age and death, the common lot of mankind, lay their hands upon you. I now take my leave. Be happy in this house with your children, your people, and with King Alcinous." As he spoke, he crossed the threshold, and Alcinous sent a man to conduct him to his ship and to the seashore. Aridi also sent some maidservants with him, one with a clean shirt and cloak, another to carry his strong-box, and a third with corn and wine. When they got to the waterside, the crew took these things and put them on board, with all the meat and drink but for Ulysses they spread a rug and a linen sheet on deck that he might sleep soundly in the stern of the ship. Then he too went on board and lay down without a word, but the crew took every man his place and loosed the hawser from the pierced stone to which it had been bound. Thereon, when they began rowing out to sea, Ulysses fell into a deep, sweet, and almost death-like slumber. The ship bounded forward on her way, as a four-in-hand chariot flies over the course when the horses feel the whip. Her prow curveted as it were the neck of a stallion, and a great wave of dark blue water seethed in her wake. She held steadily on her course, and even a falcon, swiftest of all birds, could not have kept pace with her. Thus, then, she cut her way through the water, carrying one who was as cunning as the gods, but who was now sleeping peacefully forgetful of all that he had suffered both on the field of battle and by the waves of the weary sea. When the bright star that heralds the approach of dawn began to show, the ship drew near to land. Now there is in Ithaca a haven of the old merman Phorcys, which lies between two points that break the line of the sea and shut the harbour in. These shelter it from the storms of wind and sea that rage outside, so that, when once within it, a ship may lie without being even moored. At the head of this harbour there is a large olive tree, and at no great distance a fine overarching cavern sacred to the nymphs who are called naiads. There are mixing bowls within it and wine jars of stone, and the bees hive there. Moreover, there are great looms of stone on which the nymphs weave their robes of sea purple, very curious to see, and at all times there is water within it. It has two entrances, one facing north by which mortals can go down into the cave, while the other comes from the south and is more mysterious. Mortals cannot possibly get in by it, it is the way taken by the gods. Into this harbour, then, they took their ship, for they knew the place. She had so much way upon her that she ran half her own length on to the shore. When, however, they had landed, the first thing they did was to lift Ulysses with his rug and linen sheet out of the ship, and lay him down upon the sand, still fast asleep. Then they took out the presents which Minerva had persuaded the Phaeacians to give him when he was setting out on his voyage homewards. They put these all together by the root of the olive tree, away from the road, for fear some passer-by might come and steal them before Ulysses awoke. 
and then they made the best of their way home again. But Neptune did not forget the threats with which he had already threatened Ulysses, so he took counsel with Jove. "'Father Jove,' said he, "'I shall no longer be held in any sort of respect among you gods if mortals like the Phaeacians, who are my own flesh and blood, show such small regard for me.' I said I would let Ulysses get home when he had suffered sufficiently. I did not say that he should never get home at all, for I knew you had already nodded your head about it, and promised that he should do so. But now they have brought him in a ship fast asleep, and have landed him in Ithaca after loading him with more magnificent presents of bronze, gold and raiment than he would ever have brought back from Troy, if he had had his share of the spoil and got home without misadventure and Jove answered, "'What, O lord of the earthquake, are you talking about? The gods are by no means wanting in respect of you. It would be monstrous were they to insult one so old and honoured as you are. As regards mortals, however, if any of them is indulging in insolence and treating you disrespectfully, it will always rest with yourself to deal with him as you may think proper, so do just as you please.' "'I should have done so at once,' replied Neptune if I were not anxious to avoid anything that might displease you. Now, therefore, I should like to wreck the Phaeacian ship as it is returning from its escort. This will stop them from escorting people in future, and I should also like to bury their city under a huge mountain." "'My good friend,' answered Jove, "'I should recommend you, at the very moment when the people from the city are watching the ship on her way, to turn it into a rock near the land and looking like a ship. This will astonish everybody, and you can then bury their city under the mountain." When earth-encircling Neptune heard this, he went to Scaria, where the Phaeacians live, and stayed there till the ship, which was making rapid way, had got close in. Then he went up to it, turned it into stone, and drove it down with the flat of his hand so as to root it in the ground. After this he went away. The Phaeacians then began talking among themselves and one would turn towards his neighbour, saying, "'Bless my heart! Who is it that can have rooted the ship in the sea just as she was getting into port? We could see the whole of her only a moment ago.' This was how they talked, but they knew nothing about it. And Alcinous said, "'I remember now the old prophecy of my father. He said that Neptune would be angry with us for taking every one so safely over the sea, and would one day wreck a Phaeacian ship as it was returning from an escort, and bury our city under a high mountain. This was what my old father used to say, and now it is all coming true. Now, therefore, let us all do as I say. In the first place we must leave off giving people escorts when they come here, and in the next let us sacrifice twelve picked bulls to Neptune, that he may have mercy upon us, and not bury our city under the high mountain. When the people heard this they were afraid and got ready the bulls. Thus did the chiefs and rulers of the Phaeacians pray to King Neptune, standing round his altar. And at the same time Ulysses woke up once more upon his own soil. He had been so long away that he did not know it again. Moreover, Jove's daughter Minerva had made it a foggy day, so that people might not know of his coming home and that she might tell him everything without either his wife or his fellow-citizens and friends recognizing him, until he had taken his revenge upon the wicked suitors. Everything, therefore, seemed quite different to him, the long straight tracks, the harbors, the precipices, and the goodly trees, appeared all changed as he started up and looked upon his native land. So he smote his thighs with the flat of his hands and cried aloud despairingly, "'Alas!' he exclaimed, among what manner of people am I fallen? Are they savage and uncivilized, or hospitable and humane? Where shall I put all this treasure, and which way shall I go? I wish I had stayed over there with the Phaeacians, or I could have gone to some other great chief who would have been good to me and given me an escort. As it is, I do not know where to put my treasure, and I cannot leave it here for fear somebody else should get hold of it. In good truth, the chiefs and rulers of the Phaeacians have not been dealing fairly by me, and have left me in the wrong country. They said they would take me back to Ithaca, and they have not done so. May Jove the protector of suppliants chastise them, for he watches over everybody and punishes those who do wrong. 
Still, I suppose I must count my goods and see if the crew have gone off with any of them." He counted his goodly coppers and cauldrons, his gold and all his clothes, but there was nothing missing. Still, he kept grieving about not being in his own country, and wandered up and down by the shore of the sounding sea, bewailing his hard fate. Then Minerva came up to him, disguised as a young shepherd of delicate and princely mien, with a good cloak folded doubly about her shoulders. She had sandals on her comely feet and held a javelin in her hand. Ulysses was glad when he saw her and went straight up to her. "'My friend,' said he, "'you are the first person whom I have met with in this country. I salute you, therefore, and beg you to be well disposed towards me. Protect these my goods, and myself too, for I embrace your knees and pray to you as though you were a god. Tell me, then, and tell me truly, what land and country is this? Who are its inhabitants? Am I on an island, or is this the seaboard of some continent?" Minerva answered, "'Stranger, you must be very simple, or must have come from somewhere a long way off, not to know what country this is. It is a very celebrated place, and everybody knows it east and west. It is rugged and not a good driving country but it is by no means a bad island for what there is of it. It grows any quantity of corn and also wine, for it is watered both by rain and dew. It breeds cattle also and goats. All kinds of timber grow here, and there are watering-places where the water never runs dry. So, sir, the name of Ithaca is known even as far as Troy, which I understand to be a long way off from this Achaean country. Ulysses was glad at finding himself, as Minerva told him, in his own country, and he began to answer, but he did not speak the truth, and made up a lying story in the instinctive wiliness of his heart. "'I heard of Ithaca,' said he, "'when I was in Crete beyond the seas, and now it seems I have reached it with all these treasures. I have left as much more behind me for my children but am flying because I killed Orsilicus, son of Idomeneus, the fleetest runner in Crete. I killed him because he wanted to rob me of the spoils I had got from Troy with so much trouble and danger both on the field of battle and by the waves of the weary sea. He said I had not served his father loyally at Troy as vassal, but had set myself up as an independent ruler. So I lay in wait for him with one of my followers by the roadside, and speared him as he was coming into town from the country. It was a very dark night, and nobody saw us. It was not known, therefore, that I had killed him. But as soon as I had done so, I went to a ship and besought the owners, who were Phoenicians, to take me on board and set me in Pylos or in Elis, where the Apeans rule, giving them as much spoil as satisfied them. They met no guile, but the wind drove them off their course, and we sailed on till we came hither by night. It was all we could do to get inside the harbour, and none of us said a word about supper though we wanted it badly, but we all went on shore and lay down just as we were. I was very tired and fell asleep directly, so they took my goods out of the ship and placed them beside me where I was lying upon the sand. Then they sailed away to Sidonia, and I was left here in great distress of mind." Such was his story, but Minerva smiled and caressed him with her hand. Then she took the form of a woman, fair, stately, and wise. "'He must be indeed a shifty lying fellow,' said she, "'who could surpass you in all manner of craft even though you had a god for your antagonist. Daredevil that you are, full of guile, unwearying in deceit, can you not drop your tricks and your instinctive falsehood, even now that you are in your own country again? We will say no more, however, about this for we can both of us deceive upon occasion. You are the most accomplished counsellor and orator among all mankind, while I, for diplomacy and subtlety, have no equal among the gods. Did you not know Jove's daughter, Minerva? Me, who have been ever with you, who kept watch over you in all your troubles, and who made the Phaeacians take so great a liking to you. And now again I am come here to talk things over with you, and help you to hide the treasure I made the Phaeacians give you. I want to tell you about the troubles that await you in your own house. You have got to face them, but tell no one, neither man nor woman, that you have come home again. Bear everything, and put up with every man's insolence without a word." 
and Ulysses answered, A man, goddess, may know a great deal, but you are so constantly changing your appearance that when he meets you it is a hard matter for him to know whether it is you or not. This much, however, I know exceedingly well. You were very kind to me as long as we Achaeans were fighting before Troy. But from the day in which we went on board ship after having sacked the city of Priam, and heaven dispersed us, from that day, Minerva, I saw no more of you, and cannot ever remember your coming to my ship to help me in a difficulty. I had to wander on sick and sorry till the gods delivered me from evil and I reached the city of the Phaeacians, where you encouraged me and took me into the town. And now I beseech you in your father's name, tell me the truth, for I do not believe I am really back in Ithaca. I am in some other country, and you are mocking me and deceiving me in all you have been saying. Tell me then truly, have I really got back to my own country? You are always taking something of that sort in your head, replied Minerva, and that is why I cannot desert you in your afflictions. You are so plausible, shrewd, and shifty. Any one but yourself, on returning from so long a voyage, would at once have gone home to see his wife and children. But you do not seem to care about asking after them or hearing any news about them till you have exploited your wife, who remains at home vainly grieving for you and having no peace night or day for the tears she sheds on your behalf. As for my not coming near you, I was never uneasy about you, for I was certain you would get back safely though you would lose all your men, and I did not wish to quarrel with my uncle Neptune, who never forgave you for having blinded his son. I will now, however, point out to you the lie of the land, and you will then perhaps believe me. This is the haven of the old merman Phorcys, and here is the olive tree that grows at the head of it. Near it is the cave sacred to the naiads, here too is the overarching cavern in which you have offered many an acceptable hecatomb to the nymphs, and this is the wooded mountain Neritum. As she spoke the goddess dispersed the mist and the land appeared. Then Ulysses rejoiced at finding himself again in his own land, and kissed the bounteous soil. He lifted up his hands and prayed to the nymphs, saying, Naiad nymphs, daughters of Jove, I made sure that I was never again to see you. Now, therefore, I greet you with all loving salutations, and I will bring you offerings as in the old days, if Jove's redoubtable daughter will grant me life and bring my son to manhood. Take heart and do not trouble yourself about that, rejoined Minerva. Let us rather set about stowing your things at once in the cave, where they will be quite safe. Let us see how we can best manage it all. Therewith she went down into the cave to look for the safest hiding places, while Ulysses brought up all the treasure of gold, bronze, and good clothing which the Phaeacians had given him. They stowed everything carefully away, and Minerva set a stone against the door of the cave. Then the two sat down by the root of the great olive, and consulted how to compass the destruction of the wicked suitors. Ulysses, said Minerva, noble son of Laertes, think how you can lay hands on these disreputable people who have been lording it in your house these three years, courting your wife and making wedding presents to her, while she does nothing but lament your absence, giving hope and sending encouraging messages to every one of them, but meaning the very opposite of all she says. And Ulysses answered, In good truth, goddess, it seems I should have come to much the same bad end in my own house as Agamemnon did, if you had not given me such timely information. Advise me how I shall best avenge myself. Stand by my side, and put your courage into my heart, as on the day when we loosed Troy's fair diadem from her brow. Help me now as you did then, and I will fight three hundred men if you, goddess, will be with me." "'Trust me for that,' said she. I will not lose sight of you when once we set about it, and I imagine that some of those who are devouring your substance will then bespatter the pavement with their blood and brains. I will begin by disguising you so that no human being shall know you. I will cover your body with wrinkles. You shall lose all your yellow hair. I will clothe you in a garment that shall fill all who see it with loathing. I will blear your fine eyes for you and make you an unseemly object in the sight of the suitors, of your wife and of the son whom you left behind you. Then go at once to the swineherd who is in charge of your pigs. 
He has been always well affected towards you, and is devoted to Penelope and your son. You will find him feeding his pigs near the rock that is called Raven, by the fountain Arethusa, where they are fattening on beech-mast and spring-water after their manner. Stay with them and find out how things are going, while I proceed to Sparta and see your son, who is with Menelaus at Lacedaemon, where he has gone to try and find out whether you are still alive. But why, said Ulysses, did you not tell him, for you knew all about it? Did you want him to go sailing about amid all kinds of hardship while others are eating up his estate? Minerva answered, Never mind about him. I sent him that he might be well spoken of for having gone. He is in no sort of difficulty, but is staying quite comfortably with Menelaus, and is surrounded with abundance of every kind. The suitors have put out to sea and are lying in wait for him, for they mean to kill him before he can get home. I do not much think they will succeed, but rather that some of those who are now eating up your estate will first find a grave themselves." As she spoke, Minerva touched him with her wand and covered him with wrinkles, took away all his yellow hair, and withered the flesh over his whole body. She bleared his eyes, which were naturally very fine ones. She changed his clothes and threw an old rag of a wrap about him, and a tunic, tattered, filthy, and begrimed with smoke. She also gave him an undressed deerskin as an outer garment, and furnished him with a staff and a wallet all in holes, with a twisted thong for him to sling it over his shoulder. When the pair had thus laid their plans they parted, and the goddess went straight to Lacedaemon to fetch Telemachus. End of Book Thirteen Book Fourteen of the Odyssey by Homer, translated by Samuel Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Odyssey, Book Fourteen. Ulysses in the Hut with Eumaeus. Ulysses now left the haven and took the rough track up through the wooded country and over the crest of the mountain, till he reached the place where Minerva had said that he would find the swineherd, who was the most thrifty servant he had. He found him sitting in front of his hut, which was by the yards that he had built on a site which could be seen from far. He had made them spacious and fair to see, with a free run for the pigs all round them. He had built them during his master's absence, of stones which he had gathered out of the ground, without saying anything to Penelope or Laertes, and he had fenced them on top with thorn-bushes. Outside the yard, he had run a strong fence of oaken posts, split and set pretty close together, while inside he had built twelve styes near one another for the sows to lie in. There were fifty pigs wallowing in each sty, all of them breeding sows. But the boars slept outside and were much fewer in number, for the suitors kept on eating them, and the swineherd had to send them the best he had continually. There were three hundred and sixty boar pigs, and the herdsman's four hounds, which were as fierce as wolves, slept always with them. The swineherd was at that moment cutting out a pair of sandals from a good stout oxhide. Three of his men were out herding the pigs in one place or another, and he had sent the fourth to town with a boar that he had been forced to send the suitors that they might sacrifice it and have their fill of meat. When the hounds saw Ulysses they set up a furious barking and flew at him but Ulysses was cunning enough to sit down and loose his hold of the stick that he had in his hand. Still he would have been torn by them in his own homestead had not the swineherd dropped his oxhide, rushed full speed through the gate of the yard, and driven the dogs off by shouting and throwing stones at them. Then he said to Ulysses, "'Old man, the dogs were likely to have made short work of you, and then you would have got me into trouble.' The gods have given me quite enough worries without that, for I have lost the best of masters, and am in continual grief on his account. I have to attend swine for other people to eat, while he, if he yet lives to see the light of day, is starving in some distant land. But come inside, and when you have had your fill of bread and wine, tell me where you come from and all about your misfortunes." On this the swineherd led the way into the hut and bade him sit down. He strewed a good thick bed of rushes upon the floor, and on top of this he threw a shaggy chamois skin, a great thick one, on which he used to sleep by night. 
Ulysses was pleased at being made thus welcome, and said, May Jove, sir, and the rest of the gods grant you your heart's desire in return for the kind way in which you have received me. To this you answered, O swineherd Eumaeus, Stranger, though a still poorer man should come here, it would not be right for me to insult him, for all strangers and beggars are from Jove. You must take what you can get and be thankful, for servants live in fear when they have young lords for their masters, and this is my misfortune now, for heaven has hindered the return of him who would have been always good to me, and given me something of my own, a house, a piece of land, a good-looking wife, and all else that a liberal master allows a servant who has worked hard for him, and whose labor the gods have prospered as they have mine in the situation which I hold. If my master had grown old here, he would have done great things by me. But he is gone, and I wish that Helen's whole race were utterly destroyed, for she has been the death of many a good man. It was this matter that took my master to Ilius, the land of noble steeds, to fight the Trojans in the cause of King Agamemnon. As he spoke, he bound his girdle round him and went to the styes where the young sucking pigs were penned. He picked out two which he brought back with him and sacrificed. He singed them, cut them up, and spitted them. When the meat was cooked, he brought it all in and set it before Ulysses, hot and still on the spit, whereon Ulysses sprinkled it over with white barley meal. The swineherd then mixed wine in a bowl of ivy wood, and taking a seat opposite Ulysses, told him to begin. Fall to, stranger, said he, on a dish of servant's pork. The fat pigs have to go to the suitors, who eat them up without shame or scruple. But the blessed gods love not such shameful doings, and respect those who do what is lawful and right. Even the fierce freebooters who go raiding on other people's land, and Jove gives them their spoil, even they, when they have filled their ships and got home again, live conscience-stricken, and look fearfully for judgment. But some god seems to have told these people that Ulysses is dead and gone. They will not, therefore, go back to their own homes and make their offers of marriage in the usual way, but waste his estate by force, without fear or stint. Not a day or night comes out of heaven, but they sacrifice not one victim, nor two only, and they take the run of his wine, for he was exceedingly rich. No other great man either in Ithaca or on the mainland is as rich as he was. He had as much as twenty men put together. I will tell you what he had. There are twelve herds of cattle upon the mainland, and as many flocks of sheep. There are also twelve droves of pigs, while his own men and hired strangers feed him twelve widely spreading herds of goats. Here in Ithaca he runs even large flocks of goats on the far end of the island, and they are in the charge of excellent goat herds. Each one of these sends the suitors the best goat in the flock every day. As for myself, I am in charge of the pigs that you see here, and I have to keep picking out the best I have and sending it to them." This was his story, but Ulysses went on eating and drinking ravenously without a word, brooding his revenge. When he had eaten enough and was satisfied, the swineherd took the bowl from him which he usually drank, filled it with wine, and gave it to Ulysses, who was pleased, and said as he took it in his hands, "'My friend, who was the master of yours that brought you and paid for you, so rich and so powerful as you tell me? You say he perished in the cause of King Agamemnon. Tell me who he was, in case I may have met with such a person. Jove and the other gods know, but I may be able to give you news of him, for I have travelled much." Eumaeus answered, Old man, no traveller who comes here with news will get Ulysses' wife and son to believe his story. Nevertheless, tramps in want of a lodging keep coming with their mouths full of lies, and not a word of truth. Every one who finds his way to Ithaca goes to my mistress and tells her falsehoods, whereon she takes them in, makes much of them, and asks them all manner of questions, crying all the time as women will when they have lost their husbands. And you too, old man, for a shirt and a cloak would doubtless make up a very pretty story but the wolves and birds of prey have long since torn Ulysses to pieces, or the fishes of the sea have eaten him, and his bones are lying buried deep in sand upon some foreign shore. He is dead and gone, and a bad business it is for all his friends, for me especially. 
Go where I may, I shall never find so good a master, not even if I were to go home to my mother and father, where I was bred and born. I do not so much care, however, about my parents now, though I should dearly like to see them again in my own country. It is the loss of Ulysses that grieves me most. I cannot speak of him without reverence, though he is here no longer, for he was very fond of me, and took such care of me that, wherever he may be, I shall always honor his memory." "'My friend,' replied Ulysses, "'you are very positive, and very hard of belief about your master's coming home again. Nevertheless, I will not merely say, but will swear, that he is coming. Do not give me anything for my news till he has actually come. You may then give me a shirt and cloak of good wear, if you will. I am in great want, but I will not take anything at all till then. For I hate a man, even as I hate hell-fire, who lets his poverty tempt him into lying. I swear by King Jove, by the rights of hospitality, and by that hearth of Ulysses to which I have now come, that all will surely happen as I have said it will. Ulysses will return in this self-same year. With the end of this moon and the beginning of the next, he will be here to do vengeance on all those who are ill-treating his wife and son. To this you answered, O swineherd Eumaeus, Old man, you will neither get paid for bringing good news, nor will Ulysses ever come home. Drink your wine in peace, and let us talk about something else. Do not keep on reminding me of all this. It always pains me when anyone speaks about my honored master. As for your oath, we will let it alone. But I only wish he may come, as do Penelope, his old father Laertes, and his son Telemachus. I am terribly unhappy, too, about this same boy of his. He was running up fast into manhood, and bade fair to be no worse man, face and figure, than his father. But someone, either God or man, has been unsettling his mind, so he has gone off to Pylos to try and get news of his father. And the suitors are lying in wait of him as he is coming home, in the hope of leaving the house of Arsaceus without a name in Ithaca. But let us say no more about him and leave him to be taken, or else to escape if the son of Saturn holds his hand over him to protect him. And now, old man, tell me your own story. Tell me also, for I want to know, who you are and where you come from. Tell me of your town and parents, what manner of ship you came in, how crew brought you to Ithaca, and from what country they profess to come, for you cannot have come by land. And Ulysses answered, I will tell you all about it. If there were meat and wine enough, and we could stay here in the hut with nothing to do but to eat and drink while the others go to their work, I could easily talk on for a whole twelve months without ever finishing the story of the sorrows with which it has pleased heaven to visit me. I am by birth a Cretan. My father was a well-to-do man, who had many sons born in marriage, whereas I was the son of a slave whom he had purchased for a concubine. Nevertheless, my father Castor, son of Hylax, whose lineage I claim, and who was held in the highest honor among the Cretans for his wealth, prosperity, and the valor of his sons, put me on the same level with my brothers who had been born in wedlock. When, however, death took him to the house of Hades, his sons divided his estate and cast lots for their shares, but to me they gave a holding and little else. Nevertheless, my valor enabled me to marry into a rich family, for I was not given to bragging or shirking on the field of battle. It is all over now. Still, if you look at the straw, you can see what the ear is, for I have had trouble enough and to spare. Mars and Minerva made me doughty in war. When I picked my men to surprise the enemy with an ambuscade, I never gave death so much as a thought but was the first to leap forward and spear all whom I could overtake. Such was I in battle, but I did not care about farm work, nor the frugal home life of those who would bring up children. My delight was in ships, fighting, javelins, and arrows, things that most men shudder to think of. But one man likes one thing, and another another, and this was what I was most naturally inclined to. Before the Achaeans went to Troy, Nine times was I in command of men and ships on foreign service, and I amassed much wealth. 
I had my pick of the spoil in the first instance, and much more was allotted to me later on. My house grew apace, and I became a great man among the Cretans. But when Jove counseled that terrible expedition in which so many perished, the people required me and Idomeneus to lead their ships to Troy. And there was no way out of it, for they insisted on our doing so. There we fought for nine whole years. But in the tenth we sacked the city of Priam and sailed home again as heaven dispersed us. Then it was that Jove devised evil against me. I spent but one month happily with my children, wife, and property, and then I conceived the idea of making a descent on Egypt, so I fitted out a fine fleet and manned it. I had nine ships, and the people flocked to fill them. For six days I and my men made feast, and I found them many victims both for sacrifice to the gods and for themselves. But on the seventh day we went on board and set sail from Crete with a fair north wind behind us, though we were going down a river. Nothing went ill with any of our ships, and we had no sickness on board, but sat where we were and let the ships go as the wind and steersman took them. On the fifth day we reached the river Egyptus. There I stationed my ships in the river, bidding my men stay by them and keep guard over them while I sent out scouts to reconnoiter from every point of vantage. But the men disobeyed my orders, took to their own devices, and ravaged the land of the Egyptians, killing the men and taking their wives and children captive. The alarm was soon carried to the city, and when they heard the war cry, the people came out at daybreak till the plain was filled with horsemen and foot soldiers, and with the gleam of armor. Then Jove spread panic among my men, and they would no longer face the enemy, for they found themselves surrounded. The Egyptians killed many of us, and took the rest alive to do forced labor for them. Jove, however, put it in my mind to do thus, and I wish I had died then and there in Egypt instead, for there was much sorrow in store for me. I took off my helmet and shield and dropped my spear from my hand. Then I went straight up to the king's chariot, clasped his knees and kissed them, whereon he spared my life, bade me get into his chariot, and took me weeping to his own home. Many made at me with their ashen spears and tried to kill me in their fury, but the king protected me, for he feared the wrath of Jove, the protector of strangers, who punishes those who do evil. I stayed there for seven years and got together much money among the Egyptians, for they all gave me something. But when it was now going on for eight years there came a certain Phoenician, a cunning rascal, who had already committed all sorts of villainy and this man talked me over into going with him to Phoenicia, where his house and possessions lay. I stayed there for a whole twelve months, but at the end of that time, when months and days had gone by till the same season had come round again, he sent me on board a ship bound for Libya, on a pretense that I was to take a cargo along with him to that place, but really that he might sell me as a slave and take the money I fetched. I suspected his intention but went on board with him, for I could not help it. The ship ran before a fresh north wind till we had reached the sea that lies between Crete and Libya. There, however, Jove counseled their destruction, for as soon as we were well out from Crete and could see nothing but sea and sky, he raised a black cloud over our ship, and the sea grew dark beneath it. Then Jove let fly with his thunderbolts, and the ship went round and round and was filled with fire and brimstone as the lightning struck it. The men fell all into the sea. They were carried about in the water round the ship looking like so many seagulls. But the god presently deprived them all chance of getting home again. I was all dismayed. Jove, however, set the ship's mast within my reach, which saved my life, for I clung to it and drifted before the fury of the gale. Nine days did I drift, but in the darkness of the tenth night a great wave bore me on to the Thesprotian coast. There Phaedon, king of the Thesprotians, entertained me hospitably without charging me anything at all, for his son found me when I was nearly dead with cold and fatigue, whereon he raised me by the hand, took me to his father's house, and gave me clothes to wear. There it was that I heard news of Ulysses, for the king told me he had entertained him, and shown him much hospitality while he was on his homeward journey. He showed me also the treasure of gold and wrought iron that Ulysses had got together. 
There was enough to keep his family for ten generations, so much had he left in the house of King Phaedon. But the king said Ulysses had gone to Dodona that he might learn Jove's mind from the god's high oak tree, and know whether after so long an absence he should return to Ithaca openly or in secret. Moreover, the king swore in my presence, making drink offerings in his own house as he did so, that the ship was by the waterside, and the crew found, that should take him to his own country. He sent me off, however, before Ulysses returned, for there happened to be a Thesprotian ship sailing for the wheat-growing island of Dulichium, and he told those in charge of her to be sure and take me safely to King Acastus. These men hatched a plot against me that would have reduced me to the very extreme of misery, for when the ship had got some way out from the land they resolved on selling me as a slave. They stripped me of the shirt and cloak that I was wearing, and gave me instead the tattered old clouts in which you now see me. Then, towards nightfall, they reached the tilled lands of Ithaca, and there they bound me with a strong rope fast in the ship, while they went on shore to get supper by the seaside. But the gods soon undid my bonds for me, and having drawn my rags over my head I slid down the rudder into the sea, where I struck out and swam till I was well clear of them, and came ashore near a thick wood in which I lay concealed. They were very angry at my having escaped, and went searching about for me, till at last they thought it was no further use and went back to their ship. The gods, having hidden me thus easily, then took me to a good man's door, for it seems that I am not to die yet a while. To this you answered, O swineherd Eumaeus, Poor unhappy stranger! I have found the story of your misfortunes extremely interesting, but that part about Ulysses is not right and you will never get me to believe it. Why should a man like you go about telling lies in this way? I know all about the return of my master. The gods one and all of them detest him, or they would have taken him before Troy or let him die with friends around him when the days of his fighting were done. For then the Achaeans would have built a mound over his ashes, and his son would have been heir to his renown, but now the storm-winds have spirited him away and we know not whither. As for me, I live out of the way here with the pigs, and never go to the town unless when Penelope sends for me on the arrival of some news about Ulysses. Then they all sit round and ask questions, both those who grieve over the king's absence and those who rejoice at it because they can eat up his property without paying for it. For my own part, I have never cared about asking anyone else since the time when I was taken in by an Aetolian, who had killed a man and come a long way till at last he reached my station, and I was very kind to him. He said he had seen Ulysses with Idomeneus among the Cretans, refitting his ships which had been damaged in a gale. He said Ulysses would return in the following summer or autumn with his men, and that he would bring back much wealth and now you, you unfortunate old man, since fate has brought you to my door, do not try to flatter me in this way with vain hopes. It is not for any such reason that I shall treat you kindly, but only out of respect for Jove the god of hospitality, as fearing him and pitying you." Ulysses answered, "'I see that you are of an unbelieving mind. I have given you my oath, and yet you will not credit me. Let us then make a bargain, and call all the gods in heaven to witness it. If your master comes home, give me the cloak and shirt of good wear, and send me to Delicium where I want to go. But if he does not come as I say he will, set your men on to me, and tell them to throw me from yonder precipice, as a warning to tramps not to go about the country telling lies." "'And a pretty figure I should cut then,' replied Eumaeus, both now and hereafter if I were to kill you after receiving you into my hut and showing you hospitality. I should have to say my prayers in good earnest if I did. But it is supper-time, and I hope my men will come in directly that we may cook something savory for supper." Thus did they converse, and presently the swineherds came up with the pigs, which were then shut up for the night in their sties, and a tremendous squealing they made as they were being driven into them. But Eumaeus called to his men and said, Bring in the best pig you have, that I may sacrifice him for this stranger, and we will take toll of him ourselves. We have had trouble enough this long time feeding pigs, while others reap the fruit of our labor." Of this he began chopping firewood, 
while the others brought in a fine fat five-year-old boar pig and set it at the altar. Eumaeus did not forget the gods, for he was a man of good principles, so the first thing he did was to cut bristles from the pig's face and throw them into the fire, praying to all the gods as he did so that Ulysses might return home again. Then he clubbed the pig with a billet of oak which he had kept back when he was chopping the firewood and stunned it, while the others slaughtered and singed it. Then they cut it up, and Eumaeus began by putting raw pieces from each joint onto some of the fat. These he sprinkled with barley meal and laid upon the embers. They cut the rest of the meat up small, put the pieces upon the spits and roasted them till they were done. When they had taken them off the spits they threw them onto the dresser in a heap. The swineherd, who was a most equitable man, then stood up to give every one his share. He made seven portions. One of these he set apart for Mercury, the son of Maya and the nymphs, praying to them as he did so. The others he dealt out to the men man by man. He gave Ulysses some slices cut lengthways down the loin as a mark of especial honour, and Ulysses was much pleased. "'I hope, Eumaeus,' said he, "'that Jove will be as well disposed towards you as I am, for the respect you are showing to an outcast like myself.' To this you answered, O swineherd Eumaeus, "'Eat, my good fellow, and enjoy your supper, such as it is. God grants this and withholds that, just as he thinks right, for he can do whatever he chooses." As he spoke he cut off the first piece and offered it as a burnt sacrifice to the immortal gods. Then he made them a drink-offering, put the cup in the hands of Ulysses, and sat down to his own portion. Mesolius brought them their bread. The swineherd had brought this man on his own account from among the Taphians during his master's absence, and had paid for him with his own money without saying anything either to his mistress or Laertes. Then they laid their hands upon the good things that were before them. And when they had had enough to eat and drink, Mesaulius took away what was left of the bread, and they all went to bed after having made a hearty supper. Now the night came on stormy and very dark, for there was no moon. It poured without ceasing, and the wind blew strong from the west, which is a wet quarter, so Ulysses thought he would see whether Eumaeus, in the excellent care he took of him, would take off his own cloak and give it him, or make one of his men give him one. "'Listen to me,' said he, "'Eumaeus and the rest of you, when I have said a prayer I will tell you something. It is the wine that makes me talk in this way. Wine will make even a wise man fall to singing. It will make him chuckle and dance and say many a word that he had better leave unspoken. Still, as I have begun, I will go on. Would that I were still young and strong as when we got up an ambuscade before Troy. Menelaus and Ulysses were the leaders, but I was in command also, for the other two would have it so. When we had come up to the wall of the city we crouched down beneath our armour and lay there under cover of the reeds and thick brushwood that grew about the swamp. It came on to freeze with a north wind blowing. The snow fell small and fine like hoar-frost, and our shields were coated thick with rime. The others had all got cloaks and shirts, and slept comfortably enough with their shields about their shoulders, but I had carelessly left my cloak behind me, not thinking that I should be too cold, and had gone off in nothing but my shirt and shield. When the night was two-thirds through and the stars had shifted their places, I nudged Ulysses who was close to me with my elbow, and he at once gave me his ear. Ulysses, said I, this cold will be the death of me, for I have no cloak. Some god fooled me into setting off with nothing on but my shirt, and I do not know what to do. Ulysses, who was as crafty as he was valiant, hit upon the following plan. Keep still, said he in a low voice, or the others will hear you. Then he raised his head on his elbow. My friends, said he, I have had a dream from heaven in my sleep. We are a long way from the ships. I wish someone would go down and tell Agamemnon to send us up more men at once. On this Thoas, son of Adraemon, threw off his cloak and set out running to the ships, whereon I took the cloak and lay in it comfortably enough till morning. Would that I were still young and strong as I was in those days, for then some one of you swineherds would give me a cloak both out of good will and for the respect due to a brave soldier. But now people look down upon me because my clothes are shabby." And Eumaeus answered, 
Old man, you have told us an excellent story, and have said nothing so far but what is quite satisfactory. For the present, therefore, you shall want neither clothing nor anything else that a stranger in distress may reasonably expect, but to-morrow morning you have to shake your own old rags about your body again, for we have not many spare cloaks nor shirts up here, but every man has only one. When Ulysses' son comes home again, he will give you both cloak and shirt, and send you wherever you may want to go." With this he got up and made a bed for Ulysses by throwing some goatskins and sheepskins on the ground in front of the fire. Here Ulysses lay down, and Eumaeus covered him over with a great heavy cloak that he kept for a change in case of extraordinarily bad weather. Thus did Ulysses sleep, and the young men slept beside him. But the swineherd did not like sleeping away from his pigs, so he got ready to go outside, and Ulysses was glad to see that he looked after his property during his master's absence. First he slung his sword over his brawny shoulders, and put on a thick cloak to keep out the wind. He also took the skin of a large and well-fed goat, and a javelin in case of attack from men or dogs. Thus equipped, he went to his rest where the pigs were camping under an overhanging rock that gave them shelter from the north wind. End of Book Fourteen Book Fifteen of the Odyssey by Homer, translated by Samuel Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Odyssey, Book Fifteen. Minerva summons Telemachus from Lacedaemon. He meets with Theoclymenus at Pylos and brings him to Ithaca. On landing, he goes to the hut of Eumaeus. But Minerva went to the fair city of Lacedaemon to tell Ulysses' son that he was to return at once. She found him and Pisistratus sleeping in the forecourt of Menelaus's house. Pisistratus was fast asleep, but Telemachus could get no rest all night for thinking of his unhappy father, so Minerva went close up to him and said, Telemachus, you should not remain so far away from home any longer, nor leave your property with such dangerous people in your house. They will eat up everything you have among them, and you will have been on a fool's errand. Ask Menelaus to send you home at once if you wish to find your excellent mother still there when you get back. Her father and brothers are already urging her to marry Eurymachus, who has given her more than any of the others, and has been greatly increasing his wedding presents. I hope nothing valuable may be taken from the house in spite of you, but you know what women are. They always want to do the best they can for the man who marries them, and never give another thought to the children of their first husband, nor to their father either when he is dead and done with. Go home, therefore, and put everything in charge of the most respectable woman-servant that you have, until it shall please heaven to send you a wife of your own. Let me tell you also of another matter which you had better attend to. The chief men among the suitors are lying in wait for you in the strait between Ithaca and Samos, and they mean to kill you before you can reach home. I do not much think they will succeed. It is more likely that some of those who are now eating up your property will find a grave themselves. Sail night and day, and keep your ship well away from the islands. The god who watches over you and protects you will send you a fair wind. As soon as you get to Ithaca, send your ship and men on to the town, but yourself go straight to the swineherd who has charge of your pigs. He is well disposed towards you. Stay with him, therefore, for the night, and then send him to Penelope to tell her that you have got back safe from Pylos. Then she went back to Olympus, but Telemachus stirred Pisistratus with his heel to rouse him, and said, Wake up, Pisistratus, and yoke the horses to the chariot, for we must set off home. But Pisistratus said, No matter what hurry we are in, we cannot drive in the dark. It will be morning soon. Wait till Menelaus has brought his presents and put them in the chariot for us, and then let him say good-bye to us in the usual way. So long as he lives a guest should never forget a host who has shown him kindness." As he spoke day began to break, and Menelaus, who had already risen, leaving Helen in bed, came towards them. When Telemachus saw him he put on his shirt as fast as he could, threw a great cloak over his shoulders, and went out to meet him. "'Menelaus,' said he, "'let me go back now to my own country, for I want to go home.' And Menelaus answered, "'Telemachus, if you insist on going, I will not detain you. 
I do not like to see a host either too fond of his guest or too rude to him. Moderation is best in all things, and not letting a man go when he wants to do so is as bad as telling him to go if he would like to stay. One should treat a guest well as long as he is in the house and speed him when he wants to leave it. Wait, then, till I get your beautiful presents into your chariot, until you have yourself seen them. I will tell the women to prepare a sufficient dinner for you of what there may be in the house. It will be at once more proper and cheaper for you to get your dinner before setting out on such a long journey. If, moreover, you have a fancy for making a tour in Hellas or in the Peloponnese, I will yoke my horses and will conduct you myself through all our principal cities. No one will send us away empty-handed, every one will give us something, a bronze tripod, a couple of mules, or a gold cup." Menelaus, replied Telemachus, I want to go home at once, for when I came away I left my property without protection, and fear that while looking for my father I shall come to ruin myself, or find that something valuable has been stolen during my absence. When Menelaus heard this, he immediately told his wife and servants to prepare a sufficient dinner from what there might be in the house. At this moment Etionius joined him, for he lived close by and had just got up. So Menelaus told him to light the fire and cook some meat, which he at once did. Then Menelaus went down into his fragrant storeroom, not alone, but Helen went too, with Megapenthes. When he reached the place where the treasures of his house were kept, he selected a double cup and told his son Megapenthes to bring also a silver mixing-bowl. Meanwhile Helen went to the chest where she kept the lovely dresses which she had made with her own hands, and took out one that was largest and most beautifully enriched with embroidery. It glittered like a star and lay at the very bottom of the chest. Then they all came back through the house again till they got to Telemachus, and Menelaus said, Telemachus, may Jove, the mighty husband of Juno, bring you safely home according to your desire. I will now present you with the finest and most precious piece of plate in all my house. It is a mixing-bowl of pure silver, except the rim, which is inlaid with gold, and is the work of Vulcan. Phidemus, king of the Sidonians, made me a present of it in the course of a visit that I paid him while I was on my return home. I should like to give it to you." With these words he placed the double cup in the hands of Telemachus, while Megapenthes brought the beautiful mixing-bowl and set it before him. Hard by stood lovely Helen with the robe ready in her hand. I too, my son, said she, have something for you as a keepsake from the hand of Helen. It is for your bride to wear upon her wedding day. Till then, get your dear mother to keep it for you, thus may you go back rejoicing to your own country and to your home. So saying, she gave the robe over to him and he received it gladly. Then Pisistratus put the presents into the chariot and admired them all as he did so. Presently Menelaus took Telemachus and Pisistratus into the house, and they both of them sat down to table. A maidservant brought them water in a beautiful golden ewer, and poured it into a silver basin for them to wash their hands, and she drew a clean table beside them. An upper servant brought them bread and offered them many good things of what there was in the house. Etionius carved the meat and gave them each their portions, while Megapenthes poured out the wine. Then they laid their hands upon the good things that were before them. But as soon as they had had enough to eat and drink, Telemachus and Pisistratus yoked the horses and took their places in the chariot. They drove out through the inner gateway and under the echoing gatehouse of the outer court, and Menelaus came after them with a golden goblet of wine in his right hand that they might make a drink-offering before they set out. He stood in front of the horses and pledged them, saying, Farewell to both of you. See that you tell Nestor how I have treated you for he was as kind to me as any father could be while we Achaeans were fighting before Troy. We will be sure, sir, answered Telemachus, to tell him everything as soon as we see him. I wish I were as certain of finding Ulysses returned when I get back to Ithaca, that I might tell him of the very great kindness you have shown me, and of the many beautiful presents I am taking with me. As he was thus speaking, a bird flew on his right hand, an eagle with a great white goose in its talons which it had carried off from the farmyard. And all the men and women were running after it and shouting. It came quite close up to them and flew away on their right hands in front of the horses. When they saw it they were glad, and their hearts took comfort with them. Whereon Pisistratus said, Tell me, Menelaus, has heaven sent this omen for us or for you? 
Menelaus was thinking what would be the most proper answer for him to make, but Helen was too quick for him and said, I will read this matter as heaven has put it in my heart, and as I doubt not that it will come to pass. The eagle came from the mountain where it was bred, and has its nest, and in like manner Ulysses, after having travelled far and suffered much, will return to take his revenge, if indeed he is not back already and hatching mischief for the suitors. May Jove so grant it, replied Telemachus. If it should prove to be so, I will make vows to you as though you were a god, even when I am at home." As he spoke, he lashed his horses and they started off at full speed through the town towards the open country. They swayed the yoke upon their necks and travelled the whole day long, till the sun set and darkness was over the land. Then they reached Ferry, where Diocles lived who was son of Ortilicus, the son of Alpheus. There they passed the night and were treated hospitably. When the child of morning, rosy-fingered dawn appeared, they again yoked their horses and their places in the chariot. They drove out through the inner gateway and under the echoing gatehouse of the outer court. Then Pisistratus lashed his horses on and they flew forward nothing loath. Ere long they came to Pylos and then Telemachus said, Pisistratus, I hope you will promise to do what I am going to ask you. You know our fathers were old friends before us. Moreover, we are both of an age, and this journey has brought us together still more closely. Do not, therefore, take me past my ship, but leave me there, for if I go to your father's house he will try to keep me in the warmth of his good will towards me, and I must go home at once." Pisistratus thought how he should do as he was asked, and in the end he deemed it best to turn his horses towards the ship, and put Menelaus's beautiful presence of gold and raiment in the stern of the vessel. Then he said, Go on board at once and tell your men to do so also before I can reach home to tell my father. I know how obstinate he is and am sure he will not let you go. He will come down here to fetch you, and he will not go back without you, but he will be very angry. With this he drove his goodly steeds back to the city of the Pylians and soon reached his home, but Telemachus called the men together and gave his orders. Now, my men, said he, get everything in order on board the ship, and let us set out home." Thus did he speak, and they went on board even as he had said. But as Telemachus was thus busied, praying also and sacrificing to Minerva in the ship's stern, there came to him a man from a distant country, a seer, who was flying from Argos because he had killed a man. He was descended from Melampus, who used to live in Pylos, the land of sheep. He was rich and owned a great house but he was driven into exile by the great and powerful King Nellius. Nellius seized his goods and held them for a whole year, during which he was a close prisoner in the house of King Philicus, and in much distress of mind both on account of the daughter of Nellius and because he was haunted by a great sorrow that dread Erinnes had laid upon him. In the end, however, he escaped with his life, drove the cattle from Philais to Pylos, avenged the wrong that had been done him and gave the daughter of Nellius to his brother. Then he left the country and went to Argos, where it was ordained that he should reign over much people. There he married, established himself, and had two famous sons, Antiphates and Mantius. Antiphates became father of Oecleus, and Oecleus of Amphiraeus, who was dearly loved both by Jove and by Apollo, but he did not live to an old age, for he was killed in Thebes by reason of a woman's gifts. His sons were Alcmion and Amphilochus. Mantius, the other son of Melampus, was father to Polyphades and Cleitus. Aurora, throned in gold, carried off Cleitus for his beauty's sake, that he might dwell among the immortals. But Apollo made Polyphades the greatest seer in the whole world, now that Amphiarius was dead. He quarrelled with his father and went to live in Hyperesia, where he remained and prophesied for all men. His son, Theoclymenus it was, who now came up to Telemachus as he was making drink-offerings and praying in his ship. Friend, said he, now that I find you sacrificing in this place, I beseech you by your sacrifices themselves and by the God to whom you make them. I pray you also by your own head and by those of your followers tell me the truth and nothing but the truth. Who and whence are you? Tell me also of your town and parents. Telemachus said, I will answer you quite truly. I am from Ithaca, and my father is Ulysses, as surely as that he ever lived. But he has come to some miserable end, 
Therefore I have taken this ship and got my crew together to see if I can hear any news of him, for he has been away a long time." "'I, too,' answered Theoclymenus, "'am an exile, for I have killed a man of my own race. He has many brothers and kinsmen in Argos, and they have great power among the Argives. I am flying to escape death at their hands, and am thus doomed to be a wanderer on the face of the earth. I am your suppliant. Take me, therefore, on board your ship, that they may not kill me, for I know they are in pursuit." "'I will not refuse you,' replied Telemachus, "'if you wish to join us. Come, therefore, and in Ithaca we will treat you hospitably according to what we have.' On this he received the in a spear and laid it down on the deck of the ship. He went on board and sat in the stern, bidding Theoclymenus sit beside him. Then the men let go the hawsers. Telemachus told them to catch hold of the ropes, and they made all haste to do so. They set the mast in its socket in the cross-plank, raised it and made it fast with the forestays, and they hoisted their white sails with sheets of twisted oxhide. Minerva sent them a fair wind that blew fresh and strong to take the ship on her course as fast as possible. Thus then they passed by Cruni and Chalcis. Presently the sun set and darkness was over all the land. The vessel made a quick passage to Phia and thence on to Elis, where the Apeans rule. Telemachus then headed her for the flying islands, wondering within himself whether he should escape death or should be taken prisoner. Meanwhile Ulysses and the swineherd were eating their supper in the hut, and the men supped with them. As soon as they had had to eat and drink, Ulysses began trying to prove the swineherd and see whether he would continue to treat him kindly, and ask him to stay on at the station or pack him off to the city. So he said, "'Eumaeus and all of you, tomorrow I want to go away and begin begging about the town, so as to be no more trouble to you or to your men. Give me your advice, therefore, and let me have a good guide to go with me and show me the way.' I will go round of the city begging, as I needs must, to see if any one will give me a drink and a piece of bread. I should like also to go to the house of Ulysses and bring news of her husband to Queen Penelope. I could then go about among the suitors and see if out of all their abundance they will give me a dinner. I should soon make them an excellent servant in all sorts of ways. Listen and believe when I tell you that by the blessing of Mercury, who gives grace and good name to the works of all men, there is no one living who would make a more handy servant than I should, to put fresh wood on the fire, chop fuel, carve, cook, pour out wine, and do all those services that poor men have to do for their betters." The swineherd was very much disturbed when he heard this. "'Heaven help me!' he exclaimed. "'Whatever can have put such a notion as that into your head? If you go near the suitors, you will be undone to a certainty for their pride and insolence reach the very heavens. They would never think of taking a man like you for a servant. Their servants are all young men, well-dressed, wearing good cloaks and shirts, with well-looking faces and their hair always tidy. The tables are kept quite clean and are loaded with bread, meat, and wine. Stay where you are, then. You are not in anybody's way. I do not mind your being here. No more do any of the others and when Telemachus comes home he will give you a shirt and cloak and will send you wherever you want to go." Ulysses answered, "'I hope you may be as clear to the gods as you are to me, for having saved me from going about and getting into trouble. There is nothing worse than being always on the tramp. Still, when men have once got low down in the world they will go through a great deal on behalf of their miserable bellies. Since, however, you press me to stay here and await the return of Telemachus, Tell me about Ulysses' mother, and his father whom he left on the threshold of old age when he set out for Troy. Are they still living, or are they already dead and in the house of Hades?" "'I will tell you all about them,' replied Eumaeus. Laertes is still living and prays heaven to let him depart peacefully in his own house, for he is terribly distressed about the absence of his son, and also about the death of his wife, which grieved him greatly and aged him more than anything else did. She came to an unhappy end through sorrow for her son. May no friend or neighbor who has dealt kindly by me come to such an end as she did. As long as she was still living, though she was always grieving, I used to like seeing her and asking her how she did, for she brought me up along with her daughter Timony, the youngest of her children. We were boy and girl together, 
and she made little difference between us. When, however, we both grew up, they sent Timothy to Sami and received a splendid dowry for her. As for me, my mistress gave me a good shirt and cloak with a pair of sandals for my feet, and sent me off into the country, but she was just as fond of me as ever. This is all over now. Still, it has pleased heaven to prosper my work in the situation which I now hold. I have enough to eat and drink, and can find something for any respectable stranger that comes here. But there is no getting a kind word or deed out of my mistress, for the house has fallen into the hands of wicked people. Servants want sometimes to see their mistress and have a talk with her. They like to have something to eat and drink at the house, and something, too, to take back with them into the country. This is what will keep servants in a good humor." Ulysses answered, "'Then you must have been a very little fellow, Eumaeus, when you were taken so far away from your home and parents. Tell me, and tell me true, was the city in which your father and mother lived sacked and pillaged, or did some enemies carry you off when you were alone tending sheep or cattle, ship you off here, and sell you for whatever your master gave them?" "'Stranger,' replied Eumaeus, "'as regards your question, sit still, make yourself comfortable, drink your wine, and listen to me. The nights are now at their longest. There is plenty of time both for sleeping and sitting up talking together. You ought not to go to bed till bedtime. Too much sleep is as bad as too little. If any one of the others wishes to go to bed, let him leave us and do so. He can then take my master's pigs out when he has done breakfast in the morning. We two will sit here eating and drinking in the hut, and telling one another stories about our misfortunes. For when a man has suffered much, and been buffeted about in the world, he takes pleasure in recalling the memory of sorrows that have gone by. As regards your question, then, my tale is as follows. You may have heard of an island called Syra that lives over above Ortigia, where the land begins to turn round and look in another direction. It is not very thickly peopled, but the soil is good, with much pasture fit for cattle and sheep, and it abounds with wine and wheat. Darth never comes there, nor are the people plagued by any sickness. But when they grow old, Apollo comes with Diana and kills them with his painless shafts. It contains two communities, and the whole country is divided between these two. My father Theseus, son of Orminus, a man comparable to the gods, reigned over both. Now to this place there came some cunning traders from Phoenicia, for the Phoenicians are great mariners, in a ship which they had freighted with gigaws of all kinds. There happened to be a Phoenician woman in my father's house, very tall and comely, and an excellent servant. These scoundrels got hold of her one day when she was washing near their ship, seduced her, and cajoled her in ways that no woman can resist, no matter how good she may be by nature. The man who had seduced her asked her who she was and where she came from, and on this she told him her father's name. "'I come from Sidon,' said she, "'and am daughter to Erebus, a man rolling in wealth. One day, as I was coming into the town from the country, some Taphian pirates seized me and took me here over the sea, where they sold me to the man who owns this house, and he gave them their price for me. The man who had seduced her then said, Would you like to come along with us to see the house of your parents and your parents themselves? They are both alive and are said to be well off. I will do so gladly, answered she if you men will first swear me a solemn oath that you will do me no harm by the way." They all swore as she told them, and when they had completed their oath, the woman said, "'Hush, and if any of your men meets me in the street or at the well, do not let him speak to me, for fear someone should go and tell my master, in which case he would suspect something. He would put me in prison, and would have all of you murdered. Keep your own counsel, therefore. Buy your merchandise as fast as you can, and send me word when you have done loading. I will bring as much gold as I can lay my hands on, and there is something else also that I can do towards paying my fare. I am nurse to the son of the good man of the house, a funny little fellow just able to run about. I will carry him off in your ship, and you will get a great deal of money for him if you take him and sell him in foreign parts." On this she went back to the house. The Phoenicians stayed a whole year till they had loaded their ship with much precious merchandise, and then, when they had got freight enough, they sent to tell the woman. Their messenger, a very cunning fellow, came to my father's house bringing a necklace of gold with amber beads strung among it. 
and while my mother and the servants had it in their hands admiring it and bargaining about it, he made a sign quietly to the woman and then went back to the ship, whereon she took me by the hand and led me out of the house. In the fore part of the house she saw the table set with the cups of guests who had been feasting with my father, as being in attendance on him. These were now all gone to a meeting of the public assembly. So she snatched up three cups and carried them off in the bosom of her dress, while I followed her, for I knew no better. The sun was now set and darkness was over all the land, so we hurried on as fast as we could till we reached the harbour, where the Phoenician ship was lying. When they had got on board they sailed their ways over the sea, taking us with them, and Jove sent them a fair wind. Six days did we sail both night and day, but on the seventh day Diana struck the woman and she fell heavily down into the ship's hold, as though she were a seagull alighting on the water. So they threw her overboard to the seals and fishes, and I was left all sorrowful and alone. Presently the winds and waves took the ship to Ithaca, where Laertes gave sundry of his chattels for me, and thus it was that ever I came to set eyes upon this country. Ulysses answered, Eumaeus, I have heard the story of your misfortunes with the most lively interest and pity, but Jove has given you good as well as evil, for in spite of everything you have a good master, who sees that you always have enough to eat and drink, and you lead a good life, whereas I am still going about begging my way from city to city." Thus did they converse, and they had only a very little time left for sleep, for it was soon daybreak. In the meantime Telemachus and his crew were nearing land, so they loosed the sails, took down the mast, and rowed the ship into the harbour. They cast out their mooring-stones and made fast the hawsers. They then got out upon the seashore, mixed their wine, and got dinner ready. As soon as they had had enough to eat and drink, Telemachus said, "'Take the ship on to the town, but leave me here, for I want to look after the herdsmen on one of my farms. In the evening, when I have seen all I want, I will come down to the city, and tomorrow morning, in return for your trouble, I will give you all a good dinner with meat and wine." Then Theoclymenus said, "'And what, my dear young friend, is to become of me? To whose house among all your chief men am I to repair? Or shall I go straight to your own house and to your mother?' "'At any other time,' replied Telemachus, "'I should have bidden you to go to my own house, for you would find no want of hospitality. At the present moment, however, you would not be comfortable there, for I shall be away, and my mother will not see you. She does not often show herself even to the suitors, but sits at her loom weaving in an upper chamber, out of their way. But I can tell you a man whose house you can go to. I mean Eurymachus, son of Polybus, who is held in the highest estimation by every one in Ithaca. He is much the best man and most persistent wooer of all those who are paying court to my mother and trying to take Ulysses' place. Jove, however, in heaven alone knows whether or no they will come to a bad end before the marriage takes place." As he was speaking a bird flew by upon his right hand, a hawk, Apollo's messenger. It held a dove in its talons, and the feathers, as it tore them off, fell to the ground midway between Telemachus and the ship. On this. Theoclymenus called him apart and caught him by the hand. Telemachus, said he, that bird did not fly on your right hand without having been sent there by some god. As soon as I saw it, I knew it was an omen. It means that you will remain powerful and there will be no house in Ithaca more royal than your own. I wish it may prove so, answered Telemachus. If it does, I will show you so much good will and give you so many presents that all who meet you will congratulate you." Then he said to his friend Piraeus, Piraeus, son of Clytius, you have throughout shown yourself the most willing to serve me of all those who have accompanied me to Pylos. I wish you would take this stranger to your own house and entertain him hospitably till I can come for him. And Piraeus answered, Telemachus, you may stay away as long as you please but I will look after him for you, and he shall find no lack of hospitality." As he spoke he went on board, and bade the others do so also, and loose the hawsers, so they took their places in the ship. But Telemachus bound on his sandals, and took a long and doughty spear with a head of sharpened bronze from the deck of the ship. Then they loosed the hawsers, thrust the ship off from land, and made on towards the city as they had been told to do 
while Telemachus strode on as fast as he could, till he reached the homestead where his countless herds of swine were feeding, and where dwelt the excellent swineherd who was so devoted a servant to his master. End of Book 15